This is Audible. Audible Frontiers presents Chris Longknife, Daring, written by Mike Shepard, narrated by Dina Perlman. Chapter One. Lieutenant Commander Chris Longknife fought the shot-up controls of the Greenfeld ground assault craft. It seemed bent on smashing itself into the rocky ground below. She would much rather stay in the air, putting more miles between her and the whoever it was who'd put so many holes so quickly in her borrowed air vehicle. Jack, get me some more controls. I've already flipped on the backup stabilization and directional controls, Chris. Then find the backup to the backup. I don't think Greenfeld puts more than one in any craft. What kind of cheapskate, death-happy crazies only put one backup system in a fighting vehicle? Cried Nellie, Chris's personal computer, and no help at the moment. Our newest ally, Jack muttered. The air vehicle fought Chris, flipping right, then left, but it put more rock-strewn ground between Chris and the apparent mining concern that had been the target of what was supposed to be a quick snatch-and-grab raid. Where did all that firepower come from? Chris asked, no one in particular. I think who or whatever we're dealing with is very, very trigger-happy and really paranoid to boot, Jack answered. You can say that again, Nellie said. A flash came from behind Chris. Her air rig chose to zig at that moment, giving her a fairly good view out of the left corner of her eye at the target they were now fleeing. A laser beam winked out, to be replaced by several more. Uh-oh, Chris muttered. Admiral Kratz just got tired of messing with the problem and lazed it from orbit. God help us, Jack said and very likely meant it for a prayer. The shock waves coming off the target were only seconds away from ripping their damaged ride to pieces. There's a swamp up ahead, Nellie said. I see it, Chris said. I'm aiming for it. As much as she could aim that riddled bucket of lowest bid bolts. She managed to pancake the craft into what looked like the softest mud bank in sight. They bounced settled again, slid for a bit, then slowly turned sideways. Then the shock wave from 18-inch lasers pummeling a minehead hit them. The Greenfeld assault boat flipped and lost its stubby wings as it rolled and started coming apart. As the cockpit was ripped from the rest of the craft, Chris grayed out but fought not to lose consciousness. As she struggled to avoid the looming darkness, one question kept running over and over in her mind. What am I doing here? What am I doing here? Then she remembered. Oh, right. I insisted on being here. Chapter Two You will not thundered King Raymond I, hammerer of the Aitichi, killer of the tyrant Urm, and ender of the Unity War, it was in all the papers, and presently sovereign of the 173 planets in the United Society, or societies, depending on your political persuasion. That royal claim was circumscribed by a brand new, if as yet not very tested, constitution. A recognized legend for the last eighty years, what Ray Longknife bellowed, he expected to have done. Yes, I will, said Lieutenant Commander, Her Royal Highness Christine Anne Longknife, defender of the peace at Paris, even if it did involve mutiny, she who commanded at Wardhaven and presently Commander, Patrol Squadron 10. She'd had enough of her Grandpa Ray running her around on a short leash, and was ready to take her squadron and do what she thought necessary to save humanity. This time. 
the space between them and the room around them took on a noticeable chill. Those forced to witness this intrafamily squabble, which, like everything the long knives did, was of near biblical proportions, did their best to gaze at the ceiling, desk, carpet, anywhere but at the two so committed to disagreement. Chris locked eyes with her Grandpa Ray. He scowled back, a scowl he'd been practicing for a hundred years. Chris didn't try to match him scowl for scowl, but met his gaze with a rock-solid blank stare that promised no flexibility on her part. Neither one blinked. It got kind of boring. So Chris checked out General McMorrison's new digs. He'd been promoted from Wardhaven Chief of Staff to Chief of the Royal U.S. General Staff. The Republican blue rug and frayed blue curtains were gone, replaced by a royal red. The new curtains even had gold tassels. The couches that held Chris's staff had also been reupholstered in red and gold stripes. Chris would never have guessed Grandpa Ray was so into red. The king himself sat in a large visitor's chair next to Mac's desk. Why did Chris suspect that chair was only brought out from against the wall when the king came to call? Mac sat at his desk. To his left, in a normal-sized visitor's chair, was Admiral Crossenshield, the head of Wardhaven Intelligence. Or maybe U.S. Intelligence now. Royal Intelligence? It was hard to tell what to call anything in this changing world. What hadn't changed was the unholy trinity, as Chris had taken to calling them. Today, they'd hollered for backup. Chris's other legendary great-grandpa leaned comfortably on a bookcase to the king's right. Oh, Chris almost broke eye lock with her royal grandpa. Atop the bookcase was a fancy something or other. Was that a field marshal's baton? Had Mac gotten a promotion for taking on the new royal pains of commanding 173 different planets, military as they somehow merged into a unified command? Chris would have to ask Mac, but not now. Not while she and her grandpa were locked in a battle to see who could avoid blinking the longest. Retired General Torden cleared his throat in his place by the bookcase. The king glanced his way and so did Chris. Trouble to his enemies. Trouble to his friends. Double trouble to his superiors. Whenever one spoke of the Long Knife legend, it was rare that Ray and Trouble were not mentioned in the same breath. He was Grandpa Trouble to Chris. She'd learned the hard way to expect Trouble when she saw him coming. You know, Trouble began, almost diffidently. It's an ancient and respected custom, that when a superior expresses a preference, it's treated as an order. Chris greeted that gambit with thoughtfully pursed lips and a glower of her own. The retired general soldiered on in the face of Chris's rejection. When a king gives an order to a lieutenant commander, the officer's response normally is, Yes, sir, your majesty. Yes, sir, yes, sir, three bags full, sir, Chris said under her breath, for the entire room to hear. When it was clear her message was received by all, she added, Just like you always did, Grandpa Trouble? Grandpa's lips showed just the hint of a smile as he turned to his king and shrugged. She's our kid, Ray. She's an undisciplined brat came back in a royal growl that any old lion would be proud of. Chris locked eyes with her royal grandpa and prepared to renew their unblinking war. To keep from being too bored, she used her peripheral vision to check out how her own team was taking this little family unmeeting of the minds. Abby, Chris's maid and occasional spy, seemed unbothered by it all. She studied the coffee table, calm display between their couches, as if she might somehow decant whatever secret it had lately displayed. Across from her, Lieutenant Penny Lean Pasley likewise eyed the table. She was Chris's intelligence analyst, interrogator, and, by right of her upbringing by two cops, 
usual contact with the police, a frequent and inevitable part of any visit Chris paid to a planet. Right now, her eyes were also fixed on the low table between the couches. Beside Penny sat Colonel Cortez. As a result of having led a hostile planetary takedown that Chris had defeated, he was her prisoner. Since she'd put him on her personal payroll, he was her tactical advisor and principal ground logistician. He'd last begged to be returned to prison, any prison, rather than risk the crossfire at another long knife family confab. Today, he calmly studied the ceiling. Closest to Chris, and in the direct line of fire between her and her royal grandpa, sat Jack. As her Secret Service agent, he'd sworn to take a bullet for her. With her spending more and more time away from home, Grandpa Trouble's suggestion that she drafted him into a Marine captain's uniform and headed for security had sounded like a good idea. Only after he was in uniform did Grandpa Trouble let drop that, as the security chief for a serving member of the Blood, Jack now had authority to countermand any order of Chris's that he considered a risk to her safety. And Jack had a pretty broad definition of what constituted Chris's safety. They were still working out their differences. And Chris was now a lot more careful about any suggestion coming from Grandpa Trouble. Today, even in the Holy of Holies, Jack's head swiveled slowly, eyes searching for anything that might physically harm Chris. Grandpa Trouble cleared his throat again. And again. That got his king's and Chris's attention. You know, Commander, when one is given a mission a couple of hundred light years out in space, normally you don't show up at home with your whole squadron. Chris nodded. You have a good point, she admitted to Grandpa Trouble, before rounding on Grandpa Ray. I completed your mission, she spat. Already? came from the king, in what sounded like a royal yelp. Have I really surprised him? Done. Completed. Finished, Chris said. You ordered me to take care of the budding pirate problem out on the rim of Peterwald space, without getting any complaints from the newly crowned Emperor Harry. The newly officialized King Raymond nodded. I captured three pirate schooners, one freighter and a skiff, I liberated one potential pirate refuge and took down a main base. I also put out of business 15,000 hectares of drug plantations and liberated 25,000 slaves. Oh, and you didn't get one whimper from your new neighboring emperor, did you? Chris eyed Field Marshal Mack. Not a word from him, he said. I'm just guessing on this, but I think we'll split the two planets. Koskatos will likely apply for membership in United Society. The Greenfeld Empire will get Port Royal, and they are welcome to it, Chris said. All that in three months? Grandpa Trouble whispered. There might have even been a touch of respectful awe hidden in there. Chris kept her eyes locked on Grandpa Ray. I'm sick and tired of draining swamps and dodging alligators. I want to get on to something important. Um, the king said. Exactly what Chris considered important was too classified to discuss among even this small group. From the glance around that Field Marshal Mack gave the others, even he apparently hadn't been read into this one. Mack opened his mouth to say something, then froze. He struggled for a long moment to keep a look of horror off his face. When he finally got words out, they were full of horror. Two. No, three. Make that four super battleships just jumped into our system, using jump point gamma. The last time six super dreadnoughts jumped in system using that jump point, they'd threatened to blast Wardhaven down to bedrock if it didn't surrender. What are they squawking? Grandpa Trouble asked, standing bolt upright like an old fire horse who heard the alarm bell and couldn't stay out to pasture. They're Greenfeld, Mac said. King Ray and Grandpa Trouble paled. 
There was much bad blood between the long knives and the Peterwalds. Neither one breathed, waiting for the next shoe to drop. Oh, good, Chris said, clapping her hands with all the joy of any four-year-old presented with a tall stack of birthday presents. Vicky Peterwald talked her dad into letting her come, too. All four of Chris's team now rolled their eyes at the ceiling. Four sets of very senior eyes locked onto Chris as their mouths dropped open. Chapter 3 King Raymond, being the legend that he was, recovered first. He was half out of his seat as he shouted, You told Vicky Peterwald about our meeting with the Aitichi. What? said Mac. The field marshal apparently was the only one in the room who didn't know about that very secret meeting. He turned to Crossy, the intel chief, who whispered, I'll explain it later. Chris didn't dare wait to defend herself, but jumped right in, talking over them. I did not, she snapped, keeping her seat. Then what's Henry Peterwald's daughter doing riding four battleships into Wardhaven space? The king demanded. Half up, half down, he was clearly torn between his options. With reservations, he settled back in his chair. She wants to come with me to find out what's gobbling up Aitichi scout ships and not spitting back so much as an atom, Chris said. You told her! Grandpa Ray repeated the accusation. I did not, Chris repeated the denial. Then how does she know? Grandpa Trouble asked, kindly breaking Chris and her other grandpa out of an endless do-loop of accusations and denials. He told her, Chris said, and pointed at Admiral Crossenshield, the chief of Wardhaven, or maybe all U.S. intelligence. I did not, he snapped with sincerity so refined and polished, it might actually pass muster of, say, a kindergartner. Both of Chris's grandpas scowled as they eyed the man who was supposed to find out other people's secrets and keep their own. From the looks of them, Crossy's sincerity had not passed their smell test. I didn't tell her about the meeting, Crossy insisted. No, you just sent her a video of the whole get-together, Chris snapped. You've seen it? Grandpa Trouble asked. Vicky showed it to me, Chris admitted. I let my team view it after she did. What makes you so sure it came from me? Crossy demanded. From the glowers around the room, including her own staffs, that was considered a valid question. I'm in it, Chris said. The King and Grandpa Trouble are in it. They nodded agreement. Jack's in it. At her request, the king had allowed Jack to remain when everyone else had been ushered out. The Aitichi are in it. Humanity and the Aitichi Empire had fought a six-year war that almost made humanity extinct. Just ask any veteran. Chris had only recently discovered that Aitichi vets of that war felt the same way, that the humans had almost made the Aitichi extinct. After 25 years of being told one story, Chris was still struggling to absorb the other viewpoint. The only person who was in the meeting that wasn't in the vid that Vicky had was you, Crossy. Me thinks you did edit things a bit too much. Now it was the Admiral's turn to frown. I might have outthought myself on that one, he admitted. And admitting to the edit he allowed that he was the guilty party. So, Crossy, the king said with a tired sigh, why isn't my most important secret a secret anymore? The head of black ops, white ops, and all the rest in between didn't seem at all embarrassed to be caught red-handed going against his king and luring the daughter of his strongest opposition in human space into some sort of game, and probably gaming Chris as well. She hated being played by Crossy. Usually, she refused to get involved in his dirty tricks, 
Problem was, today, the two of them seemed headed in the same direction, which left Chris wondering if she needed to make a hard right turn. Oh, bother. While Chris spun those thoughts through her own head, Crossy was doing his best to spin his own defense. You and I both know this is the worst kept secret in human space, Crossy said. Walk into any pub in the capital here, and I'll bet you money that half the tables in the place are discussing whether or not you met with an imperial representative. They're arguing the case, Trouble pointed out. They don't know. Big difference. The difference was big enough that your pet project of naming us United Sentience fell through, Crossy countered. That got a wince from the king. You and I agree. We can't bring up the problem of Aitichi scouts disappearing without a trace, while all we have is their own word. Your granddaughter here wanted to go do some exploring. You sent her to chase pirates instead. Sorry to say, the pirates didn't provide her all that much of a distraction. He gave her a respectful nod. Chris returned a proud grin, showing plenty of teeth. Now she wants to take a swing at whatever is going bump in the night under the Aitichi beds. If a long knife goes out there, hunting bug-eyed monsters and finds something, how much of human space will believe her? Her word alone. If Chris Longknife and Vicky Peterwald come back saying they found something, assuming whatever they find doesn't follow them home, nipping at their heels, Grandpa Trouble said darkly. The king shook his head. Last time I checked, I was the king, and nobody has asked me if I want my granddaughter rummaging around under the galactic inner springs to see if anything bites her he grumbled. That took Chris aback. Then again, Grandpa Ray, 70 years ago, when he was the president of the Society of Humanity, had pushed through the Treaty of Wardhaven. Under that rule, humanity had slowed down its expansion to a more reasonable pace, colonizing most of its known sphere before pressing on to explore and people a new layer. The argument for that kind of measured pace it seemed logical after humans' first wild exploration brought them up against the Aitichi, and a bloody war. Did Grandpa Ray want to keep at that measured pace? Or did Grandpa just not want a certain Chris to be the one putting her head in the potential lion's maw? The room fell silent. She suspected everyone there was trying to draw out the unusual meaning of the king's revelation— that blood might actually be thicker than water. Chris was still struggling to manufacture a reply when the field marshal once again put his hand to his ear. Two swift shore class battlecruisers just came through Jump Point Beta. They say they're from the Helvetican Confederacy and on official business. They want to know if Princess Christine is still here. Crossy, how many copies of that damn meeting did you send out? the king demanded. Several, the admiral admitted. I didn't think I'd get many responses. I think you just got another one, Max said. Who? Came from several of the seniors in the room. Two Haruna-class battleships have jumped into the system. I don't remember the last time we had a visit from Musashi. Not since the war, Grandpa Trouble said. I take it you sent them a copy, the king said dryly. I just wanted them to know what was going on. I didn't actually expect them to come all this way. Your Highness, I have an incoming message for you. Chris's personal computer spoke from where she rode just above Chris's collarbone. Nellie, very upgraded, very expensive, and very much no longer a compliant, obedient computer, was being nice today. Who's it from, Nelly? Chris asked. Rear Admiral Ichiro Kota, aboard the IMS Haruna. He would appreciate an appointment at your convenience to meet with you concerning certain matters. Oh, 
My lady, Rear Admiral Max Channing sends his compliments, and also requests a meeting with you at your convenience. And Vice Admiral Kratz sends his compliments, and says Her Royal Highness Grand Duchess Vicky is dying to dish the dirt with you on how she got permission to charge off on this Mad Hatter idea. He didn't say that, Chris said. He did. His very words. Cross my heart, Nellie answered. What have we done? King Ray asked the overhead. Grandpa Trouble scratched his right ear, while not struggling very hard to suppress a grin. You two families have been at each other's throats for years. Maybe these two girls... Left all sorts of possibilities unsaid. Chris herself wondered what kind of bridges she and Vicky, two Navy officers, might build between two families that had been hating each other's guts for almost a century. She was pretty sure that Vicky's dad had paid the kidnappers who killed Chris's six-year-old little brother when Chris herself was ten. She was also fairly sure several of the recent attempts on her life could be traced, if not to the old man's door, then at least to his next-door neighbor's. Was it possible for Chris and Vicky to bury the hatchet between their two families? And survive the experience? Chris was willing to give it a try, while keeping a careful eye on her back. To her two great-grandfathers, Chris gave a non-committal shrug. Nellie, send my regards and compliments to all three flags, and tell them... Now it was Chris's turn to do some quick math. It would take a good three days for all the different squadrons to finish their approaches to High Wardhaven Station. Crossy, you invited them. Can you arrange to have them all docked somewhere close to the Wasp? I can do that, he assured her. Then Nellie, tell them that they should feel free to call on me one hour after the last of them ties up. I'm doing that, my lady. My lady, the king said. Yes. Nellie is studying etiquette and protocol, Chris said. A gal's got to know how to fit into polite society, Nellie announced for herself. A polite computer, Crossy observed. I wonder how that works. Chris was glad that none of the black-hearted seniors present extended that observation to the logical conclusion. The line between tactful diplomacy and bald-faced lying was often a thin one. Chris now had to watch that line very carefully with Nellie. Not for the first time, Chris wondered if Nellie's latest upgrade had been all that good an idea. And not for the last time, she told herself that Nellie was Nellie, and her life would be a whole lot less fun without her pet computer slash BFF. Maybe if she kept telling herself that, it would get easier to believe it. With a regal, if a bit limp, wave of the hand, King Raymond I dismissed Chris. By Chris's own count, there were still a whole lot of issues hanging fire between them. Still, she took the dismissal and moved out. With luck, he'd be in a better mood the next time they butted heads. Chapter 4 with three days of hurry up and wait ahead of her, Chris found she had a little time on her hands. The wasp had already been moved into space dock before Chris got back from her little confab with her great grandfathers. With dock workers crawling all over the ship, Chris moved herself and her staff down to Wardhaven. New House was waiting for her. It was also empty, except for the old family retainers, Harvey her driver since first grade, and his wife, Lottie, the cook, made Chris and her staff feel right at home. For a change, Chris did the dutiful daughter things. She called to see if she could have supper with father, the prime minister, and mother. Unfortunately, both of their schedules were too full to make room for the prodigal daughter. No surprise there. She did call her brother Hanovi. She was dutifully invited over to hold the new baby. Brenda, named for Chris's mother, allowed her newly minted aunt to hold her, then promptly spit up on Chris's blues and was removed by a nanny for cleaning. 
Hanovi was on a slow burn. He had not forgiven Chris for being included in the meeting with the Aitichi, while he was given the bums rush by Grandpa Ray. What with a small fleet of ships headed for Wardhaven, he and the Prime Minister had finally been brought fully up to speed. Still, he was not happy to be so late to the party. Chris left after barely fifteen minutes. Oh, sis, I hear you're leaving to explore the very heart of the galaxy, Chris muttered to herself in her brother's voice as Harvey drove her back to Newhouse. I hope it won't be too dangerous. Do take care of yourself, little sister, she finished with a sigh. Brother had mentioned that father had been forced to call for new elections. The opposition insisted the present parliament could not ratify the constitution the old parliament had negotiated. To Chris, that seemed quite reasonable. But somehow, brother made it all sound like it was Chris's fault. Given a choice between helping brother and father run for re-election and hunting the galaxy for bug-eyed monsters, Chris found BEMs winning by a nose. Chasing pirates was a runaway favorite. Family duties fulfilled, Chris looked for other fun. Taking a now 13-year-old shopping sounded like just the ticket. Besides, Chris had been promising Kara a trip to the malls. Chris remembered what it was like to be young and have a credit chit burning a hole in your pocket. Somehow it didn't come up in conversation until Kara was attacking several rows of very cool-looking dresses that her credit chit was now zero, nada, empty. Auntie Teresa took me shopping while you were meeting with those old guys, Kara admitted. We got the most gad dress. It flashes lights, and you can have it send out messages. Dada can make them flash real fast. Chris raised an eyebrow to her maid, Kara's only flesh-and-blood aunt. Abby shrugged. Which of those unspoken questions do you want me to answer first? Nellie, it's your kid that has my niece flashing those words. And I am not happy at all. At all, at all, Nellie said, sounding more like a granny than a proud mother. I am trying to explain to Dada that humans have things that are not at all logical. She is learning. Mighty slowly for a supercomputer, Abby said dryly. Chris wanted the other half of her questioning eyebrow answered. About her zero credit balance? For a spy, you're letting your boss get strangely surprised. Oh, that, Abby said. Doctors shouldn't operate on their own families, and you can't expect me to be all that good of a spy where my own flesh and blood is concerned. Besides, that girl is learning from the best of us. Worst of you, Nellie put in. Whatever. She got in her shopping run with Teresa de Alva while I was biting my tongue and sitting on my hands listening to you and your family not communicate. Then we had to move down here, and when we got things all settled, somehow it didn't come up. She didn't lie to me, it just never came up. Until we walked in here, Chris said, with a half-smile teasing at her lips. Kara was back with a surprisingly colorful and traditional peasant dress. The bust line highlighted that the twirling sprite wearing it was not a little girl anymore, but Kara didn't seem to notice. What Chris was delighted to notice was that Kara's smile had come out to play once more. After Chris and her marines had liberated Kara and flattened Port Royal, Kara had been painfully quiet. Now she walked where before she skipped or ran. Worst, that infectious smile that played on her lips had gone away. Kids have to grow up. Inevitably, they learn that the world is not as safe as the adults around them try to make it. Somewhere in the process, that childish laugh, the innocent smile, get lost. Chris could only imagine what Kara had gone through as a slave on a drug plantation. Chris had feared Kara's smile was gone forever. Today, for this bangle or that glam, it came back out. So Chris paid for the dress 
and the skirt and blouse and both pairs of shoes. Shopping therapy, Nellie said, as they waited for Kara to try on one last dress, no more. Where'd you hear that? Abby asked the computer. I read it somewhere. Mind you, with this princess lady, I've never actually seen it in operation, but hey, I can recognize it when I see it. The three of them fell silent. Somewhere back in the dressing room, Kara was singing. Chris tried to remember when she'd ever been so happy she just had to sing. She couldn't. Are you going to send us away now? Abby asked. Send you away? Chris started at the abrupt change of topic. There are not going to be many dress balls where you're heading, and not a lot of snooping that a maid can do. Abby swallowed something hard. I figure you'll want to leave me and Kara behind. Chris shook her head. I don't think I could afford to break your contract. You had a good lawyer draw it up, and my mom never did have a head for legal ease. Abby snorted. What paperwork have you been reading? Maybe it wasn't paper I was reading. Maybe it had something to do with a human heart. If you want to come, you'll always have a berth by my side. And Kara? Do you really want to take her out on the limb? I'll no doubt be sawing off, Chris asked. Abby didn't answer for a long minute. Her eyes were on the door to the dressing room, but Chris suspected from the distant look that she was seeing something else. Kara told me that when she was captured, she kept going because she remembered Bruce saying, Marines never leave anyone behind. Poor kid. Kara was none too sure she qualified for that promise, but she kept holding to it no matter what happened. Chris nodded. She'd found Kara a major pain in the neck. But there had been no question that the wasp was going after the kid. Kara was one of their own. You should have seen the look on her face when Sergeant Steve and his team came charging into that drug field where they had her. She'd done her best to keep her head down and be good. But she'd just done something I would have done. And her luck was all run out. Then a Marine stomps in and all bets are canceled. I was kind of busy elsewhere, Chris pointed out. You've got to change your scheduling priorities, Chris. You miss too much of the fun stuff. Tell me about it, Chris said with a sigh. Anyway, for the last two, three weeks, Kara has been kind of sinking into this idea that she does have a home. She does have people who won't leave her behind. You know what I mean? Sort of. Chris said. But Abby, this is not my usual kind of mess. If it's a choice of leading monsters back to human space and not coming back at all, well... Abby snorted. You done gone and changed on me, kid. Changed? Yeah. I followed your sorry ass through all kinds of smelly hell. I've seen people do their absolute best to put an end to your breathing, and you refuse their kind offers and just keep right on taking in air and letting it out. A habit of mine, Chris admitted. Well, said Abby, you're mighty good at it, and I don't expect you to fail to keep on keeping on. That's very definitely my plan, Chris admitted. So, there are billions of kids Kara's age, billions more that ain't been born yet. I don't see that we'll be any less careful of their futures if we have one of them edging around the door, looking in on us while we decide if she and they will ever have a chance to grow up. Now that you put it that way, Chris said, I don't see any problem with you sharing your room with Kara. Kara bounced out of the dressing room, wearing an ankle-length skirt that chimed like a mad carillon when she spun in it. I'll have it put on our tab, Nellie said, without being told. Chapter 5 
I brought along three replenishment ships and a repair ship to accompany the four battle wagons, Vicky said proudly, as Chris greeted her on the USS Wasp's quarterdeck. I watched that parade the Fury let in, Chris said. Between the big guns and the big cargo capacity, you look ready for anything. Her father, my emperor, requires it, said Vice Admiral George Kratz, commander of Batron 12, all its supporting elements, and one Victoria Smythe Peterwald, now a lieutenant in her father, the Emperor's Navy. I think Dad was afraid I'd starve to death or run out of oxygen or maybe break a nail and not have a file, Vicky said, dismissively. I think he's more worried about why Aitichi scouts are not coming back at the end of their voyages, the Admiral said darkly, and very much wants his daughter back after this voyage. Vicky gave him a sideways glance. I wish I really believed that. I'm not at all sure his new wife wants me back. And her, already preggers with a boy. Not that she doesn't mention that every five minutes. And it's going to be a body birth. No auto jug for my new brother. Dad is just always checking in on her. He has brother's heart monitor forwarded to his personal computer. Old men should not be fathers, Vicky said in exasperation. Chris had been delighted to have a younger brother. But then she'd been four, and already being bossed around by a big brother. To her... Eddie looked like a chance for Chris to even up the bossing. Vicky's experience of her big brother, now deceased thanks to Chris, had not been a topic for much conversation. At 15, Chris had made the discovery that her family met most of the requirements for dysfunctional. Poor Vicky had only recently come to that conclusion. From the sound of things, the Peterwalds were about to plumb new depths on the dysfunctional scale. In the back of Chris's head, a small alarm went off. People died in the games Peter Waltz played. So how could Chris keep her distance? Funny thing, people died around those damn long knives. Now it was Chris's turn to watch her back around someone else. How'd your father take to us digging the dirt on the economic wool that's being pulled over his eyes? Vicky snorted. He didn't. He didn't believe me, didn't want to do anything about it, didn't want to hear another word about it. If you ask me, between my stepmom's not liking the sight of me and dad's not wanting to hear about the way he's being snookered on the economy, he's glad to be rid of me. Chris shook her head. As much as she wanted to hear more about this, she said, you'll have to bring me up to date on all the gossip later. You girls do that on your own time. Admiral Kratz said, but I have some official business to perform. He pulled a flat box from his pocket. The form of the box was familiar. They usually held a military decoration of some level, but Chris was more than surprised when he flipped the lid up. A blue Maltese cross was surrounded by golden eagles. Chris would have mistaken it for finely crafted jewelry, except for the words written on the decoration. Pour le mérite. Dad, being emperor and all, decided he should start doing emperor stuff, like having a greatest and highest award. The Order of Merit, or mérite, as he insists it be pronounced. Anyway, you're the first to get it. That oak leaf at the top, that's for valor. Only people who earn it in combat get the oak leaf version. What am I getting this for? Chris asked. Is there a citation to go with that? Everyone else got a citation on parchment suitable for framing, Vicky said. Somehow you got skipped. You can decide whether it's for surviving the Admiral here lazing you from orbit on Port Royal, or liberating Cascatos from our rogue state security nut, or for saving Dad's neck on Biridus. Your call. Ah, no citation to read at my award ceremony, huh? Award ceremony? What award ceremony? The Admiral said, looking around blandly. You've got the medal. 
You can explain it the same way you do that order of the wounded lion. I don't explain it, Chris said sourly. Just so. Chris pocketed the award. One more thing to add to her growing collection of stuff she rarely wore because of the problem of explaining it all. It was time to get down to business. Admirals Channing and Kota are already waiting in the forward lounge with their command teams. I see you brought yours. Chris eyed the large collection of Greenfeld Navy and Marine officers who followed behind Vicky and the Admiral as they went through the ceremony of crossing the Wasp's quarterdeck. Most looked familiar. You bringing everyone who was with you at Port Royal? Chris asked. In truth, we have orders to make ourselves scarce, the Admiral said. After the slaughter at Port Royal, there was never any doubt my battle squadron was to be exiled with you. While the Greenfelt Navy, er, I mean Imperial Navy, is happy to have Port Royal as a Navy colony, no one wants me running into any stockholders of N.S. Holding Group. The only question was whether or not the young Grand Duchess here got to come along for the ride. Dad took some persuading. I can imagine. Grandpa Ray is making noises like he doesn't want me doing this either. I thought your gramps considered you so totally expendable, Vicky said. I sure did, Chris agreed. One would think so, after perusing your file, the Admiral said. Grandpa Ray had me to dinner last night, Chris said. He spent half the meal trying to convince me that my different assignments had been intended for my development. Development, Vicky said. Did he read the same file I did? Self-same, Chris said. The other half of the meal he tried to talk me out of leading this scouting mission. Did he? the admiral asked. Not bleeding likely, Chris said. They reached the forward lounge. A marine guard held the door open for them, then closed it behind them. You're keeping this meeting quite secure, the admiral observed. Yes, Chris said. I didn't invite Crossy. There will be no leaks from my meeting. Did King Raymond's chief of intelligence admit to being the source of the leaks? The admiral asked. Yes and no and maybe. The man is pathologically incapable of telling the truth. At least Grandpa Ray is no longer holding me responsible for the leaks. No one announced attention on deck when Admiral Kratz entered. The forward lounge already had two other admirals present. Adding complications to the etiquette challenge were the princess and grand duchess. A consensus had apparently formed that the forward lounge was a private restaurant, owned and operated by its own contractor, even if the containers were presently attached to the USS Wasp. When Chris introduced Kratz to Channing and Kota, they all kept it informal, although Kota did give both Chris and Vicky a very stiff bow from the waist. Nellie, does Musashi have an emperor? I forgot. Yes and no, Chris. Musashi professes to owe affection to the emperor on Yamato. However, for the last two hundred years since its founding, they have kind of grown their own emperor. A prince of the imperial blood, the emperor's kid brother, started out being a kind of viceroy. But after two or three generations, the bird in the hand was a lot more revered than the bird fifty light years away. Isn't that confusing? Only to our way of thinking, Chris. I understand that the Japanese are much better than you at holding two contradictory opinions at the same time and not being bothered by it. Chris did her best to not let her internal discussion with Nellie reach her face as she returned a half-bow to the admiral. The highest introductions done, Chris glanced around the room. The captain, XO, and marine detachment skipper for her ships held down the left-hand side of the room, closest to the bar, though that watering hole seemed decidedly unbusy tonight. The representatives from Musashi and Helvetica occupied the middle, 
while the Imperial Greenfeld contingent took up nearly half the room on the right. Let's get started, Chris said, and went to stand with her back to the forward viewing screen. In space, that usually showed a lovely view of stars. At the moment, all it showed was the ugly underside of a working space station. Admirals, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, Chris said. The room fell silent as all heads turned to her. Captain Jack Montoya, the skipper of the Wasp's Marine Detachment and chief of Chris's security detail, came to stand a bit behind her and off to one side. Even here, on her ship, he didn't relax the alertness he'd acquired as her Secret Service agent. Some might say his devotion was excessive. Chris had survived enough assassination attempts to appreciate it. In the silence, Chris continued, I suspect we all know why we're here. In order to make sure we all understand it the same way, I'd like to lead you through a short review. Chris turned to the screen behind her. From a view of pipes and cabling, it changed to a star map. This is human space. Over 700 colonized planets stretching across several hundred light years, linked by jump points bequeathed to us by aliens who built them a couple of million years ago. Our migration from Mother Earth has been relatively quick over the last not quite 400 years. Chris paused for people to take in the view and her words. You might notice that, from a certain outside perspective, human space looks very much like a sausage. She waited to get a few nods and smiles, before adding dryly, Only one species has tried to take a bite out of us, and they haven't been heard from for eighty years. That got a few chuckles. Nellie, expand to view two. Which brings us to the Aitichi Empire. Chris used a laser pointer to draw an oval around a much larger expanse of space that now showed. Over two thousand worlds, but growing slower than us. They, too, kind of resemble a sausage, larger and lumpier, one of its ends kind of bumping up against the middle of us. Chris let the image of the Aitichi Empire, covering nearly four times the space of humanity, sink in to her audience. I can say from personal experience that we've been expanding human space away from the Empire. Nellie, light up recently colonized planets. Quite a few planets on the edge of human space began to flash, None of them were close to the Empire. I can now say that I have it on good report that the Aitichi have taken the same approach. Nellie, highlight their recent colonies. A large number of planets began to flash, not as many as those in human space, but still a major number. However, all of them were well away from human-occupied planets. This brought a murmur from Chris's watchers, but no one voiced the question that should have been on all their minds. How did Chris know where the new Aitichi colonies were? Well, Crossy had leaked them the original meeting's video. Chris waited for her audience to process that. Nellie, View 3 Slowly the view of human and Aitichi space shrank as the star map expanded to a view of the entire Milky Way galaxy. Humbling, isn't it? Chris said, once the view settled. Human space and the related Aitichi area were two tiny eggs in a vast expanse of stars. We've got a big backyard, unexplored, unknown. The last time we went charging off into the unknown with wild abandon, we bumped heads with the Aitichi. I believe the Treaty of Wardhaven that my great-grandfather rammed through the Society of Humanity's Senate passed unanimously. Since that time, we've been more careful about sticking our noses into the unknown. I understand the Aitichi have gone about their exploration with a similar caution, she added dryly. Again, heads nodded. No one seemed to doubt she was humanity's greatest living expert on the Aitichi. She was. Still, 
it surprised her that no one demanded to examine her credentials. As some of you have heard, the Aitichi Exploration Bureau has suffered some losses lately. Three jump points to certain stars have been eating up any ships that drop in, and not spitting up so much as an atom. Anything the Aitichi send there, do not come back. We have been asked if our high technology might allow us to slip something in without drawing fire. Could one of our probes make it back? Her audience leaned forward. What she said next could easily have a life or death impact on them. I've refused to dangle our highest technology in the dark, where it can be snapped up by unknown forces with us none the wiser as to what we face. So far, that has been adopted as Wardhaven, ah, excuse me, U.S. policy. If we're going there, we're taking the human eyeball along with us, which brings us to the next options. I spent much of my dinner last night listening to King Raymond, Grandpa, to me, telling me in great detail why we should not duplicate the same search that the Aitichi have already done and lost a small squadron of ships while doing it. If Grandpa had let me get a word in edgewise sooner, we could have saved a lot of time for some other topic to argue over. Chris went on quickly without waiting for a reaction. I do not propose this fleet of discovery go anywhere near those stars. They are hot datum for somebody, drawing attention to this edge of the galaxy, and I would just as soon not attract their interest any closer to my dad, brother, nieces, and nephews. Are we clear on that? Chris said firmly. I'm glad to hear it, Admiral Kratz said for all. You might not be so glad to hear what comes next, Chris said, putting her hands on her hips. I've already heard mention of the fear, even if it is said as a joke, that I or we will come back with something mean and ugly snapping at our heels. Chris's eyes roved the room. From the looks of things, most of them had heard or made the same crack. None of our ships return, unless and until we are sure that there is nothing behind us but empty space. How very Japanese of you, Admiral Kota said into the silence. So far, all you've told us is what we won't do, Admiral Channing said. When do we find out what we will do? Right now, Chris said, turning back to the star map. All of the Aitichi, and just about all of humanity, are hanging out here on this arm of the Milky Way. Humanity does have one exception, Santa Maria. Chris swung her laser pointer to a tiny light Nellie had blinking a third of the way around the galaxy. Founded by the hopelessly lost and desperate crew of one of Earth's first exploration ships nearly 400 years ago, it hangs alone out here. There's been some exploration around it, but the Santa Marians are still busy colonizing their own system. Few people looking for fertile ground want to start out with the long jump it takes to get to Santa Maria. Chris turned back to her listeners. However, for a voyage of discovery, it looks like a great place to begin. Gentlemen, I hope your ship's power plants and stabilization systems are in good shape. I intend to lead this fleet on some fast jumps with very high and very precise spins on our ships. If you don't think you can do it, drop out now. I'd hate to lose your ship in a bad jump. If possible, the room fell even more silent. Somewhere, someone broke it. I told you we were crazy to follow one of those damn long knives. Chris let a wry chuckle sweep the room before going on. I would draw your attention to the U.S. contingent, Pat Ron 10. They are converted and armed merchant ships. Corvettes, folks, small, fast, and loaded with sensors. They're good at poking their noses into things and getting out fast. That, folks, is our mission. We will scout far, scout well, and run like bats out of hell, 
Our job is to see and report back. Nothing else. Chris paused to let that sink in. I can't help but notice that for some reason you have brought battleships. I know it feels good to be backed up by muscle, and they are good in a fight. That brought proud smiles from the battleship sailors among them. But you big boys are slow and very conspicuous. I do not intend to start or allow myself to get involved in a fight, Chris snapped, and the smiles got swallowed. We are going out there to see, identify, and run back. You remember that old saying, I came, I saw, I conquered? Forget it. Our goal is, we came, we saw, we ran like hell away. That got a laugh, which grew louder when some wag was heard to exclaim, Who is this strange woman, and what have they done with Chris Longknife? Chris waited a moment for things to quiet down to a dull roar, before saying, just so long as we understand ourselves. Then she began to outline all the boring details that needed to be covered before they departed on their voyage of discovery. Chapter 6 That's Santa Maria Starfield. We made it, Nellie announced. Only then did Chris and everyone in her tax center start breathing again. Grandpa Ray had strongly encouraged Chris to take the two-week-long dozen-jump route to Santa Maria. Since he didn't actually make it in order, she'd chosen to lead her fleet through the wild two-jump route that had first accidentally taken Grandpa Ray to the lost colony of Santa Maria. That sabotage jump had been intended to kill him and everyone on the ship carrying him. Instead, he discovered a couple of million lost humans— and the first map of the jump point system. Long knives aren't easy to kill, was Grandpa's usual ending to that story. Chris watched as the jump point rapidly coughed out more ships. Once through, each ship dampened its spin to a steady course, but did not slow down. When the count reached 22 ships, Chris finally relaxed. For a recon mission best done by a scurrying mouse, this fleet was rapidly becoming very much like an elephant. Just how much of a zoo it would end up remained to be seen. A day's trip sunward was Santa Maria's inhabited planet. On any normal cruise, Chris should go there, if for no other reason, than to pay her respects to Tommy Lean's folks. Tommy had been her first friend in the Navy. She hadn't seen his parents since his wedding to Penny. Or his funeral three days later. Chris glanced at Penny. She was busy taking reports from each ship as it came through the jump. Penny had not mentioned Tommy in months. Chris would respect her silence. Where to next, princess? Captain Drago, the contract skipper of the Wasp, asked. Jump point beta, Chris ordered. See that we get there with the same velocity on the boat. Please have maintenance take a good look at the ship's stabilization system. Already doing it. Nothing wrong with it, and I want it to stay that way. The jump points built by the aliens two million years ago had opened space to humanity. Well, the Aitichi, too. And maybe someone else. That didn't mean the jump point system was without its problems. The jumps connected several stars, all of which could be accessed if you knew how and were willing to take the risks. What this meant was that the orbit that any particular jump point took around any individual star tended to be a bit erratic, as the impact of the other star system's accumulated gravity had its effect as well. In addition to the tendency to wander, there was also the question of which star system your ship jumped to. If you entered the jump at a safe, dead-slow pace, and with your ship stabilized rock-solid steady— you exited into a star system not too far from the one you left. Always the same one. That was nice and dependable. Insurance companies like that. Enter a jump at high speed, or under acceleration, or with a spin on your hull, and the results could be spectacularly different. For the last 400 years, 
it had been human practice to do the nice and slow and steady thing at jump points. Owners, shippers, and high commands like the dependable results. Ship captains who took chances were frequently never heard from again. Grandpa Ray's ship was one of the first to recover from a bad jump. The Sheffield had been outfitted as an exploration ship, and instruments had recorded all the motion on the ship. That allowed them to double back. The news of the Sheffield's return had been greeted wildly, not the least by great-grandma Rita, eight months pregnant with Chris's grandfather, Al. Other folks had also been excited about the exploration prospects. Ships were quickly fitted out, and they bumped right into the Aitichi. One thing about a war, it concentrates the mind. It also sucks up all available cash. Exploration funds vanished from the budget. Once peace came, Grandpa Ray made sure human exploration of space was measured and careful. Now Chris Longknife, Ray's great-granddaughter, was wadding up the restrictions of his beloved Treaty of Wardhaven and tossing them in the trash can and taking a small battle fleet with her. How was that for the new generation trashing its elders? In a few weeks, maybe months, Chris would know whether all Grandpa Ray's caution had been a good idea. Chris's fleet of discovery stayed well out. Few people on Santa Maria would even know they passed that way. And those few had been sworn to secrecy. With any luck, this secret would last long enough for Chris to go and come back. Chris suspected that whatever information they brought back could be kept secret for, oh, maybe twelve seconds. Following behind the Wasp, Patron 10 accelerated at 1G in echelon with Chris's flagship. The fearless and intrepid in close, the resupply ships Surprise and Surplus, already rechristened by the fleet Misplaced and Misfiled, formed a square with the messenger packets Hermes and Mercury. Chris had no intentions of leaving a trail of communication buoys behind her at every jump point she used. Once the fleet took leave of Santa Maria, communications back to human space would be by ship. The rest of the fleet trailed behind Patron 10. The four battleships of Greenfeld's Batron 12 followed in a fighting square, their four auxiliaries trailing them in a square of their own. The Musashi and Helvetican warships formed another fighting square, the Haruna and Chikuma to the right, the Swift Shure and the Triumph to the left. Behind them came the two supply ships they had contracted for at Wardhaven, once they'd realized what they were getting into. Lieutenant Commander Tausig's Hornet pulled up the rear with a message packet that was also a last-minute addition— the Kestrel. This rear guard was responsible for riding herd on any of the trailing ships. If their jump point did a last-second juggle, and the large lumbering battleships couldn't find where the jump had gotten to, the Hornet would see that they got through. All of the battleship admirals assured Chris this really wasn't necessary. The sensor suites on all their ships were just as up-to-date as anything Wardhaven had. Maybe that was true. Still, Tossig was back there with the Hornet, just in case. Matters went well as the fleet quickly crossed Santa Marian space. They accelerated for the first half of the trip, then flipped and decelerated for the rest. They were making 50,000 kilometers an hour, with 20 clockwise revolutions a minute, down the long axis of the ship as they sped toward jump point Beta. With 30 seconds to go, the navigator goosed the wasp up to 3G's acceleration. One after another, 23 ships vanished into the unknown. Chapter 7 How far did we go? Chris asked expectantly. I'll tell you when we find out, Nellie answered. What's the new system look like? Any sign of life? Chris added eyeing the blank screen of her tech center. You will know when we all know, Nellie snapped. Now, will you quit juggling my elbow and let me process what's coming in? Nellie's in a bad mood, Chris said, 
glancing around at her team. Chris, things take time, even for a long knife, Jack said. His eyes were on the screen as it slowly filled up with the sun and three huge gas giants. It took a minute more for a half dozen small rock planets to blink onto the screen. The Kestrel is through, Penny said, her breath coming out in a sigh. Everyone made the jump. That was a relief to all. The Wasp had dropped its acceleration to half a G. Until they spotted a jump point, there was no course for the fleet to follow. Throughout the ship, on the bridge, and in Boffin country, sensor teams poured over a whole raft of instruments. Slowly, the products of all that effort flowed onto the four screens that covered the bulkheads of Chris's tack room. They had jumped over 750 light years. None of the planets orbiting the soft yellow sun was in the life zone, where water could survive in all three of its life-giving options, gas, liquid, and solid. Life as we knew it was unlikely here. The usual telecommunication frequencies were silent. No one was transmitting radio or TV messages. Laser communications also seemed absent. The boffins would continue monitoring for a sudden change, but for the moment, technology showed no evidence of ever having touched this system of cold rocks and colder gases. Per the jump point map Grandpa Ray had found on Santa Maria, two jump points were supposed to be in this system. After ten minutes of searching, the bridge reported they had located both of them. Chris reviewed the two options they offered. Some of the best astronomers and astrophysicists had been called in to develop a list for Chris to choose from. One jump led to an old red dwarf, slowly moldering away into a quiet death. The other led to a giant star, a prime candidate for something explosive, like a nova ending its life. Not the thing Chris wanted her ships to find at the end of their next jump. The Red Dwarf also offered several jump choices that should be equally safe. Or at least had been two million years ago, when the aliens blazed this trail across the stars. To get long leaps between stars, you had to leap before you looked. On Chris's orders, the fleet set a course for the jump that led to the Red Dwarf. As luck would have it, it was the closer of the two. As before, they accelerated until mid-course, then began the deceleration. Once again, they flipped at the last minute and hit the jump at what, at any other time, would have been considered a suicidal speed, with ships accelerating and spinning like delicately balanced tops. In two weeks, they'd made ten nail-biting jumps and were over 15,000 light-years from Santa Maria. They trotted through ten lifeless and uninteresting systems. For a fleet of discovery that had launched with such great expectations, they had very little to show for all their effort. Then the eleventh jump changed everything. Chapter 8 Your Highness, we need to spend a couple of days refueling in this new system, Captain Drago said, as they shot into their eleventh new star system. You think so? Chris answered. That last jump dropped the wasp's reaction tanks to below half full, Chris, the captain said. I'd like to orbit a gas planet and have the courier ships do some cloud dancing. This was no surprise. They'd done it a week ago after the fifth jump. Every ship in the fleet needed reaction mass for acceleration and deceleration. Ships like the Wasp and the battleships, even the freighters, weren't designed for the knocking around that came while trawling for fuel in the upper atmosphere of gas giants. Pick a big one and make it happen, Skipper. Once we've refueled the fleet, I want to dispatch one of the couriers back home to bring them up to date. All we've got to tell so far is a lot of nothing, but I suspect they'd like to know that. We were lucky last time and only took two days, Princess. It could take longer this time. I don't have a problem, Captain. Whatever is out there will still be out there when we're ready. 
a gas giant wasn't too far from their jump point. The fleet decelerated toward it at 1.3 Gs. Chris was on the bridge as they approached orbit. The Mercury had already deployed a balut and was dropping away for its first run at skimming the outer atmosphere of the planet. At sensors, Chief Benny shook his head. There's something wrong with my instruments, he muttered. That would be unusual, Chris said. Yes, and I've checked them. I can't find anything wrong with them, but this can't be right. What can't be right? The chief now had Captain Drago's attention. There are eleven decent-sized moons around this puppy. According to my readouts, they have wobbled a smidge farther away from the planet than they were just after we came through the jump. They are in unstable orbits, the captain said. If what I'm reading is right, they sure are. It's not a lot, but then we've only been observing them for a few hours. Let me check with the boffins. Just a minute. Chris was at her usual station, weapons. She'd brought it up more out of habit than any expectation of a shoot. She double-checked her board. All four of the Wasp's 24-inch pulse lasers were locked and loaded. Hey, the chief looked up in surprise. One of the moons has a hot spot. A volcano? Chris asked. Maybe, the chief muttered, his eyes studying his board. What's this? A bit of electromagnetic activity as well? Talk to me, chief, the captain said. It just showed up as the moon's rotation brought it into view. I'm on it, sir. Stay on it, chief. I've got Professor Mfumbo calling me. Could someone else take the call? The chief said, not breaking concentration. I've got it, Chris said. Bridge here, Professor. We're kind of busy just now. I am answering Chief Benny's call about these damnable orbits. Yes, all the moons orbiting this gas giant are dancing a very strange polka. Any ideas why? Chris asked. No idea. I've never heard of this happening before. It's as if this gas giant used to have a lot more mass and lost it. And now its gravitational hold on its moons is adjusting to the sudden weight loss. Captain Drago scowled at the forward screen. The Mercury was about to take away some more of the planet's mass as it filled its balut with gases that would be transferred to the ships of the fleet to use as reaction mass for their fusion reactors. The fleet would need a lot of mass to refuel. Still, what they removed would hardly matter to something as big as this gas giant and its moons. Chris took a deep breath, as she considered what kind of force could make such a difference. Chief, talk to me about that hot spot, Captain Drago said. Nellie, pass all that we've gotten to the fleet, Chris told her computer. Chris, I've been doing that. The other ships of the fleet have a lot of science aboard, too. Our data is just verifying what the others are concluding as well. The Haruna has gone to general quarters. Pass the word to Patron 10. General quarters, guns, unknown cause. Done, Chris. On the Wasp, the general quarters klaxon began to sound. We're the closest to that moon, Captain Drago, Chris said. Would you close on it, please? Of all the ships in Patron 10, only the Wasp had a contractor for a captain. He was older, more experienced, more mature. He drew his check from Admiral Crossenshield's Black Ops funds. He was here, Chris didn't doubt, at King Raymond's specific order to see that Chris didn't do any of the damn fool stunts that he and Grandpa Trouble had done before they reached old age. Some day she expected he would countermand one of her orders. She waited to see if today would be that day. Selwyn, put us closer to that unknown event, he ordered. Aye, aye, sir the navigator replied. So, not today, huh? Your Highness, the Intrepid is nearby, Captain Drago observed. Yes, right, Chris said, properly instructed. 
Nelly, invite the intrepid to join us in this little side trip. Done, Chris. On the screen, two dots broke from the strung out line of ships, still decelerating, aiming for a lower orbit of the giant. The wasp and intrepid, however, stretched their vectors to match the high orbit of the moon in question. Can somebody give me an idea of what we're heading into before we actually ram that damn moon? The captain snapped. It's a rocky planetoid with no iron core. Its surface is a cold mix of vapors, some water, some methane. Lots of crud, the chief said. Liquid, not gas. I don't think there are any lakes. The moon's surface looks pretty rough. We boffins concur. Professor Mfumbo said. One small spot is showing hot, the chief went on after a hasty breath. I'm trying to get a visual, but that heat seems to be steaming off the volatiles. Radar, he paused. Radar isn't coming back. Something's driving our radar nuts. Active or passive, Chris and Captain Drago said at the same time. I can't tell. I've got some sort of electromagnetic crap coming from there, but it's not organized like anything I've ever seen. Can you laser range it? Get a picture that way? Chris asked. I'm lasing it. Nope, nothing, he said a moment later. Laser can't get through the vapors. Is there a gravity well? Chris asked. Every mass sets up its own gravity well. The very sensitive atom laser on the WASP, designed to track twitchy jump points, was the most sensitive instrument for measuring variations in that weakest of the four natural forces. Weakest, but most important. Just ask any two-year-old trying to defy gravity with each step. Checking, the chief said. A long moment later, he nodded. There's something solid there. There's definitely more mass under that hot spot than there is in the rest of the moon. For fifteen long minutes, the rest of the fleet decelerated into lower orbit and went about beginning the process of refueling. Meanwhile, the Wasp and Intrepid cut back on their deceleration and swept toward a much higher orbit, one that would take them on a quick flyby of the mystery-shrouded moon. Solwyn, good navigator that she was, guessed before Chris asked her that she'd like to know if they could transform their present course into an orbit around the moon. Even decelerating at 3.5 g, that option is already gone. We'll need at least one orbit to match that moon. Maybe two if I miss a window. They were halfway to the moon when the chief announced, Something is lifting off from our target moon. Whoever they are, they're coming straight at us. Chapter 9 Raise defenses, Chris ordered. Shields up, said Selwyn, as an umbrella of smart metal spread out in front of the wasp. Battleships and cruisers were encased in ice, some of it meters thick, to ablate away the blazing sting of lasers and even kinetic weapons. Small ships like the Wasp, especially when it was wrapped in shipping containers full of scientists, marines, and other gear, could hardly use the ice defense. The rotating umbrella of smart metal, especially if it was angled to the threat axis, not only provided protection, but also gave the Wasp a chance to hide behind it. Where exactly was the Wasp, with respect to the spinning parasol? Guess. Meanwhile, Chris's ship had four 24-inch pulse lasers ready to strike out with a sting of her own. Slipping out farther to the left of the Wasp, the Intrepid deployed her own protection. Ahead of them, the unknown continued to close. How fast is that sucker accelerating? Captain Drago asked. 3.5, no, 3.8 G, sir, the chief reported. Can you get us a picture of it? The captain asked. I got one as it launched, but the thing is spraying something into the space all around it now. The chief tapped his board, and a small window opened on the main screen. 
it showed a series of spheres balanced on rocket fire. Fusion rockets? Chris asked. I would guess so from their temperature, the chief said. But I'm getting next to nothing from my electronic readouts. Nelly, hail it. Try every language we know, Chris said. Say, we come in peace, for starts. Doing it, Chris. While Nellie tried to open a conversation, the ship continued to close the distance, eating up the kilometers. Is it going to try to ram us? Sullivan asked. Get ready to take evasive action, Captain Drago ordered. Don't do anything yet. It's on a steady course. Let's not juggle its elbow. The three ships closed. Nellie tried sending numbers to see if they would talk math back to her. Then the thing hit them with a laser. The spinning parasol did its job, rotating more smart metal into the vacancy as fast as the laser could make the hole. When the power had ended, the parasol was still there. Nellie quickly patched it up, but the shield out there spinning was several meters smaller across. Ouch, the chief said. That was not nice, the captain agreed. Locked and loaded, Chris said. I think Nellie and I can graze it through all the gunk it's pumping into the space around it. Do it, the captain said. Nellie, let's open the largest sphere to space. Just a quick cut, Chris said, moving the crosshairs on her board to show exactly where she wanted to hit the stranger. Nellie put a red dot on Chris's target. With sincere regrets for starting the next alien war, Chris closed the firing switch for Laser 1. On the screen, a laser reached out for the alien. On Chris's board, an outside camera followed the shot. There, at least, the crud around the ship gave them something for the laser to relate to. A red beam cut right where Chris wanted. One sphere took the hit along the top of its curve. The alien didn't slow. It just kept coming. Hit it again. Captain Drago said. Aim for the engines. Already setting up for it, Chris said, and moved her crosshairs aft. Before Nellie could cover the target with a dot, the alien shot a second time. Once again, the shield did its job. We can't take many more like that, Selwyn reported. Let's see how good they are at damage control, Chris said, as she punched laser two. On the main screen, and on Chris's view, a red beam reached out for the aft end of the alien ship and sliced right through it. Behind it, the glow of the rocket motors sputtered. The ship wobbled on its tower of fire. I got him, Chris said. Then the spheres of the ship rippled as an explosion ran its full length, from bow to stern. Huge chunks of the different spheres flew in all directions. Chris had seen ships die violent deaths. It was not something she ever wanted to get used to. But this explosion looked very different from any of the other ones. Chief, talk to me about what just happened. Professor Mfumbo, what can your experts report? Was that a reactor containment failure? I don't think so, Chris, the professor reported. My experts here say that was some kind of chemical explosion. We're running our high-speed cameras back over it. I can tell you more in a few minutes, but the explosion doesn't appear to have been initiated in the last sphere where you hit it. Rather, it started at the opposite end of the ship and moved aft. Chris nodded. That was what it looked like to me as well. Let me know as much as you can as soon as you can. This is interesting, the chief said. Everything is interesting. Chris said. What's making your bunny jump? The moon. That hot spot where the ship just launched from? It just got very hot. Explosive hot. Whatever they were doing there, I think someone just blew up all the evidence. And unless I'm very mistaken, they used the exact same sort of explosives on the moon as they did on the ship. Yes, Chris said. How very interesting. Chapter 10
Lieutenant Commander, Her Royal Highness Chris Longknife, leaned back in her chair, reviewing in her mind what had just happened. Had she just become one of those damn long knives who shot up the first alien contact humanity made in the last 80 years? Lately, she'd spent some time wondering how her great-grandfather's generation could have made such a hash of its encounter with the ITG. No, hi, how are you? Just shoot, shoot, shoot. It looks like I owe Grandpa's Ray and Trouble apologies. Chris tapped her comm link. Professor Mfumbo, have your boffins spotted anything else in this system that we need to shoot, dodge, or otherwise be aware of? I'm afraid we have found nothing of interest. Or maybe the more proper answer is that I am glad to report we have not. Captain Drago, I'm going to withdraw to my tax center. Please feed all ship data to that location, after first making copies of that data and copying them out to several backup locations. Those of you on the bridge, you may want to make an extra copy of your board's data and hide it in your sock drawer. It may come in handy when you write your memoirs of today, if you don't need it earlier at my court-martial, to prove that there were no changes to your data by me or anyone else. Ain't it great to be a part of history, Selwyn observed dryly. But the navigator was already downloading her board to a memory chip and had several more on her board ready to be filled. Captain Drago looked around. I'll order a crate brought up from supply. Thank you, Chris said. Nellie, have my staff meet in my tax center. They are already headed there. Ask the galley to bring around coffee and sandwiches. I'm hungry, and I think it's going to be a long night. Cookie is already putting together a tray for us, Chris, Nellie reported. With a sigh, Chris stood and began to make her way off the bridge. Behind her, a gunnery mate second class slipped into her vacant station and began to download Chris's data. Her team was waiting for Chris by the time she reached her private retreat. Captain Jack Montoya, Royal USMC, and head of her security detail, had taken the seat to her left. There, he had a clear view of the door and anyone trying to enter. Professor Mfumbo held down the other end of the table. He'd come alone. Abby, officially Chris's maid, was to Jack's left, fiddling with the tray of goodies, and also where she had a good line of sight on the door. Abby was a crack shot, who even the Marine Detachment's gunny sergeant could only match shots with. Penny, the staff's intel expert, had taken the seat to Chris's right, which put her back to the door. If something evil got as far as that, without her knowing it was coming, she'd consider her job a failure, and the mess something for the Marines to clean up. To Penny's right was Colonel Cortez, Chris's defeated foe and ground tactics advisor. Right now, he pursed his lips in reflection. I've never been around when a galactic war got started. But that sucker didn't leave you any choice but to shoot. Very aggressive behavior. I'm glad to hear that somebody else feels the way I do, Chris said. But I need to know what actually happened back there, and who was doing what to whom. There are too many unknowns and unthinkable things that leave me scratching my head. I do not like that, not at all. Penny, will you take the lead on forensics? I expected you'd want me to. I've had Mimsy capturing some of the raw feed off the Boffin's video take. The wreckage is in much bigger chunks than I would expect had a reactor failure been involved. With luck, we'll have something bigger than atoms to examine. Professor, I hope you'll excuse me for having my computer do what one of Nellie's kids can do so well. The professor scowled at the request for forgiveness. He had been offered one of Nellie's children when Chris's computer got the biological urge to gestate. His initial experience had been something less than sterling, and he'd returned the gift. He and Captain Drago both. The boffin could not be happy to have Penny using the same secret weapon that he had declined in order to steal a march on his people. Do what you will. But remember, what might look like something at first blush to an amateur 
may have a totally different meaning when examined patiently by a trained expert. A good point that we will keep in mind, Chris said. So, Penny, what are your first observations? Give me a minute, Penny said, her unfocused gaze aimed in the general direction of the overhead. Penny's ivory skin seemed to pale almost to translucent as her breath slowed. Usually this kind of first glance would have been done on one of the wall screens for all to see and comment on. Instead, Penny held whatever output she was getting to just herself and her pet computer, Mimsy. The computer feed colored the contacts of Penny's eyes, but was private to her. The minute Penny had asked for stretched into two, then three. Chris began to get edgy. This was her first initial alien contact. This was humanity's first new alien contact in 80 years. The last one had gone horribly wrong. This one looked to be going along the same downward path. Chris didn't much like the trip. Worse, Chris didn't like that this one was her responsibility. Just as Chris was about to open her mouth, Penny's gaze dropped from the overhead. She took a deep breath. Okay, I think I can see how to brief this. We're ready, Chris said. Nobody will ever be ready for this one, Penny said, half under her breath. Across from her, the wall screen lit up. Abby turned to face it. Jack pushed his chair away from the table so he could see, without losing sight of the door. The screen opened on a view of the moon, as a large explosive blew out in a gale of expanding gases. Some of the debris cloud achieved at least orbital speed, maybe escape velocity. First things first. The explosion on the moon. It was a chemical explosive. Conventional. Not something we use. That stuff is corrosive and dirty. It's in our books, but it hasn't met environmental standards since before we broke loose from Earth. I'll leave it to the boffins to give you all the gory details if you want more. Was it done intentionally? Chris asked. No doubt in my mind, Penny said. Both because of the type of explosives and the timing. It blew within five seconds of the ship destroying itself. Isn't that an opinion? Abby shot at Penny. A well-founded one, I think, Penny countered. When you have the same explosives letting go within seconds of each other, coincidence must take a back seat to facts. Once can be an accident. Twice, we should start looking for hostile activity. Three, and only a fool doesn't assume enemy actions. Spoken like a true paranoid, Chris thought, raising an eyebrow to Penny's other listeners. The rest of the room took a moment to mull her viewpoint. No one chose to express a dissenting opinion. Go on, Chris said. The view on the screen changed to show the unknown ship charging up to meet them. In slow motion, Chris's laser beam shot into the aftmost sphere of the ship. I put it right where you wanted it, Nellie said. Exactly, Chris agreed and watched as the fusion engine sputtered, throwing the ship off its steady course. Oh, and for what it's worth, Penny said. The hostel was on a collision course with the Wasp until Chris's hit in the engine room knocked it off track. Nasty little beggar, the colonel observed dryly. Shooting first and hell-bent on ramming. I'm developing a serious doubt that they ever intended to ask questions. It's too early to start applying salve to our souls, Colonel, Chris said. But thanks anyway. It wasn't a cheap band-aid I was offering, Princess, but a quite serious observation. I'm starting not to like these bad actors. Here's one to look at, Penny offered, to bring them back on topic. A body appeared, whirling out of the explosion. Two arms, two legs, a head. The face was hard to make out but there was a most prominent jaw, even hair. They look almost human, Jack said. 
We've identified the three alien species who built the jump points, Chris said. All had their own evolutionary trails and looked nothing like us or the Aitichi. Now we run into these bug-eyed monsters. They come out shooting and look amazingly like us. Very much like us, Penny said. And a section of the explosion filled the view screen. Several bodies were clearly visible. Two looked to have a pair of large mammary glands on their chests. The screen cycled through the next few frames slowly, letting the bodies rotate. They certainly looked female. What's that other one holding to her breast? Chris asked. A third woman held on to a small bundle. In the next couple of frames, she lost her grasp. The wrappings around the bundle also came undone. I think that's a child, Penny said. Dear Mother of God, the colonel said. They blew up their ship with their women and children on board. What kind of monsters are we dealing with? Chris turned away from the screen. Not that she could ignore it. She focused on Penny. You're sure they blew up the ship themselves? The explosion started in the forward sphere, she said. And the screen's view changed to show the entire ship again. It began to come apart, starting, as Penny said, with the forwardmost of the spheres, then the second, then the third. The aft sphere, engineering, from all appearances, was the last to go and seemed to fly into the least number of pieces. I think they expected their destruction to involve the reactor, Penny said. That's just a guess, but if the reactor had blown it would have taken the fragmentation and dispersal of debris to a whole new level. Chris nodded. She had already done a post-mortem on a ship where the reactor finished off its destruction. The wreckage had been little more than atoms and molecules. Her ongoing nightmares, however, were much more substantial. So, Princess, the professor said, your hit on the power plant seems to have resulted in our having wreckage to examine that they did not intend for us to have. It looks that way, Chris said. Look at those bodies. No spacesuits, Abby said, pointing at the picture still on the wall screen. No survival pods. They all were in a shirt-sleeve environment. And some bastard opened that ship to vacuum for all of them. I don't think survival was ever the intention the colonel said. I've heard of victory or death as a battle cry, but in all my study of human history, I've never encountered anything like this. Chris could only shake her head. This is our first human encounter with someone else's history. I know we humans have had our nasty and desperate times. I think we found someone or something willing to take nasty and desperate to a whole new level. God help us. Those who shared her room seemed unable to expand upon that observation. Chris looked at her options and found only one to start with. Nellie, tell Captain Drago that I would like for the Wasp to make orbit around that moon so that we can examine both what our alien was doing down there and recover as much of the wreckage as possible. I'll want to ship as much of the wreckage and bodies back to human space as we can. That will involve unloading one of the cargo ships, the captain answered Chris immediately. I figured as much. You said it would take two or three days to refuel. Refuel and resupply the ships from the replenishment ships, yes, Chris. We might as well put our time to multiple uses. Penny, put together a short report on what just happened and flash it to the rest of the fleet whenever we get a line of sight on one of them. Most of the fleet was on the other side of the gas giant. With the Wasp trying to make orbit around the target moon, the two elements of Chris's fleet were likely to make ships passing in the night seem downright familiar. I'm sure they're curious. I bet they are, Penny said, and went silent as she began to arrange her data drop. Chapter 11 Chris would have preferred that the other ships of the fleet had stayed in low orbit around the gas giant while they took on reaction mass. 
However, she was discovering the difference between leading a fleet and commanding one. Where she led, they followed. What she wanted, they considered. And frequently ignored. The admirals flipped to see whose flag got refueled first. As it happened, the order came out Fury, Haruna, Swiftshore. And, in that order, they all refueled, then climbed out of the gas giant's gravity well to join the wasp orbiting the small moon and hunting for the odd bits of wreckage. Since the battleships had large crew transfer boats, some even looked like planetary assault craft, they did make a major contribution to the hunt for chunks of the alien wreckage. Maybe it was the very ad hoc nature of the fleet, but it seemed to gain more structure and pay more credence to her suggestions as they assimilated the full impact that they had met an alien, and Chris Longknife had blown it to bits. The different nationalities of her fleet had made their own arrangements for their supply needs. Most were container ships, good for passing a container from freighter to warships and quick resupply. Chris, however, needed a huge enclosed space for collecting and organizing a messy jigsaw puzzle that had once been a truly alien ship. She drafted the Constant Star. Its large number two hold was just the place to do the post-mortem on humanity's latest encounter with an alien race. The Constant Star had been leased in haste by Admiral Channing when it became clear that this little jaunt of Chris's might not be over in a few weeks. The Star was an older, break-bulk freighter, capable of handling containers, but still with huge cargo holds for storing this and that, and more of both. However, even after both Helvetican battlecruisers had stuffed themselves to the gills, there were still supplies piled high in the Constant Star. Over protests all around, Chris ordered the other supply ships to take on the balance of the Star's cargo and empty her totally out. The skipper of the Star wasn't very happy to be losing his paying cargo. He only perked up at the hint from Chris that he would be going home first and could return with another load of supplies. Chris herself was changing her own plans. She'd intended to send the Mercury home immediately with a negative report. Instead, the Mercury hung around to help refuel the fleet and wait for Chris's team to complete its initial analysis of this first alien encounter. Then the Mercury would escort the constant star back to human space so the rest of humanity could meet their new neighbor. Chris could well imagine the political firestorm that would follow. There were definite advantages to being several thousand light years away from home. Chris waited until the swift shore made orbit, then invited all three admirals to bring whomever they chose to tour the growing collection of twisted metal tied down in the constant star's forward holds. Admirals Kratz, Kota, and Channing immediately replied that they'd be there in an hour. So Chris found herself, escorted by her own staff, drifting weightless through a collection of blackened and torn metal, plastic and ceramics. Any of this new to us? Vicky asked. There's a lot of machinery, Chris said. Some of it's pretty obvious what it does. Other chunks are so fragmentary that no one has any idea what they're supposed to do. Chris pointed at write-ups that were attached to some pieces of metal. These explained what can be explained. Other sheets of paper have only a big question mark. Our problem is we can't decide if our ignorance is because of the damage it suffered in the explosion or whether it really is something new. It could be just a different take on what we already have that works. Their air reprocessing system is very different from ours. I'm not sure it's better. And they didn't say anything. Just started shooting, huh? Admiral Kratz said. I'd prefer to discuss that when we've got some weight on, if you don't mind, Chris said. So, you like my idea? The admiral grinned like a proud papa. Was it yours? Chris asked. Close enough, Vicky said, like she was in on a secret that she wasn't about to share with Chris. I hate weightlessness, the admiral said. When it was clear we were headed out where there were no spaceports, I offered a prize for the best idea. 
It was a semen recruit's notion. Have you ever seen a yo-yo? Chris admitted that she had once played with one as a girl. I couldn't make it do anything. Well, semen welt can do anything with one of those spinning things. He can do it with two at the same time. That got me thinking, the admiral said, beaming. Chris could see no reason why two spinning yo-yos should give anyone an idea to spin two ships around the same point, connected by a long beam, or, in the case of the wasp and the intrepid, a long spun bar of smart metal. Still, while the ship swung around, there was at least half a G of fake gravity. And no barfing. This idea had been floated before the fleet left Wardhaven space. Admiral Kota tried it with the Haruna and Chikuma, using a cable. They were sister ships, and supposed to displace the same tonnage. Still, there was enough difference in weight, and the distribution of that weight, to cause the ships to do a little dance around each other and the point that was supposed to be their mutual center of gravity. The line tended to go very taut, then limp, then taut again. What would happen if... No, when it snapped was not something to contemplate. New Yards got a quick contract to knock together several harnesses, and each of the ships adopted a dance partner. For the warships, it wasn't too bad. Each of them had a sister ship close to its tonnage at hand. For the auxiliaries, it was a completely different story. They were exiled to the far end of the fleet line anchorage as they orbited the small moon and given wide berths, to which several of the merchant captains had added double the planned distance. Still, no one was complaining about the problem. No sailor really liked microgravity. The grim tour got worse. Most of the technicians were left behind in the forward holds when the admirals and their chief doctors headed aft. The last hold was still open to space. One hundred and twelve bodies floated in frozen preservation there. Damn, they look so much like us, Vicky said. Yeah, we run into the first alien that really looks like our brother, Chris said. And all it wants to do is kill us. So we killed them, Admiral Kratz said. They didn't leave me much of a choice, Chris said. Yes, yes, Admiral Kota said. Still, it would be nice to be able to talk to them. Have you recovered any computers, any books? We'll cover that in more depth on the Wasp, Chris said. It is possible that all the computers were located right by the explosives. That would expose them to a lot of heat and force, and leave them in very tiny pieces. Almost as if someone didn't want us to have anything to look at, said Admiral Kratz. If that wasn't their intention, they sure achieved it, Chris said. What would lie at the root of that kind of behavior? whispered Admiral Channing. That is something that we can only guess at, Chris said. I'd like to give everyone a chance to do some of that guessing before I put the finishing touches on my report. I suspect you were all writing reports of your own? The admirals nodded in various shades of noncommittal. How many of them were there? Vicky asked. So far, we've recovered all, or major portions, of 132 bodies, Chris said. Men, women, children, elderly, and babes in arms— there might be a few more out there. We're still hunting. How big was that ship? Vicky asked. From the open mouths, she'd only beaten the admirals to the question by a moment. About the size of one of our courier ships, Chris said. What have you got? Ten people on those? Admiral Kratz asked. Yes. When they were pirate schooners, they used to cram twenty-five or thirty into them. For a couple of weeks... Have you found any living quarters down on the moon? Nothing, Chris said. All that's down there are some digging and smelter gear. They were blown individually. But there's nothing that looks like housing. So they were living crammed into that ship, Vicky said. Having babies and growing old together, Chris added. Aliens, Admiral Kratz said, shaking his head. They are aliens, 
even if they do look the most like us of any aliens we've found. Will the contents of this ship be shared with our home governments? Admiral Kota asked. The politician in Chris's upbringing spotted the hot button in that question, but the fleet leader in her just shrugged. I'm sending this cargo back to human space. Then I plan to continue my voyage of discovery. I expect to have more on my mind than who gets what of this mess. The Navy officers drifted up to a window that looked into an isolated room organized like an operating center. On one table, a lone body was strapped down and laid out. Its chest had been opened and its organs removed. They now floated in glass jars. They've got everything we've got, Chris said. Different arrangement. Our guess is that they started walking upright about six million years ago, too. Give or take a few months, she half-joked. Can we go in? Admiral Kratz's head doctor asked. Chris nodded. We're using level three biohazard suits. The three doctors who had accompanied their admirals so far took their leave and headed into the operating room. Have you run a DNA check? Admiral Channing asked. Yes, Chris said. They have DNA, but their base molecules are different from ours. My biologists are very excited. And no, they doubt there can ever be any interbreeding. Even if our plumbing can be made to rendezvous, the genetics just aren't going to let it happen. Chris, we need to talk, Admiral Kratz said, waving his hand. About all of this, who gets what? Where do we go from here? Yes, we need to talk, the other two admirals agreed. Well, sirs, we have gravity on the wasp. May I invite you to the forward lounge? Chapter 12 Chris was halfway back to the wasp before she noticed that it wasn't alone. A new courier ship hung just off where it swung in space with the Intrepid. A large shuttle from the wasp was just departing from the stranger and heading back to Chris's ship. Nellie, get me Captain Drago. I got him, Chris. Hello, your highness, he said cheerfully. I was expecting a call from you. What's a strange ship doing off our bow? There's nothing strange about the sandpiper. She's here to replace the Mercury. The king thought we might need another courier boat. What did it bring? Who said it brought anything? Admiral Crossy would not pay for a fourth courier ship if it didn't carry something twisted and sneaky and, I don't know, special for him. See for yourself. Longboat Two will be reeled in right after you. Chris was seated right behind the two bosun's mates running the show. She watched over their shoulders as they attempted the new maneuver it took to land on the Wasp. Usually, when a ship was in orbit, a longboat just nestled into a docking bay but a ship wasn't usually doing flips with another ship while both of them zipped along in orbit. Now they did. As it turned out, it wasn't all that hard. To watch. The wasp let out a long line with a loop at the end. The longboat snagged the loop with a hook it now dropped from its nose. The hook was retracted once it had the loop solidly in hand. Then the wasp reeled in the longboat. Easy, if you didn't have to do it yourself. Though neither of the youngsters piloting the boat said a word of complaint, Chris noticed both of them wiping sweat from their brows. Well done, she told them. Piece of cake, Commander, the senior of them said. Chris waited while the admirals exited her launch. They were admirals, and she was a lieutenant commander. So seniors go first, even if it is your flagship and you are a princess. Once aboard, she had Penny lead them to the forward lounge, while she waited to see what surprise the unholy trinity had popped on her. The next longboat docked with no more difficulty than the last. Some people were spending a lot of time in the simulator, no doubt. It took a while for the hatch to open, but when it did, who should clop out but Ron, Chris's favorite Aitichi? What are you doing here? She demanded, unsure whether to offer a hand to shake 
or see if she could actually manage a hug for something with four arms, four legs, and a whole lot of elbows and knees. She did get both her arms around the trunk of her friend, though it was a bit of a problem, bending over his four-jointed pelvis. And Aitichi was not like the human's mythological centaur. His body trunk rose from somewhere closer to his center of gravity, as befits a creature that swam for a lot longer in the sea, and owed its ancestry more to something like a squid than to a quadrupedal land critter. Ron hugged back, doing something that almost sounded like a human laugh. I could ask what you are doing here, he said, through the translator Chris had given him the last time he'd dropped by human space. I'm hunting for whatever's eating up your scout ships, Chris said. You are a far distance from where they went and did not return. Well, yes, we call incidents like exploding scout ships a hot datum. They draw attention. We don't want to draw any more attention to those spots. Anyone who comes nosing around them might keep nosing and bump into you. I want to come at them from the other way around and draw their attention this way. You humans are very twisty in your minds. I think I like that. Well, you arrived just as I and some of the fellow voyagers were about to hash over something that happened to us in this system. Nothing bad, I hope. It's me you're talking to, Ron. I'm a long knife. Bad things happen around long knives. The way they do around Chapsom Way, he said, giving the ancient name of those who chose his chooser. He paused to introduce Chris to those who had come with him. Tedon Sum Lee, Chris already knew. He still wore the gray and gold of the Imperial Aitichi Navy. The other wore black and red. Chris missed his name on the first fly, but Nellie promised that she caught it. He was from the Imperial Aitichi Army. No green and white advisors this time? Chris asked. I do not speak for the Emperor, Ron said. Officially, I and my associates are still on an Aitichi scout ship. Depending on the outcome of this voyage, we will be welcomed with praise or the cup of apology. Chris knew more about the Aitichi than any human alive, which was not saying a lot. However, after spending a long two months hiding Ron in human space, she did know that the cup of apology was filled with a slow-acting and painful poison. Apparently, the aliens Chris had just witnessed blowing themselves to bits weren't the only ones operating in the do-or-die mode. We are meeting in the forward lounge. You should feel right at home. Ron and Ted nodded agreement in their strange, four-armed way. The army officer was busy using all four of his eyes in an effort to catch everything going on within sight. He'd get over that in time. Chris let off. She was halfway to the lounge when Captain Drago fell in with her party. Ron, we have your quarters waiting for you. I see there are only three of you now. They should be more roomy this trip. Thank you, Captain, Ron said. I thought you offloaded the Aitichi's containers, Chris said. No, Admiral Crossenshield suggested that I shouldn't. He also suggested that I not mention that fact to you. He said something about surprises being good for long knives every once in a while. I thought you were the captain of my ship. Ninety-nine times out of a hundred, I am. You must allow me that other one in a hundred, princess. It is not easy to serve two masters. Or three or four, Chris added darkly. I am just a humble ship captain. You are the damn long knife. Your Highness. Since they were at the hatch to the forward lounge, Chris let the captain get the last word in. With three admirals already in the forward lounge, Chris didn't rate an attention on deck. Still, as she and her Aitichi friend entered the lounge, all conversation came to a roaring halt. The room had pretty much arranged itself as it had the first meeting. Chris's Patron 10 officers held the ground nearest the bar which was doing a fair business tonight. The Imperials were as far from the Royals as they could be, and the Helveticans and Musashi 
occupied the neutral middle. Jack had saved her the table nearest to the forward screen. Chris headed for it, the Aitichi right behind her. All hands, of the human variety, took this first opportunity in eighty years to get an eyeful of their previous mortal enemy. While Ron and Ted kept their eyes straight ahead, the poor army officer looked like he wanted to bolt. His head swiveled through the full 270 that it could. What with his four eyes, that pretty much covered everything from front to back. Halfway to her table, Chris chose to have mercy on her fellow sailors. Admirals, ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce the Imperial Representative Ron Sum Pin Sum Wei Ku Chap Sum Wei. He's kind enough to answer to Ron. He is the reason we are making this voyage of discovery. I'm glad he could join us. The admirals came forward to be formally introduced. All of them managed not to wince as they shook the hand Ron offered them. Vicky also presented herself. She did a bit of a curtsy and winked at Chris. Chris insisted she had not met you or anyone of your species. I'm glad you've made her an honest woman. I can understand her, uh, subterfuge, Ron said with a bit of a bow. The powers that be make great demands on their messengers. Does he have a sense of humor? Vicky asked. Oh, yes, Chris said. It just takes a while for it to come out. Vicky pursed her lips in some doubt. Chris got to the front of the room, where Jack, Penny, Abby, and the Colonel awaited her. Three of the barkeeps arrived, pushing the heavily carpeted arrangements that had served the tall Aitichi as chairs during their last visits to the forward lounge. Chris gave the thoughtful help a thankful smile. The amenities finished, Chris turned to face a room full of officers, most of whom outranked her, and the majority of whom came from associations that wanted nothing to do with Grandpa Ray's united whatever until Crossy sent them his little home video of that recent family get-together between Grandpa Ray, Trouble, and the boy Chris had brought home to dinner. Chris cleared her throat. I wasn't sure how to start this briefing. Most of you have seen the report of what happened. I doubt you want me to go over it again. However, now that we have been joined by Ron, the Aitichi who first brought us the news that there was something powerful out here in the galaxy that was shooting first and not bothering to ask questions— I think we should start with a review of what I did on my summer vacation. That drew a dry chuckle from the humans. Ron gave her a blank stare. Since he gave it to her with four eyes, it was something to behold. Nellie, roll the video take, Chris said. The screen behind her changed. The sight of the intrepid, hooked to a pole a couple of thousand meters long, Swinging against a star field with a moon and gas giant occasionally coming into view, vanished. Filling the screen in its place was a view centered on the moon's hot spot, a ship rising from it. It took five minutes to go through the executive summary. Now it had Penny's voiceover to explain what was happening to anyone whose eyes balked at admitting what they saw. I am sorry, Chris. Ron said into the silence at the end of it. I know you do not enjoy violence. She didn't have any choice, Admiral Kota said, before Chris could. I find myself wondering, Chris said. While, admittedly, everyone may not be as big a fan of talking as I am, still, it's hard to believe anyone would prefer a knock-down, drag-out firefight to a bit of calm, quiet conversation. The actions of the captain of this ship leave me groping for an explanation. She paused before going on. We've completed a biological scan of all the bodies. Every one of them shares similar genetic material. It appears that this ship was crewed by a family or clan. What would cause a grandfather or captain to consign his own children and grandkids to the cold vacuum of space? Around Chris, several in the room groaned. Lots of heads shook. I've got to file some kind of report on this encounter. 
I'm struggling to get my mind around it. To have something to say. My first guess is that whoever we are dealing with here really hates or is terrified of the strange. They could be the most xenophobic population of conquer-or-die types we've ever dreamed of, worse than our worst fictional imaginings. There is, of course, a second possibility. What worse option could a long knife come up with? Admiral Channing of the businesslike Helveticans asked. We've never seen a ship like the one they had, Chris said, having Nellie flash back on the screen the best picture they had of the alien ship. I'm unaware of any ships in human or Aitichi space that are strung together from conjoined spheres. Many in the room nodded. Could there be someone else out here? Someone who builds spaceships very much similar to the way we build ours? Could that someone be so nasty that our grandfather here did not hesitate for a moment to kill his beloved kids and grandkids rather than risk the chance of them falling under their control? Once again, Chris had succeeded in bringing the room to absolute silence. She let it stay that way, so the two options could sink in, before opening her arms in a question. Does anyone see a third option? The question hung in the air for a very long minute. No one came up with another way of looking at the data. After a long pause, Admiral Kratz stood. I hope you'll excuse me if I change the topic. But what will you do with the Constant Star's load of wreckage and bodies? I'm sending it back to Santa Maria with the Mercury. Santa Maria has a major research center devoted to trying to unravel the mystery of the three alien races who built the star jumps. That looks like a good place to handle the further examination of what we have here. The newly imperial admiral from Greenfeld glowered at Chris. And what is to keep those ships and their cargo from vanishing before they ever get to Santa Maria? How will we know that they have not been hijacked off to some secret U.S. base, where no one but royal experts ever look at them and never tell us a word about what they find. At that, the room exploded with words. Chapter 13 Chris allowed herself a deep sigh. She hadn't seen that one coming. This voyage had its problems, but everyone had stayed focused on why they were there. The alien encounter had thrown them a wild twist. They had come looking for surprises and had, up until a second ago, been doing a fairly good job of juggling the strange. Then again, the fleet of discovery hadn't had anything to fight over. Silly me. Now we've got our familiar baggage on the table, and it's back to business as usual. The Greenfeld Admiral stayed on his feet as the room boiled around him, then he raised his voice to boom above the racket. I intend to detach my battleship, the Terror, to escort the Constant Star. That will make sure some pirate doesn't make off with it and its cargo. At that, the room really got noisy. Admiral Channing shot to his feet. So it can vanish into one of Emperor Harry's secret bases? No, you don't. I'm going with it. The Helvetican Confederacy had held a vote to see if they should join King Raymond's united whatever. Grandpa Ray had lost resoundingly. Chris figured the Confederacy didn't much like what Grandpa Ray was doing. Then again, they hadn't even bothered to vote on joining the Greenfeld Alliance. That was understandable since Chance, the last planet to join the Confederacy, had just barely avoided being violently taken over by a Peterwald. Chris's help, and a lot of spilled blood, had left Chance free to choose its own way in human space. They'd chosen the Helvetican Confederacy, and, it seemed, the Confederacy remembered why. Chris held up her hands to try to gain some quiet to think. Hold it! Hold it! Hold it! The volume of her voice jumped as Nellie jacked it up artificially. The room quieted down, though it was nowhere close to silent. Okay, 
I see we humans have a trust problem. Admiral Kratz, I can understand you're wanting to make sure the Constant Star gets where it's going. I want to make sure it gets where it's going. Admiral Cota jumped in. And where might that be? Santa Maria, Chris snapped. Specifically the Institute for Alien Research. Chris knew of the place. It had been established almost as soon as Grandpa Ray got back from that lost colony. For the last ninety years, it had been humanity's cutting edge at researching exactly who and what were the three alien species who had built the jump points across the galaxy. Two million years ago, they had vanished. On Santa Maria, the three had built some sort of adult learning center. When they left, they forgot to turn it off. Apparently, the artificial intelligence running the place had gone senescent in the two million years during which it had no students. What it would have done to the several million peaceful citizens of Santa Maria when it discovered them was something Chris didn't want to contemplate. Grandpa Ray and a handful of veterans from the recent Unity War had been there, thank heavens, when the A.I. and the Santa Marians discovered each other. As Grandpa Ray liked to say, one supercomputer, one company of Marines, better than even odds for my side. The Institute for Alien Research has the best human minds available for unraveling aliens, Chris said. Most of your governments have universities with visiting professors at the Institute. Isn't it run by a long knife? Ray's sister? Vicky said. Aunt Alnaba transferred to the efforts on Alien One, Chris said. I think a professor from Earth has taken her place. Dr. Ernst Kanaka, Professor Mfumbo put in. A very good man. Wrote the paper about what we think we know about the Three's power system. And what happens after the wreckage reaches Santa Maria? Admiral Cota asked. I honestly don't know, Admiral. But it has been my experience, Chris went on, that once scientists get to chewing on a problem, they fight like wolves to keep it. I wouldn't say that, the professor said, in clear disapproval of Chris's analogy. However, I do think the Institute would be open for visits from a large collection of scientists. That is the way it has operated. Isn't Santa Maria kind of vulnerable, hanging out there alone halfway around the galaxy? Vicky asked. A third of the way around from human and Aitichi space, Chris corrected. And 15,000 light years from here. Looks to me like it's the safest place to be right now. From the way heads nodded and shook, it was clear Chris was not going to get any consensus on that. Then again, she didn't need any consensus. She just needed to get the constant star's load of wreckage off her hands and her fleet back to doing what it was out there to do. Discover. Let's see. Admiral Kratz, you want to send the terror back to Santa Maria? Yes. You're not going to change my mind, hung there with the single-word answer. Admiral Channing, you would like to have one of your battle cruisers in the escort. What about you, Admiral Kota? Admiral Channing and I only have two ships each. We can't both afford to send separate escorts. The two admirals flipped for the privilege of sending a ship along with the terror. Channing lost, or won. Anyway, the Triumph would fly wing on the Constant Star, which left Chris's royals the least represented. The Constant Star was a late addition to the Helvetican fleet. Even though it was leased at Wardhaven, Chris knew nothing of the captain and crew. Just as bad, the Mercury was a recently captured pirate schooner, crewed from the Wardhaven, uh, U.S. Navy. Still, the captain and crew were a blank to her. Commander Tausig, Chris said. Right here, your highness, Phil said, standing from where the other skippers of Patron 10 were, over near the bar. The other ships of the squadron were dry, just like the rest of the fleet. The Wasp, however, was different. 
With its mixed crew of civilians and service personnel, there were several contractor-managed restaurants and public rooms. Chris had never felt the need to place those watering holes off-limits to any of her crew. Indeed, she'd often used the forward lounge for semi-official purposes, just like now. Most of the visiting Navy folks had taken advantage of the bar already. Her skippers were no exception. Phil, I got a job for you. Mother of God, help me. Chris smiled at his reply, but went ahead with her orders. Please form a detail from the Hornet and establish a royal presence on the Constant Star. I'm holding you personally responsible for seeing that everything on that tub is turned over to the Institute for Alien Studies. Phil nodded. You got an inventory for me? Yes, we do, Chris, Nellie reported. Though it's kind of vague in several places. Understood. Pass it to Phil. I've got it, Commander, he said in a moment. That settled one set of problems. Phil Tausig came from a long line of Navy admirals in both Wardhaven and several other Rimworld navies. He would not be allowed to go missing. If he disappeared, there would be held to pay until a full explanation was made. Chris didn't want a posthumous accounting for Phil's family. She wanted to reduce the temptation for anyone to even try. Lieutenant Song, she called. A startled young woman jumped to her feet and braced. She'd been an ensign on one of the fast patrol boats that defended Wardhaven when six unidentified battleships showed up and demanded Wardhaven surrender on one of the few that survived. If Chris couldn't trust someone who'd fought with her at the Battle of Wardhaven, whom could she trust? I want the Hermes to take over as the courier ship back to Santa Maria. You will place your ship at Commander Tausig's disposal. Yes, ma'am, your highness, she said, snapping a salute. Indoors, uncovered, and sat down. Chris often had that impact on the young. The ensign would get over it in time. People who served with a long knife did. If they survived the experience. You have any questions, Phil? No, ma'am, he said easily. Get the wreckage back to Santa Maria, turn it over to the Institute. Leave the hassling to the civilians. May I suggest that I contract for any ships and supplies that I can find in Santa Maria orbit and get the moving out here with me and the Hermes? Logistics is always the first order of business. Chris said. Beside her, Colonel Cortez mouthed the same words himself and smiled. Chris was learning. A glance around the room showed a lot of Navy officers who'd gnawed enough on this bone and were ready to get gone. Chris asked the usual final question of a meeting. Anything further to discuss? Most everyone shook their heads. In the back of the room, Professor Mfumbo stood up. Professor, do you have something to add? Not to what has been said, Your Highness. But I would like to draw the attention of everyone present to certain portions of the reports that my scientists have put together. It might be unnecessary. All of you may have read every deathless word of prose we men and women of science have laid before you. Then again, you might not have. Chris noticed the eyes around the room already glazing over. Please go on, Professor. Quickly. He must have read her mind. Something or someone stripped away 10 to 15 percent of the mass of this gas giant. They did it in the last 50 to 100 years. Glazed eyes suddenly opened wide. The room got very quiet. Those are our findings, based on the strange situation of this gas giant and its moons. I should hedge that statement with careful scientific nuances. It might have lost 8%. It could have lost 20%. It could have suffered this strange reduction as recently as 40 years ago, or it might have happened 150 years ago. What you are saying, Chris said, is that something took very big bites out of that gas giant within my Grandpa Ray's lifetime. The professor nodded. Bites the size of three to seven Earths. Yes, that is what I and my buffins are trying to tell you. Chris let that sink in. 
She let the silence stretch for a while, because, at least in her head, it was not sinking in. It floated, like a yellow ducky in her bathtub when she was a kid. Only this yellow ducky was huge, and there was no way she could shove it under the water. Her thoughts spun. What finally came out was, no, not possible. It can't be happening to me and my world. With effort, she limited her gibbering to the inside of her own skull. Chris, this is appalling. Me having trouble believing it? No, Chris. What he just said. Yes, Nellie, this is appalling, Chris agreed, accepting her computer's understatement and failing to find anything better, or was it worse, to offer Nellie. Chris had no idea when the full impact of this would be absorbed. Probably it was best to end this meeting and let people go their own ways to digest this new lump of knowledge. Is there anything else in your report you want to make sure we notice? Chris said. Say no, say no, please say no. Yes, there is one more thing. Stupid me. Ask a question and you'll get the answer you don't want. Go on, Professor. We have established that there were 132 people on the alien ship. We think we have drawn up an accurate schematic of its design. The professor aimed his wrist unit at the main screen, and it switched away from where it was frozen on the final frame of the explosion. Suddenly, the ship was whole again. Quickly, the skin of the ship peeled back, showing the insides. Living quarters, workspaces, storage rooms, the bridge. Most of those areas were left empty in the drawing, but their purposes were written in. On that ship, there were about 12 cubic meters of pressurized living space for each of the men, women, and children aboard. Sleeping quarters two meters by three meters by two meters tall, Chris said. It was about a quarter of her own living quarters. Ugh. Pardon me for correcting you, your highness, the professor said. I did not say sleeping quarters. That allotment is the total room for their sleeping and wash space. It includes their contribution to their workspaces, public rooms and hallways. We are still debating whether or not they even had hallways, even in the command center. The only space not included in this allotment was a small hold full of rare earth ores recently extracted from the moon. That hold and engineering. That would include the reactors and the pressurized tanks for reaction mass. I should point out that we found several bunks in engineering in what we think was the control room. Oh, my God, Vicky said. Around Chris, the room bubbled at a low boil as, once again, people struggled to come to terms with what any rational human being would consider impossible. It was Penny who slowly rose to her feet. She went to touch the ship on the screen. The Navy officer whispered something that Chris didn't get, but apparently Mimsy, Penny's computer, did. An image of the gas giant appeared on the screen with the alien ship. On the screen, the giant regained 10% of its mass, swelling noticeably. What kind of species could suck up 10% of a gas giant? Then, having that kind of reaction mass to move themselves and their creation would cram their population into a ship, allowing only 12 cubic meters to an individual. The room fell silent as Penny spoke. When she finished, there was a pause, a brief one. Then the room exploded, as a number of people made off quickly for the restrooms. Others headed for the bar, giving loud voice to their need for a drink. Chapter 14 Chris sat in her chair, staring off into space, literally. The forward screen was back to the view from the external monitors. Stars flew by. The moon occasionally came into view. More often, the gas giant that had caused this struggle with cognitive dissonance made its own appearance. 
It had been a long time since Chris had been tempted, really tempted, to order a drink. So far, she was winning. Still, she wouldn't take a bet that she would be sober come midnight. The senior NCOs aboard the Wasp made sure that none of the junior enlisted abused the privilege of the ship's pubs. The problem was, there were only officers in the forward lounge at the moment, officers from four different navies. From the looks of empties piling up on some tables, adult supervision was desperately needed. Jack, inform the barkeep the limit tonight is three drinks. That sounds like a good idea. We're a long way from a brewery, and it doesn't look like we'll be getting a new supply anytime soon. He shoved off for the bar. Chris wouldn't take any bets that there weren't several stills in her fleet. She also wouldn't recommend that any of the captains in her fleet of discovery do a serious shakedown of Chief's country. Still, it was clear she needed to limit how people responded to the shock they'd all just taken to their system. Vicky came over to Chris's table. She cast a worried glance over her shoulder toward Admiral Kratz, but said nothing. The Admiral was one of those with several empties in front of him. Chris was a bit surprised at that. Still, the man had a family. He was looking forward to grandkids. He had talked of retirement. What kind of enemy had they just stumbled into? How large a fleet and army could they muster? Chris's mind still boggled at trying to answer those questions. Is it as bad as it seems? Vicky asked. Chris ran a worried hand through her hair. I don't know. Maybe we should turn around, run back to human space, pull in the welcome mat and hide under the bed. Who knows how long it would be before whatever it is out here stumbles across us. That is one option, Ron said. In a fashion, the three of them were seated at Chris's table. The two that Chris was familiar with took in the scene with some equilibrium. The army fellow was showing red alarms around his residual gill slits. Occasionally, Ted would lean over and say something to him in Aitichi. Nellie told Chris that the Aitichi Navy officer was telling the army officer that it was all right. Things would work out. It didn't seem to be working for the army guy. It sure wasn't working for Chris. The urge to run away and hide under a bed was very attractive. The thirst to crawl into a bottle and forget the future had new allure. You damn long knives have murdered us all. Like a bloody meat cleaver, that bellow cut through the noise of the room. Chris and Vicky swung around in their seats to face Admiral Kratz. He stood at his table swaying like a drunken bear. He swept the table with one large hand. Empties flew off in the lazy arc of half a G. Some shattered as they hit the deck. Most just landed and rolled. The admiral pointed at Chris's table. You damn Peter Walds and double damned long knives can't mind your own business. What is it with you? You damn near got us wiped out with your bleeding eye teachies. Now you just had to go and find something bigger, meaner, badder. For a long moment, the Admiral just snarled at Chris and Vicky. Then a shudder went through him. And my girls will never hold their babies. My grand little ones will never see the light of day. A racking sob escaped the Admiral. Chris rose from her seat and took two steps toward the drunk officer. With a glance, she caught the attention of the Fury's captain. Captain, I think you need to take your admiral home. The captain reached for the arm of his commander. Admiral Kratz shook him off. Don't you go giving my officers orders. Then you give them, Chris snapped. We've got problems enough. You're not going to find any answers to them in the bottoms of those glasses. Go to your ship, sleep it off. Tomorrow we'll put our sober heads together. Come, Admiral, let's go, the captain said. The large contingent from the Greenfeld fleet made a hole for their admiral, then followed him out the door. I've never seen him like that, Vicky said, coming up to stand beside Chris. He likely has never had a night this bad, Colonel Cortez said, joining them. It is one thing to face battle against odds you can gauge, 
maneuvers you can counter. It's something else entirely to face the unknown and know that you can't protect those you love and hold dear. The colonel paused for a moment. I'm none too sure how I feel about all this. I don't think any of us are, Chris admitted. She caught the eye of the senior bartender. Let's close down for the night. Last call? Someone asked, hopefully. No, honey, drink up. We're rolling up the floor, the barkeep answered. Vicky hurried off to catch the last launch from the Wasp to the Fury. Chris turned to Ron. Shall I take you to your quarters? I understand nothing's changed. That would be very gracious of you, Ron said. Though I should point out, I well remember the path from your forward lounge to my quarters. I suspect I could even find my way without all your scientists marking the path, waiting in line to pose questions for me. Was it that bad? Chris asked. The press at the door was almost gridlock. Chris and her team waited for others to file out. Since the admirals hadn't demanded that sailors of different fleets make a hole for them, Chris didn't think she should. Penny nudged Chris. We're not moving all that much. Any chance we could grab a chair, sit down, and talk a bit about what all this means? Chris shook her head. Penny, this is just too much for me. I've got to sleep on it. Tomorrow will be soon enough. Penny didn't seem happy with Chris's decision, but she said nothing more. Ron was interested in how Chris had spent her time since he left. It took her mind off the present to describe the fun of chasing pirates and claiming new territory for the hostile Peter Wald Empire. He considered that funny, and time better spent than his own. He'd been locked down in the Imperial Palace. He was required to be available on five-minute notice to meet with several very important committees. He was required to wait upon them, but in the end they never called him for a personal report. He brought his hands together and moved his four thumbs in circles around each other. Do you have a saying like that? Twiddling your thumbs? Chris said with a laugh, as she and her team finally passed through the doors from the forward lounge into the passageway that led aft. The next moment, an explosion threw Chris against Ron. Jack crashed into her back, and they all ended up in a heap on the deck. Behind them, the swinging doors of the forward lounge blew out. Immediately, the airtight doors slammed shut and clanged as they locked down. Hull breach, the public address system announced. Hull breach in the forward lounge. Chapter 15 Chris scrambled back to her feet. Jack tried to push her aft, but the passageway was a solid mass of people, all trying to regain their feet and move in the same direction, preferably at the same time. Chris edged her way around Jack so she could get a better view through one of the small vision plates in the airtight doors. All she saw was smoke. Something had exploded. Some of the furniture had caught fire. The smoke didn't last long as both air and smoke were sucked out through several rents in the hull. One body, Chris hoped he was already dead, went with the smoke. The checkered tabletops, however, were also doing their job. Some had caught fire, but others held their circular form and rode on the blasting air currents toward the rents in the ship's structure. On the ceiling, valves opened, releasing globs of sealant that also rode the wind torrents to help the deforming tabletops shore up the holes. All this was done quickly enough that the other bar crew were able to keep their holds on whatever they had grabbed and avoid being sucked out into the cold vacuum. Pressure has been stabilized in the forward lounge. Make way for damage control parties. Clear the passageways for damage control parties, the ship's computer repeated. Chris, Jack said. Yes, yes, Chris said, backing up and taking the first turn off the main passageway so that a dozen sailors in spacesuits carrying gear could pass her. Penny, Penny, Chris called. The cop's daughter was at her elbow in a moment. That was no accident, Chris said. Get a forensic team together from Jack's Marines. 
By breakfast tomorrow morning, I want to know what went down in there. No sleep for the wicked, Abby said with a smile for the Navy officer, who'd just been ordered to do an all-nighter. Abby, Chris said. I was just headed for bed, her maid replied. You've been getting lazy, what with no one trying to kill me, Chris said, reaching for her maid's elbow. Looks like someone just did. Or maybe they were aiming for Vicky, or someone else. You're the spy. You tell me what the game is this time and who's calling the shots. Aye, aye, bossy princess, Abby said, which left Chris with nothing better to do than provide an unnecessary guide for Ron back to his quarters. She paused at the hatch that led into Aitichi country. You want to come inside? Ron asked her. Chris shook her head. Then she added, no. In cross-evolutionary track discussions, body language was more open to mistakes than a simple word. I've got some tough decisions to make tomorrow, and they just keep getting harder. I do not think that bomb will help, Ron said. Not likely, Chris agreed. I need to do some thinking inside my own skull. Then I will tell you here what I would have told you inside. I was in much trouble after my last visit to human space. What kind of trouble? Chris asked. Many different kinds. My emperor was not happy that I brought back no promises of help from your people. I'm sorry about that, Chris said. I tried. I know that you did. What is written is written. However, my chooser was also very unhappy with me. That took Chris aback. How come? He was not happy to learn what you and I had concluded about how the war was fought. Oh, Chris said. Neither was my grandpa, Ray. I don't think any of the people who made the tough decisions were happy about us figuring out what they really did during the war. No, he was most unhappy. Before he let me join you on this voyage of search and discovery, he made me swear on my hope of being a chooser myself that I would not spend much time with you. It was that bad, huh? Chris said. Yes, I have sworn to go with you, to see what you see, and to report back to my emperor and chooser what you find. I am afraid that our quiet times of conversation will not be a part of this trip. Chris nodded, risking a tight smile. Just when she thought she might be getting to know a guy, wouldn't you know his mom would tell him she wasn't the kind of girl a nice guy like him brought home. I understand, she said. Ron stood aside for his army officer to open the hatch and peer inside. Once he concluded the humans had no deviltry waiting for them, he waved the imperial representative into his rooms. In a moment, the hatch closed and was dogged down solidly. Jack came up beside her as the door closed. You want to talk? About what? Chris said with a sigh. That another boy has been told he can't play with me, or that all human existence might depend on what I do tomorrow. And at the moment, I have no idea which side I should be on when I start playing one hell of a game of ping pong tomorrow. Jack nodded, then went on. For what it's worth, this mess is way too complicated for me to figure out. Whatever you decide, I'll support you. Thank you, Jack. That's about the nicest thing I've heard since we set out on this cockamamie trip. I wouldn't call it cockamamie, Jack said. He gave the matter a serious moment of consideration. Crazy? Yes. Wild? Maybe. Possibly even unusual, but not cockamamie. His lopsided smile came out to play as he finished giving her his opinion. Thank you for your unconditional vote of support. Chris said with a chuckle, and headed for her quarters. Chapter 16 Chris ordered a light breakfast brought to her tax center, and told Nellie to invite all her key staff to report there by 0730. From the way they dragged in, it didn't look like any of them had had a good night's sleep, even the ones she hadn't ordered to pull all-nighters. Okay, folks, Chris said 
as they gathered around the breakfast tray or filled cups of steaming coffee from the urn. I need answers to a few simple questions. Who, what, why, how, and most important, was that bomb last night aimed at me or at someone else? It looks like our little girl just might be growing up, Abby drawled as she sipped her coffee. Finally, it's got through her pretty little head that it isn't always about her. That last bomb hit me up beside the head pretty hard, Chris said dryly. It would be kind of hard not to be open to the idea that the world isn't just one big gun aimed at my own little head. I noticed that our little princess was kind enough to leave out when, Penny said, warming up the cup of coffee she'd carried into the meeting. That leaves all the rest of them in my lap. Thank you, oh, so much. The Navy officer took a seat at the table, yawned, then began crisply. The what was a bomb. It was in a glass similar to those used in the forward lounge, but not one of ours. We've recovered a lot of tiny glass globules. Most came from the forward lounge's stock. Some didn't. We expect those are from the bomb. The glass was not manufactured on Wardhaven. At the moment, we are not able to identify just where it did come from. That would be nice to know, Jack said. Of that I am most aware, Penny said. Forensics is chasing that down, but don't hold your breath. There are a lot of glass makers in human space, and this particular glass got remade but good in the explosion. The glass was disguised to look like an empty and planted in the middle of a whole slew of other empties. The detonator was hidden in something that looked like an olive. Everything was perfectly machined to fit unobserved into a bar. Do we have that on camera? Chris asked. Nope, Jack said. Forward Lounge does not have any security cameras. The operator doesn't want them. Folks are there to relax. If there's a problem, we'll handle it the old-fashioned way. Besides, we like that there were no cameras in there, remember? The king met the Aitichi rep in there. No record. We also did all that history review with the Aitichi in there. Again, nothing we wanted on the record. Right, Chris said. Remind me to review our security system. I already am, Chris, Jack said. We'd always considered the wasp above the fray, where attacks on you were concerned. It looks like we're getting a whole new grade of visitors these days. We're rigging the boat to meet level one security standards. Do I need to smile when I take a shower? Abby asked, giving Jack a most unhappy kind of smile. I'd never tell you when to smile, Abby, Jack said right back. Are we locking the barn door after it's burned to the ground? Colonel Cortez asked. She's still alive, Jack said. The barn ain't burned all that far down as I see it. Enough, boys, Chris cut in. Penny, do we have any idea who or why or what the target was? Sorry, Chris. All I've got is how and when, Penny said. The really fun stuff is still more guesswork than hard evidence. Try some of your guesses on me, Chris said. The bomb glass was on a table in the Peterwald area of the lounge. That hints at this being a Peterwald problem. But if it had gone off while the lounge was full, Jack started. There'd be a whole lot of us breathing space, Chris finished. No way we could have evacuated the lounge, Penny said. And with a lot of people in the way, the sealants would have had a lot more problems closing the holes than they did. Chris had a sudden picture of bodies and sealant half-blocking the holes in the hull. The lucky people had their legs out in space. The unlucky ones had their heads out there. It was not pretty. With a shiver, Chris turned to Abby. Okay, my favorite spy. What kind of threat picture were you able to put together? Me? I turned it over to Matahari and went to sleep. Matahari? Jack said. Yes. Nellie's been after me to use her computer more, to name her kid. And not turn her off, Nellie put in. So I named her Matahari and gave her the data dump I'd been ignoring. 
What'd you find, girl? It was very interesting, a dusky alto voice said from Abby's neckline. Apparently, the name change from Trixie to Matahari had included a number of changes in attitude. Matahari, the colonel said. Didn't she get shot? Yes, Abby agreed. But they issued the firing squad the blindfolds, not her. I've heard that story, Chris said. It isn't true, Matahari said. So what have you got for us? Chris asked. I am sorry to say it, but I think Abby was right to save her important time for other things, her computer said. There are a lot of interesting things going on in human space, but most of it is just dishing the dirt on this or that person. Abby grinned widely. Tell me some of it, Chris said. It's not like I'm pushed for time here. There is the matter of the recent remarriage of His Imperial Highness Henry I of Greenfeld. His bride was announcing her pregnancy almost immediately, and her insistence on carrying the baby in her own body. No tin can for our baby, as she put it. The court gossip has him eating out of her hand and checking in on her every five minutes. So much for big bad Harry, huh? Penny said. Tell her, Maddie, Abby said dryly. What I find interesting, the computer said as she went on, is that she is from the Hollenzoller family and major players in N.S. Holdings. And we took down their little slave empire at Port Royal, Chris said. Yes, there it is that, Maddie said. And that the lovely Imperial Empress has already had the baby tested. It's a boy. Oh, and it's definitely Harry's, Maddie added. I wonder how Vicky feels about this, Chris said. Do you think there are several reasons why she's taking this little vacation from court? Penny said. And as far away from court as she could get? The colonel offered. Not far enough, apparently, Jack concluded. So, one empty glass bomb, Chris said, takes care of one of those damn long knife troublemakers and clears the path to the throne for a poor kid that ain't even taken a suck of his mother's milk. If I was that kid, I'd have that milk tested for poison, Abby put in. I doubt if the milk has to be poisoned, the colonel said. It's likely poisoned direct from the source. That may not be all the answer as to who and why, Penny said, when the chuckles died down. Don't you just hate it when a good answer to our problem gets wet water thrown on it? Abby said dryly. Is there any other kind of water but wet? Maddie asked. It's a figure of human speech, child, Nellie said. You'll have to get used to such things, and you will if a certain human doesn't keep turning you off. Chris cleared her throat. I believe Penny has the floor. You were suggesting there was more to our problem than just what Abby and Matahari had turned up, I think. Yes. My forensic folks are puzzling over a bit of a problem. That olive detonator, or what is left of it, we lost a lot of it to space. But the damage control system kept enough of the detonator inside for us to discover a problem. It went off five minutes late. For which I am very happy, Chris said. No, I didn't say that right, Penny said. It wasn't that it was set for five minutes later. It was set to explode while the room was overflowing with officers in good cheer. It counted down to just that moment. Then... Instead of going boom, it waited for five minutes. Where'd that extra five minutes come from? Jack asked. We have no idea, Penny said. Could there have been a second detonator? One that responded to a remote detonation order? The colonel asked. We found no evidence of a second one, Penny said. It's not like we have a lot of bomb residue, 
but we found enough of the olive to know what it was and what it wasn't doing. We should have found enough of a remote detonator to know that it was there. That left the room in a puzzled silence. Chris spoke her thoughts as they came to her. What are the chances that the Hollenzoller family has its own set of opposition? Someone who bought a five-minute delay for their kaboom machine. Chris shook her head. That was just guesswork. Then she went on. Is there any idea who might have done this? Chris asked. Has anyone up and suddenly vanished? The wasp has no one missing, Penny said except for the poor fellow who went out the hole in the hall. He's been recovered. None of the other ships report anyone missing. It's not like we can do a lot of questioning aboard the other fleet's ships. So we are once again at a dead end, Chris said. There seems to be no lack of them in supply, Abby said. Chris, do you want to take a call from Phil Tausig? Nellie asked. Of course, How's it going, Phil? Likely better for me than it is for you, came from a smiling face, now featured on one of the tax center's wall screens. To what do I owe this early call? I'm ready to get out of here, princess, before anything more interesting happens around you. So soon? Chris said, and really meant it. I didn't have anything better to do with my night, he said with a chuckle. And opening more space between you and my vulnerable body seemed like a good idea. I've got the constant star ready to move out. Lieutenant Song has the Hermes equally ready to get underway. What about your heavy escorts? The terror and triumph took some encouragement, but I think that bomb got a lot of people interested in being anywhere else but at your side, dear lovely princess. So they're moving. Oh, I did kind of bribe them. I've shipped five of the bodies from the Constant to each of them. Any of the other wreckage? Chris asked, not sure how she was going to like his next answer. No, ma'am. No other pieces of the puzzle. As I see it, we're missing enough of that dang ship. No need to encourage chunks of it to go missing. Chris breathed a sigh of relief. Phil was good. Give him an order, and you didn't have to ask twice to see if it was well done. Very well, Commander. You are authorized to depart. When do you expect to be back? The young officer shrugged. Look for me when you see me coming. Most of the fleet will be here, waiting for you. Most of it? Tausig asked, though Chris could see the question in every eye around her tech center. I think it's time for the scouts to start scouting, Chris said. Have fun, Phil said and the screen went blank. There was a brief pause while everyone around Chris caught their breath. Then Jack asked, Just what do you have in mind? Chris had Nellie open a map of the local star systems on screen. The alien ship, of such shattered memory, might have come from somewhere around here, Chris said, pointing at the star map on the screen. We ought to do a recon of local space to see if there is anything to see. She let that sink in for a few seconds. The nice part about this is that we don't have to go blasting off into the jumps at high speed, spins, and accelerations. We can take the jumps at a slow pace. We can even use the boffin's latest toy to take a look before we leap. While the scouts do their snooping, we can leave the battleships swinging around themselves here. Who knows, maybe they'll find the mad bomber, or decide it's too boring and go home. That sounds like a plan, Jack agreed. A second thought crossed Chris's mind. Nellie, send to Pat Ron 10. While we're doing this walk around, have all ships set their reactors to produce as much antimatter as they can safely make. Antimatter powered the launches and auxiliary power units on the ships, it also could be used in some of the weapons on the corvettes. The Wasp had acquired eight high-acceleration, 12-inch torpedoes since her last yard period. Usually, they were loaded with high-explosives warheads. However, if you really wanted to make things go boom, an alternate antimatter warhead could replace the standard issue. That idea had come to several different people after the Battle of Wardhaven. 
Humanity had enjoyed a long peace. Some of her children were just starting to study war again. The 12-inch high-acceleration torpedoes were the first fruit of that attitude. Chris doubted they would be the last. You really want to go loaded for bear, Jack said. Maybe it will be unnecessary. Then again, it's nice to have a few extra aces up your sleeve if life doesn't come at you like you planned. Jack nodded, and Chris had Nellie call the admirals. She had a plan. Hopefully, they didn't have ones of their own. Chapter 17 Eight star systems in seven days. Eight times the wasp tiptoed up to a roiling tear in space and cautiously slipped a diminutive periscope through the jump point. It was all very careful, all very safe, and somehow Chris found it all very boring. The boffins were depressed and delighted, depressed because, try as they might, they could not broaden the instrumentation on the video view of the system before they jumped into it. All you got was a black and white picture, no color. To their delight, they had developed a second instrument. This tiny sensor gave them a full report on the electromagnetic spectrum. If there was radio or TV in use somewhere around the next sun, the wasp would know it before it jumped. Each sensor had to be sent through the jump one at a time. That was fine by Chris and Captain Drago. To the boffins, it was abject failure. While the scientists promised to do better, Chris stood by on the bridge as Captain Drago took the wasp safely into eight new systems. It was nice to enter eight new systems knowing that there wasn't a Nova on the other side, or a battle station waiting to gun you down. Eight systems in seven days, and not a nerve gone taut once. Of course, it was also eight systems in seven days, and nothing to show for it. Not a scrap of metal, not a hint of a passage— all the gas giants had a steady hold on their moons. All the rocky planets were rocky, dead, and silent. The boffins had gotten excited about one star. It was huge, weighing in at over 300 times the weight of Mother Earth's soul. And it put out enough radiation, visual and otherwise, to fry them if they got too close. Apparently, the Alien Three had made accommodations for that. Their jump was way out from the star— and the next jump was very close by. The scientists were quite upset with the star chart. If it had just told them the weight of this sun a couple of million years ago, they could have verified just how much the huge star had shed in the meantime. They seemed to hold Chris personally responsible for that failure of the chart her grandpa Ray found on Santa Maria. Chris didn't bother issuing an apology. So, after eight star systems and seven days... Chris sat quietly, enjoying a lone supper in the wardroom. She was dining alone because her staff had taken to avoiding her. She hadn't hunted any of them up to ask why, and no one had come close enough to Chris to let her pose the question. It was quiet and boring, and she was kind of enjoying it. Of course, it would be nice if Jack dropped by, even if it was to argue about something. No threats to her. No reason for Jack to argue with her. No Jack. Such was Chris's life. Judge Francine approached Chris with a dinner tray. May I join you? Immediately, Chris found herself doing an examination of her latest high crimes and misdemeanors. All she could think of were the usual mortal and venial sins. Of course, Chris managed to stammer, without sounding excessively guilty. The elderly lady had been a giant on the bench before she retired. In real life, settling herself across from Chris was a woman barely five feet tall. Still, she took her chair with all the gravity of a judge taking her place at the bench. Chris didn't need to ask Nellie about Justice Francine. In high school, she'd learned of the legendary Judge Francine. She'd spent most of her life on one high court or another. When the old jurist applied to join the boffin crew of the Wasp, Professor Mfumbo had been ready to reject her out of hand. Chris had stepped in personally to grant her a berth. Father always said that one of the few things about his job that made it worth having 
was being able to make a dream come true for someone who had done their part for the people. And that good deed had allowed Chris to draft the experienced jurist into helping her with a legal problem. Or twelve. Are you enjoying your stay on the Wasp? Chris asked. She didn't usually have to hunt for an icebreaker. Most everyone who approached her had a hidden agenda they couldn't wait to broach. Being the one tongue-tied was unusual for Chris. Matters are certainly better than they had been, the gray-haired woman answered darkly. Those cases you had me handling on Cascatos were nothing short of brutal. Those poor local jurists were totally unprepared to hear crimes of such depravity. Ah, yes, Chris said trying not to feel guilty for making the demands the situation had required. So much for breaking the ice. This last week, however, has been nothing short of magnificent, the judge said, as her old eyes filled with young wonder, and she settled a linen napkin in her lap. We have long had images of this end of the galaxy, but no observatory can hope to capture what we are seeing up close— that is well worth the price of admission for these old eyes. The judicial legend sampled her chicken pasta before she went on. The scientists in Boffin country are bubbling every morning with new discoveries, new conclusions, new ideas to test. I should think you must be bombarded with suggestions, nay, demands to change course and get closer to this or that phenomenon. Nellie fields them for me but it's nice to hear from someone who has an inkling of just what I'm having to wade through. And some respect, Nellie said. Chris takes me way too much for granted. I'm sure it must seem that way from your perspective, the judge said, clearly reserving judgment. The captain makes the final decision, Chris said. He has a very keen sense that the safety of the Wasp and its crew has first call on our course. Ah, yes, the safety of the ship and crew, Francine said, with a nuanced twist to the words. That is nice to know. For a while, they ate in silent companionship. So, Francine said, laying down her fork. How long are you going to continue putzing around and dodging your duty? Dodging my duty? Chris almost yelped in surprise. Young lady, I've sat on enough benches listening to lawyers lay out the history of how this or that crime came to be committed that these old eyes can't miss a crime in progress. Again, all Chris could do was echo. Crime in progress? Yes, young woman. We didn't come halfway around the galaxy to loaf around, dawdling from one star system to the next. You are avoiding your duty. You want to tell me what duty I'm avoiding? Chris asked. Everyone Chris had ever met either hated long knives or expected them to save their bacon. It wasn't unusual for people to hold both views. Apparently, legendary judicial minds were no different. No, young woman. I have no idea what you should be doing. I'm a judge. I look at what people have done and tell them if it is right or wrong, or more often legal or illegal. You're just dithering. Get off your duff and do something. So you can convict me. Or find you innocent. I'm sure some long knife in your long family history has been found innocent. Can't think of any cases at the moment, but there must have been one or two. I seem to recall that Grandpa Al had some very nasty things to say about your decision that corporations should no longer have the full status of people before the court. The gray-haired woman had the courtesy to chuckle at that. Yes, I can imagine that my name was taken in vain several times after that decision, she said. That doesn't matter in the present instant, however, and you know it. Yes, I do. Still, you must have some ideas about the matter I'm dithering over. Everywhere I go on this ship of late, people look right at me right through me, and don't say a word to me. The former jurist shook her head. The day after I retired from the bench, 
I rose early, as I usually do. But instead of going to my chambers, I took a walk in the park. It was a lovely spring day. I took a deep breath of fresh air, and it hit me. Someone else would have to make the hard choices. I could watch the news and get just as mad as anyone else at the boneheaded things people did to each other. Nobody would ever again come to me years later and ask me to decide who was right and who was in the wrong. It felt so wonderful to feel again. I hadn't done it in years. Wonderful feeling. Sorry, young lady. I am retired, and I do not have to make the hard decisions anymore. With luck, you might make it to retirement someday. May your first breath of fresh, free air be as sweet as mine was. Until then, back to the salt mines, princess. With that, the amateur astronomer picked up her fork and continued her dinner in silence. After a moment or two of reflection, Chris found that she was no longer hungry and left the table. It took her a few minutes longer to decide who she wanted to talk to. It took Nellie very little time to collect Jack and Ron the Aitichi in her tax center. I just had the strangest supper partner, Chris told them, then filled them in on Judge Francine's thoughts. Jack greeted the story with a chuckle. The word on the law enforcement circuit was that no lawyer wanted to present before her. Didn't matter whether they were prosecuting or defending. She was not the judge they wanted to be in front of. I think I can understand their attitude now, Chris said. Ron was standing rather still through this. You do have judges in the Empire, don't you? We have judges. People might bring what I think you call criminal and civil cases before them. I do not understand this case brought against him whom you call your grandfather Al. The law means what the emperor says it means. How could a judge know the heart of the emperor? I don't think we should go there tonight, Chris said. Nellie, get Captain Drago on the line. Got him, Nellie said. You have a question, princess? Yes, Captain. I understand we've done a lot of wondrous stargazing this last week, but haven't found anything relating to aliens. That is correct, Your Highness. Any hints that we might? My best guess is that we could keep this up until the cows come home, and all we'd have to show for it is a lot of cow manure. I was kind of expecting that answer, Captain. Would you stand by for a few minutes? I think I'll have fresh orders for you. I'm glad to hear you've had enough of this messing around. Thank you for your opinion, Captain, Chris said and cut the link. Chris turned to the two people whose opinion she most valued on the matter at hand. So, what do you think we do now? This is a waste of time, Jack said. That alien ship could have come from here, but it could just as easily have come from a thousand light years from where we found it. Heaven knows, if it was them gazing at our entrails and searching for our base, they wouldn't be finding anything of interest in these systems. Thank you, Jack. Ron, what does the Aitichi Empire have to say? Very little. I am just along for the ride. Is that the way you say it? Yes. But you're here for some reason? But you are halfway around the galaxy from that reason. Our ships are not disappearing here. We are going to get there. I'm just taking the indirect approach. Very indirect, the Aitichi agreed. So it is agreed that we should get ourselves closer to where we might find some hostile aliens, Chris said. If we're hunting hostiles, Jack said, it seems only natural to get closer to where they found us before. Nellie, have Captain Drago set a course to return us to where we parked the battleships. Also, have him send the message Z to those squadrons. It's done, Chris. Good. It's ice cream Sunday night in the wardroom. Jack, would you like one? Don't mind if I do. Chapter 18 
The letter Z was part of a small code sheet that Nellie and Chris had developed before leaving the battle squadrons. In that code, the single letter Z told the recipient quite a bit. We have found nothing. We are returning to base. Recall the other scouts. As a code went, it was simple, brief, and unbreakable. For the jaunt around the local systems, Chris had amended her policy not to leave any traces of their passage. Each scout had left buoys at the jump points they went through. They were tiny devices, just radio relays and maneuvering jets. If a bug-eyed monster chanced across one of these breadcrumbs, it might lead them to a scout ship or the battleships. It could not lead them to human space. Now the wasp collected those she'd dropped as she retraced her track. On the second day, while crossing a system, a buoy popped through the jump point ahead and transmitted the single letter Q. Thus was Chris informed that the other scouts were returning. Forewarned, Chris didn't expect any surprises waiting for her at the battleships, as the next few days and familiar systems passed quickly. Of course, Chris was wrong. A simple code could only carry the messages that were pre-planned for it. For example, I love you had not been included as an option in the code. Similarly, we've all voted to go home, and we expect you to come along peacefully with us, was also not available. Yet that was the first thing Admiral Kratz announced to Chris when she jumped back into the system that had caused them so much trouble. The Greenfeld Admiral had set the situation up to present his case as forcefully as possible. He had the other admirals on net with him. Upon first seeing them, Chris had not offered to have them come aboard the Wasp. None had suggested that they gather on one of their ships. Apparently, the last blowout on the Wasp had ended any party inclinations among the gathered fleet. Isn't the net wonderful? Chris listened as Admiral Kratz made his case. The other admirals nodded along. The argument boiled down to a few simple points— Things have changed since we left human space. The present situation is not what was intended when our government sent us. We must return to our capitals and receive new orders. Chris nodded. If you feel that way, then I suppose you must return. My government's orders, however, give me full authority to conduct a reconnaissance. Actually, Chris didn't have any written orders— Never had a collection of Navy ships gotten underway with less paperwork to back them up. Once this voyage was over, the Judge Francines of the world would have a field day for years to come. But, until Chris docked her squadron once more at High Wardhaven, what Pat Ronten did was pretty much up to Chris. We're going back, Admiral Channing said. Certainly, your small ships can't go on with no backup. Admiral... Before you arrived at Wardhaven, my intent was to sail my small ships with no backup. You might not have noticed, but the only U.S. ships here are scouts. How could we help but notice? Admiral Kratz grumbled. You have your orders, I have mine. My squadron sails on, Chris said with finality, and had Nellie cut the link. Vicky is on the line. Do you want to talk to her? Nellie asked next. Put her through. But if all she does is try to talk me into following her admiral, we might have communication difficulty. Hi, Chris, Vicky said. You find anything interesting? My astronomers are in ecstasy, but of bug-eyed monsters, not so much as a hare. How have things been here? Vicky snorted. A lot of scared people telling each other how scared they are and how much more scared they ought to be. Really? Well, in the senior wardrooms, that's all I hear. Among the junior officers and the younger enlisted ranks, I think there's a lot more excitement. Then again, being the Grand Duchess, they might just be telling me what they think I want to hear. There is that problem. Have there been any more bombs going off? None since you left, but... Then, we've been taking serious precautions. I think the bomber might have slipped aboard the Terror and beat it for home. Is that just a guess, or is there any meat on that bone? Chris asked, before Jack and Penny climbed all over her to get to the comlink. We did find a problem. 
I don't like the fact that our security still hasn't gotten to the bottom of it, but there appear to have been six or seven people aboard the ships of Batron 12 who were never here. Never here? Chris said. Someone was here, using any of the six sets of papers whenever it served his purpose. None of those people has been sighted since that bomb went off on the Wasp, so we're thinking your Commander Tausig wasn't the only one who was in a hurry to shove off for Santa Maria. Chris glanced at Jack. He and Penny were using their new computers to go down the list of the Wasp's crew. From the looks of it, they'd be busy for a while. Have you heard about Admiral Kratz's wanting everyone to go home? Chris asked. Yeah, it took him quite a while to get the other two admirals to agree to that unanimous decision. Admiral Kota really doesn't want to leave. He didn't have anything to say when Kratz told me they were going home, and they expected me to follow along behind them like a lonely puppy. I told them you wouldn't call it quits. Chris, could I ask a favor? Chris had a strong hunch she knew where this was going. You can ask. I can't promise that I'll do it. If Admiral Kratz bugs out, can I stay with you on the Wasp? Jack's head came up so fast from what he was looking at that Chris hoped he didn't suffer whiplash or brain damage. He was shaking his head a mile a minute. Chris gave him a smile, one with plenty of teeth. Vicky, I'll have to think about that. You know how risky what we're doing is. If I got you killed... Chris left that thought hanging in the air. Chris, you know my dad has a new wife, and I'm going to have a new brother. I figure that bomb was from her family and meant for me. It's been fun while it lasted, being the main heir to the Peterwald Empire, but let's face it. I'd be safer chasing after a bug-eyed monster to put my head in its mouth than I'm going to be back home. Vicky, I really have to think about this. I don't see anyone going anywhere real soon. We've got time to decide this. Okay, Vicky said. But you will get back to me. You promise. I promise, Chris said. Vicky cut the comm link at that, saving Chris from having to do it herself. Chris, you have another call coming in, Nellie said. Good Lord, I was never this popular in high school, Chris sighed. Who is it this time? Commander Phil Tausig, Nellie announced. The Hermes just jumped back into the system. Oh, and there are two. No, three. Make that four big freighters following the courier ship. Oh, and the two battleships are also back. Put him through, Chris said. The screen filled with the happy face of one handsome young Navy officer. Hello, Commodore. I bring greetings and gifts from your grandpa, our king. Does he know about the situation we have here? Uh, no. They're way behind the information cycle, the commander said with a large grin. The local government on Santa Maria was none too happy with the gift you sent them. They passed a resolution that I should tell you to come back. And they sent off a fast courier to Wardhaven to get the king to support them. And, Chris said, when her subordinate wasn't immediately forthcoming with what happened next. These supply ships were already in orbit, with orders to join you at the earliest opportunity. So... Being a harebrained young officer with way too much initiative, I grabbed them and ran. I think I'm glad to see you, Chris said. Oh, you're glad to see me. You don't know how glad you are to see me. Tell me why I am more glad to see you than I realize, Chris said cautiously. Did you recently broach the subject with your grandpa as to why the Aitichi War was not fought with nukes? I did. Why? Because three of these merchant ships following me have marine guards locking down a special weapons magazine. Nukes? Chris said. Nope. Something better. You know what a neutron star is, don't you? I think so, Chris said. 
Well, your grandpa, our king, has sent you a couple of neutron torpedoes. What? I'll explain it when I can report to the wasp. Better yet, I'll bring along a scientist who can explain it all better than I can. I hope you will, Chris said. Chapter 19 Chris didn't invite the admirals over, but their barges showed up right behind the gig that brought Commander Tausig aboard the Wasp. She invited Tausig and the woman who accompanied him to her tax center and had the admirals directed toward the refurbished forward lounge. Is anyone refusing to go to the lounge? Chris asked Nellie. No, but they brought a lot fewer people, and all three of them have their own security details. They're patting down each other and doing a first-class security sweep of the place. Chris could only chuckle at the visual that brought to mind. Have Gunny Brown post a security detail at the hatch of the forward lounge. Also have Chief Benny join them and do a security sweep to his own high standards, she told Nellie, as Jack looked on approvingly. I already suggested that to the chief. He likes to have a drink or two in the lounge after work. He wasn't very happy while it was out of commission. He's already got three senior marines helping him make sure their watering hole does not end up in the body and fender shop again. Good, Chris said, with the first real laugh she'd had in a long while. Chris found her usual team had filed into her tax center as she and Nellie talked. It was not unusual for Professor Mfumbo to absent himself half the time when she called. Science has its own schedule, he was quick to point out. Today he sat eagerly in his place at the foot of the table. Captain Drago was also there. Chris let everyone settle in, then asked, So, what is this gift my great-grandfather has sent our way? A neutron torpedo? I'll leave it to the doctor to explain the contraption, Lieutenant Commander Phil Tausick said. All your grandfather asks is that you not start a war with the dang contraption if she could avoid it. His words, not mine. It is not a dang contraption, the young woman said, standing. I am Nikki Mulroney. Some of you might have heard the story of my grandmother, your highness. She found the vanishing box on Santa Maria that your great-grandfather, King Raymond, used in the war between humanity and the control computer there, 80 years ago. So it really happened, Penny said. Oh, yes. It has been allowed to become little more than a legend, but my grandmother pointed the box at mountains and made them vanish. And you have the vanishing box working again? Chris said. That the box existed might or might not be a legend. Every story agreed that the power supply had been exhausted in the final battle with the rampaging rogue computer. Ah, uh, no, we do not have the vanishing box working, the scientist said. She licked her lips before going on. We do have something working that might be something like that instrument. How something like it, Chris asked. And how many bushes are we going to beat around to get a straight, non-scientific answer out of you? We cannot make matter vanish. However, we can manipulate matter at an ever-increasing distance. Which told Chris everything, and nothing, all at the same time. What kind of matter can you manipulate? Penny asked, before Chris could say something like it. Initially... All we could lift was a feather. Excuse me if I say that's not all that exciting, Jack said. What can you lift now? Only a few cubic millimeters. That doesn't seem like much, Chris said. You are correct, the scientist agreed with precision. However, there was a second project being funded on Santa Maria. It involved a nearby neutron star. When we used the one project to see what we could do with the other one, we got surprising results. We succeeded in chipping a half cubic millimeter off the surface of that neutron star. 
Half a cubic millimeter, Chris finally said, when no one else would risk saying anything. Close to 150 tons of matter went flying off into space, the boffin said. That got a low whistle from the audience. What happened to it? Professor Mfumbo asked. How did being free of the gravitational pull of the neutron star impact that mass? It departed at nearly a third the speed of light. When it hit a cinder of a planet destroyed when the star went nova, it made quite an impact. That got low whistles from Jack and the colonel. Half a millimeter was tiny. At one-third the speed of light, even something that small was bound to leave a mark. No, I mean, did the matter... No. Professor Mfumbo sputtered to a halt. Chris had never seen him at such a loss for words. He took two breaths and started again. What was it made of? The professor said slowly. Ions and electrons. The newly arrived, self-proclaimed weapons expert answered quickly and simply. He nodded. Okay. Did this half-cubic millimeter of ions and electrons expand once it was free of that gravity well? No, the woman said. As best as our instrumentation could tell, it departed the star in a compact half-millimeter bullet, and it was the same size ten minutes later when it impacted the planet. Have you run further tests? Chris asked. She had finally gotten what Professor Mfumbo was getting at. The neutron star's gravity crammed down the ions and electrons on its surface until there was really no space between them. That made for quite a dense solid. What happened to that matter after the heavy impact of the gravity was removed was a very good question. At three, Chris had once lifted a pound of dried apricots from the kitchen at Newhouse. She'd split them with several friends. They scarfed them down with no trouble. But in their little stomachs, they soaked up liquids. Suddenly, they needed much more space, and the only way to get it was up and out. Chris and her little friends had spent a miserable night giving back the apricots she'd stolen. The idea of a warhead that suddenly needed a lot more room struck her with more than the usual appalling force. The weapons developer gave the head of Chris's boffins an acid look. Sir, that question did not escape our concern. We have instrumentation maintaining constant observations of all extracted neutron material. We have identified no expansion. This includes the instruments observing the warheads on the torpedoes aboard each of the three transports that came out with me. Three transports? How many torpedoes did you bring? Chris asked. Three. Chris considered that for a moment, then went on. I know I shouldn't ask this, but how big are these torpedoes? Each of the warheads contains approximately 2.5 cubic millimeters of neutron star material, the scientist said. Say about 15,000 tons of mass per weapon. Several people in the room whistled at that. Chris held up her hand, two fingers a few millimeters apart. Fifteen thousand tons in that tiny space? Actually, we've spun it out into a concave lens, 66 centimeters in diameter. That's the same size as the torpedo. We think that might have the effect of reflecting back any lasers fired at it. We didn't have time to test that hypothesis before we were ordered to pack up our test items and get them out here, to you. Fifteen thousand tons in anything like that smallest space. The thought boggled Chris's mind. Her mind was getting way too familiar with the boggles. Pardon me, Penny said. But if you've got this wonderful device that can reach down into this huge gravity well around a neutron star and pinch out a BB gun-sized chunk with 15,000 tons of mass. What am I missing? Why don't you have that doohickey out here? Think of what that can do. Yes, Dr. Malroney said, 
stuffing her hands into the pockets of her coat. I do imagine the primary device has significant military possibilities. However, it takes a large asteroid to hold it and requires the power plants of several large cities to power it. Mobility it ain't got, Abby said. The room took a minute to absorb that. Let's talk about that torpedo, Captain Drago said. With a 15,000-ton warhead, just how fast can you get it going? The torpedo's propulsion machinery is simplicity itself, the woman boffin said. Reaction mass heated with antimatter. We store the antimatter separate from the torpedo and only load it just before we launch. The containment field is of light construction. It will hold long enough to get the job done, say ten minutes to an hour. How fast can you get the torpedo going? The captain said, cutting in. Two seconds after launch, it will be accelerating at 10 Gs, the woman scientist said. Our initial reaction mass is water, but that's just intended to get the rocket motors started and the torpedo away from the ship that launched it. After that, we're using iron filings for the reaction mass. Iron and antimatter plasma has a very high specific impulse. Chris swallowed. I imagine it does. How many of these infernal machines did you bring out again? Captain Drago asked. Three. We have four scout corvettes here, Chris pointed out. Actually, I think your grandfather, our king, knew what he was doing, said Captain Drago. The wasp is already some 20,000 tons heavier than the other three scouts. That's the price we pay to carry the extra marines and boffins and their gear. I'm not sure how the wasp would take to another... What? How large do these torpedoes mass out? They come in at 18,000 tons, warhead, fuel, and engines, Commander Tausik put in. So you've given this problem some thought, Captain Drago said. Quite a bit on the way out. Phil tapped his wrist unit, and a schematic of the Hornet appeared on one of Chris's walls. We'll have to lock one of these puppies down right at the ship's center of gravity. Otherwise, you put momentum on the boat, and it's going to go in all kinds of directions. One thing I've liked about the Hornet is how nimble she is. If we don't do this right, they'll all wallow like pigs. I'll thank you not to refer to my wasp as a pig, Captain Drago said. At that, the two ship drivers dropped out of the English language for the next several minutes, losing themselves in technical talk. It was interesting to Chris to see both Professor Mfumbo and Dr. Mulroney left to stare dumbly as the conversation went over their heads. Chris relaxed and enjoyed it. At her father's knee, she'd gotten comfortable with people knowing more than she did about this or that technical specialization. As the great Billy Longknife said, you didn't have to know how to make it happen, just who and when. He was also quick to point out that his military was a spear. He decided who to point at and when and where to stick them. Chris let that thought roll around her skull for a few minutes, while the two ship captains kept everyone else entertained. When they paused for breath, Chris raised her hand for silence. It came quickly. Pardon me, Chris said. But did I miss something? That brought her blank stares. As I recall, our mission was something like, we come, we see, we run real fast home and report. Wasn't that in all the papers? Chris asked. I seem to remember hearing that rumor from someone who thought she was running the show, Abby drawled. Around the table, all she got was sober looks. If that's the mission... How come Grandpa just sent me three of the most jihugical and nasty weapons in human history? Chris let the question hang there. She had no intention of being the first to take a crack at an answer. When the silence stretched, Colonel Cortez pursed his lips and ventured slowly. Your great-grandfather, our king, 
has spent some time on the tip of the spear, your highness. I trust he's developed some seriously reliable gut instincts. Or he'd be dead by now, even if he did only half of what they say he did. He paused, pulled the room with his eyes, and went on. The seriously nasty behavior of the one ship we encountered might have seriously bothered him. Commander, I understand that these weapons came with an injunction not to start a war. If she could avoid it. Something like that. I've got the message here if you want to read it. He tapped his wrist unit, and Nellie projected a picture of the transmittal form. It was like any other supply chit, except at the bottom, in his own hand, the king had handwritten the injunction, Try not to start a war with these. Chris glanced around the room, suspecting what everyone else was thinking, but no one wanted to say. King Ray was handing Chris a loaded gun, then resorting to the most crass of bureaucratic techniques by adding a not order to cover his ass. Chris scowled as the poisoned silence grew long. Then, with a shake of her head, she went back to the practical problems at hand. I take it from what you two captains were saying. We're going to need to stay put for a long while to make all of this happen. Actually not, Captain Drago said. It's a pretty standard set of mods that we'll have to make to the Hornet Fearless and Intrepid, Phil said. The Vulcan has the machine shops and gear to make the bomb harnesses. Once their specialists take the measurements off each of the ships, our scouts can go about their business. A couple of weeks later, we can get the installation done in no time at all. You weren't planning on our hanging around here for all that time, were you, Princess? No, Chris said, mentally taking the bull she wanted to by the horns and ignoring the stampeding elephant in the room. Professor Mfumbo, I need your astronomers and astrophysicists to earn their keep. I know they've enjoyed stargazing. Now I need them to help us plot a course that's both fast and safe. Four courses. Chris paused to let the full impact hit all present. With their focused attention, she went on. I want each of the four corvettes to make its own fast, long-range reconnaissance swing. Five planets out, four different planets back, if we can manage it. One jump from here, the Wasp came across a system with six jumps. Let's move the fleet there. At least as many as will follow us. We can leave the battleship swinging around there while the scouts take a gander at what things look like three to five thousand light years from here along a wide search pattern. That got a few low whistles. You're not going for halfway measures, Jack said. Someone asked me why we were out here, and I was dithering. The admirals want to pull up their skirts and run for home. Now Grandpa has sent me the best three weapons in his quiver, with the hope I won't use them. I admit the idea of running into something that drains gas giants for its reaction fuel took some of the wind out of my sails for a while. But running home with nothing more to report than what we've seen? No, that's not why I came out here. I'm not sure how I feel about Grandpa's latest contribution to our mission, any more than I was all that excited about the big old battle wagons everyone else thought to send along with us. What I do know is that we came out here to see. So let's go see what there is to see. Chris paused. Faces that had been locked down, lit up with smiles. Clearly, she'd just given them the pep talk they wanted to hear. She knew she should leave it at that, but being a long knife, she let her mouth add one more thought. And while we're zooming from star to star, we can set our reactors to capturing all the antimatter we put out. Then, if we find we need it, we will have it. Jack snorted, spoken like a true long knife. Chris gave him the best shrug she could manage, then flipped her face into a smile. Shall we now go see what our friends in the forward lounge have to say about where they're going? Chapter 20 There were no surprises in the forward lounge. 
Admiral Kratz was waiting for her like a panicked nanny, eager to tell his young charge the error of her ways. Chris took a deep breath as the words washed over her. The ship's repair crews had done their usual efficient job. There was no evidence of the explosion except for the smell of fresh paint. Admiral Kratz's verbal assault began the moment Chris walked in the door. He didn't even take a deep breath before launching into the topic at hand. The admirals had voted, and all three were for going home. Chris must follow their lead. Chris waited patiently and respectfully until he ran down, not something that happened quickly. Nobody reached his level of power without developing a great love for his own voice. Once Chris got a word in, she explained that she had no intention of going back. In fact, she had just decided to expand her scouting mission. Even as I speak, my boffins are looking for low-risk solar systems so the four scouts can do a high-speed recon. Admiral Kratz shook his head and pointed out that the vote was three to one to go home. Being a reasonable person, she should conform to the majority. Chris admitted that their opinions were all valid. However, no one had ever accused a long knife of being reasonable. As a fine point, she was not in their chain of command. Therefore, their opinions, right or wrong, had no impact on her actions. Much discussion followed, with a plenitude of references to those damn long knives and getting us all killed. In the end, in an effort to present a unanimous front to exactly whom it was not clear, they all voted to follow Chris. Chris then told them that she had found a solar system with six jump points that was only one easy jump from where they were at the moment. She suggested that the entire fleet move there. The battleships could wait there, while the scouts each took a different jump out as the first of their long-range scouting missions. Admiral Kratz demanded that they leave behind a small, silent jump buoy in this system, so that anyone who came looking for them would know where they were. Since Chris figured she could get her scouts away before any courier ship got here from human space with orders she didn't want to read, she agreed. Six hours later, the fleet of reluctant discovery accelerated toward the one jump it had agreed to make. Construction personnel from the Vulcan were aboard the scouts as they did their jumps, measuring them for the new weapon. The time was well spent. Once in the new base system, the courier ships broke out their balutes and quickly topped off the scouts' supplies of reaction mass from a nearby gas giant. While they went about a second session of cloud dancing for the battleships, Chris got Pat Ron 10 moving toward their separate jumps. All were making 50,000 kilometers per hour as they hit the jump with three Gs kicked in at the last moment and 20 RPMs on the hull. As expected, the Wasp jumped over 700 light years into a system centered on an old red dwarf. There were no gas giants around the star only dead, airless rocks. The wasp headed for the farther of the two other jumps in the system. The closest one might be safe, but it led to a large white sun that might or might not have gone nova in the 700 years it took the light to get from there to here. The next jump found them in a twin system. A warm orange star had somehow managed to pick up a neutron star in a wide elliptical orbit. The Wasp analyzed the double star system as they crossed to the next jump. Neither Chief Benny nor the Boffins reported anything of interest. They departed that system twelve hours after they entered it, with much data, but no hint that they shared this galaxy with life, benign or otherwise. The third jump yielded an unexpected surprise. They found themselves popping into a system with a huge blue giant. That's not supposed to be there, Captain Drago said. What are we doing in a system with a potential giant nova? A call to Boffin country brought a blended flood of both surprise and apologies. That was not on the map Ray Longknife discovered on Santa Maria. We'd never tell you to jump to a blue giant. And lastly, did you do the jump right? The navigator, Sulwyn Khan, was adamant that the wasp had taken the jump exactly the way it had taken all others. 
Chris interrupted the various parties in full defensive mode to slip a question in sideways. Folks, is there any chance that big blue hot thing in the sky might go Nova on us while we're debating how we got here? That brought a pause. It grew, but before anyone got to full panic, Professor Mfumbo's calm bass voice boomed over the net. No chance of that, your highness. This particular solar time bomb has a lot of ticking to do. How far did we come? Chris asked next. That question also took a while to answer. After several minutes of pregnant absence, Professor Mfumbo came back on net. This jump also took us over 700 light years. By our best estimates, we are now over 2,200 light years from where we started. Thank you, Captain Drago said. That's nice to know. So saying, he slipped out of his command chair and came to stand beside Chris's offensive weapon station. With his hand over his mouth, he said softly, Those strange new jumps we've been talking about. You mean the fuzzy ones? Chris asked. Whatever you call them. Is there any chance this was one of them? One of the new ones that wasn't on the Santa Maria map your great-grandfather stumbled upon? Nelly? No chance, Captain. That was a standard old-fashioned jump. But it didn't take us where Ray's map said it would. No, Captain, Nelly said firmly. I've done a double check. We are not in the system Ray's map says we should be in. I don't know how or why. I just know that we are where we are, sir. Any suggestion how that might have happened? The captain asked. None that I want to speculate on, Chris said. Humans had been studying the jump points for nearly 400 years. So far, they were as much a mystery as they had been the first time three ships from Earth attempted the one jump point they had discovered orbiting out around Jupiter. The thought that who or whatever was out here had mastered the ability to either make new ones or redirect the old ones was a terror Chris really didn't want to give voice to. Certainly not until she and Professor Mfumbo had spent a lot of brain sweat on it. I don't like this one bit, the captain said, letting a momentary scowl cross his face. He was his usually intent but neutral self by the time he turned back to his chair. Has anyone found us some jump points? he demanded. One, sir, Selwyn reported. Only one, the captain asked. There should have been three. One, sir. It's within nine hours of here, if we go at 2G. The captain glanced back at Chris. She gave him a slight nod. Make it so, Nav. Nine hours later, they crossed from one surprising star system to an even more troubling one. Chapter 21 That wasn't what I expected, Captain Drago said softly, as the forward screen filled with four stars. If a star mariner was a poet, this would be the star system for him or her. Four stars, red, blue, yellow, and white, hung in the sky. It took the boffins ten minutes to figure out the dance they did. The yellow and red ones swung around each other. The white and blue ones did the same. Somehow the two pairs then did a jig around the center of gravity among the four. Since the blue and white pair greatly outweighed the other two, it must get very interesting. If they had still been on the course they'd plotted initially for the jaunt, they should have been staring at a single white dwarf, sister to humanity's home star, Sol. Clearly we aren't in Kansas anymore, Toto, Chris thought to herself. Talk to me, folks, the captain said softly. Tell me about this system. One thing Chris had come to count on from Captain Drago was a cool head when all hell broke loose. His voice was calm, but under it was clear agitation. Agitation in a tight grip. There are planets around the stars, Chief Benny said from his station at sensors. 
some small rocks orbiting each pair. He paused, then went on. A couple of more rocky planets orbiting the four of them. Jump points. Do we have any jump points? Captain Drago demanded. The white dwarf they were supposed to have jumped to should have had three. None that I've found so far, Sulwyn Khan said. There are a couple of large gas giants well away from the stars. They could be concealing a jump point. One or two might be playing hide-and-seek with us down close to the suns. Captain, I'll need a couple of hours before I can make a definitive statement, but for now, no, sir. There is no visible way out of this system other than the way we came in. The captain leaned back in his chair, probably thinking the same thing Chris was. It wasn't unheard of for there to be only one jump into a system. Earth herself had been at a dead end. Certainly, the wild dance these four sons did would make for a berserk jig for any jump point caught among them, even before you added in other star systems to the confusion. But there was no way this system could have been patched together in just two million years from the simple one-star system on the map Ray Longknife had discovered. Selwyn, keep one G on the ship. He paused for a moment. That G would give the crew weight. Still, the navigator needed a course. Aim us in the general direction of the nearest gas giant. If we have to turn around and head back, that will help. Aye, aye, sir, Selwyn said. Chief Benny, Professor Mfumbo, Chris said. It sure would be nice to know something about this system. There is no activity on the radio spectrum, the chief said immediately. A bit later, the professor added, The second planet out from the yellow and red suns appears to have an atmosphere and water. I have no idea how much solar energy it gets during the course of a year, but the water is in liquid form at present. Is that interesting enough for us to change our course and head in that direction? The captain asked. I don't know, the professor said. I think I do, Chief Benny said, looking up from his board. Your Highness, I'm getting something that I've never seen before. Spit it out, Chief. That planet has a high radioactive background. It's hot all over, but certain spots are a whole lot hotter. He paused for a long moment. Ma'am, this isn't in any of our training, but... If I had to guess what a planet looked like after it was bombarded with nukes, I'd say that it should look a lot like this. Sulwyn, change course for that planet. Aye, aye, Captain. How long to make orbit? The navigator studied her board, tapped it several times. Eighteen hours if we go to 1.73 Gs, Captain. Make it so, the captain said. All hands, we will be going to 1.73 Gs in ten seconds. Prepare for moderate Gs, the navigator announced. A quick countdown later, the ship put on acceleration. Chris found her weight going up, but not more than she could handle. Chief, Professor, Chris said. I'd like to know a whole lot more about this system before we make orbit around that hot rock. I can think of at least one thing you might like to know in advance, the professor announced on net. What would that be? Chris hated it when people played 20 questions with her. Didn't anyone spit anything out? We are concentrating most of our sensors on the hot rock, as you call it. However, we are looking at that large gas giant, your highness. It is too soon to tell for sure, but the moons around that planet appear to be in unstable orbits. We may have another gas giant that has recently lost a lot of weight. You think so? Was all Chris managed to get out. It is too early to be sure, but it's possible, ma'am. We'll know more in a few hours. Chris shared a glance with Captain Drago. It never rained, but it poured. Chief, I really need to know, the captain said with an admirable calm. Are there any ships in this system? I'm not getting any signatures from any fusion engines, from any reactors of any kind that are in my databases. We may not be looking for any that we're familiar with, Chief, 
Captain Drago said. I know that, sir, Chief Benny said. I'm as scared as you are, sir, to have a planet that's hot on the atomic scale. Probably more so. I'm bypassing my filters and taking the raw feed from the sensors. Still, sir, I'm getting a whole lot of nothing. I don't have anything giving off an electromagnetic signature, anything making noise like a nuclear or fusion reactor. Trust me, sir, I have no desire to get popped by whatever this bug-eyed monster is that the princess here is chasing. I intend to die in bed. You and me both, Captain Drago said and pushed the comm link on his command station. All hands, this is the captain speaking. We have an unknown situation developing here. Look smart. I may be ordering you to battle stations with very little notice. Keep that in mind as you go about your duties. Be assured that as soon as I know something, I will pass it along to you. Captain out. Finished, he turned to Chris. Okay, princess. We've been lugging around those boffins for you. Would you please see that they earn their pay today? Yes, sir, Chris said. Nelly, have my staff report to my tax center. Advise Chief Benny and Professor Mfumbo that they may report or stay at their stations, depending on where they think they can be the most productive. Doing it, Chris. Oh, and Nelly, have Cookie bring around some lunch to my tax center. I'm past hungry. I already advised him. He said to tell you that he don't do 1.7 Gs all that well, but he'll have one of the youngsters get your lunch. Thank the cook for me, Chris said, and heaved herself to her feet. Her knee complained of the extra weight, the one that had taken the brunt of that last nearly successful assassination attempt. She walked carefully from the bridge, it wouldn't do to have herself laid up in sick bay, just when things were starting to get interesting. Chapter 22 As the hours passed, the picture grew more grim. The gas giant had indeed recently lost a lot of weight, say 10%, say in the last 200 years. Chief Benny chose to keep his eyes on his board, regularly having da Vinci dig down with him, beyond the standard human-computer interface, to make sense of the raw feed coming in from the antennas. The one bit of good news was that no reactors showed up anywhere in the system. The bad news was that no other jump point was identified either. Chris interrupted the chief's work once for a question. When that alien ship came charging off that moon, intent on killing us all, you said your sensors couldn't get anything off the ship. Are you sure that your sensors can pick up anything off these aliens? Ma'am, there is a difference between something being a big black hole of nothing in space and it being a charging bull of a ship that is doing its best to keep me from digging out interesting intel on it. Yes, they were masking a lot of what was going on inside their boat. But there was no question in any of our minds that there was a big houseboat down there powered by a reactor of unknown design. I could also tell you it had lasers and was shooting at us. Don't worry, ma'am. I may not be able to give you a readout of their captain's battle board on one of these alien starships, but you can bet your last dollar that I'll be able to tell you that they are there. That's good to hear, Chris said. Both the chief and the professor chose to stay at their posts. Chris's main staff reported to the tax center. Jack walked in, followed by a high G station, which, now that Chris had been introduced to one, looked very much like a wheelchair. I don't need a wheelchair, Chris snapped. It's not a wheelchair, Jack shot back. It's a high G station. I don't need a high G station. We aren't even making two Gs. It will support your knee. Chris, you don't want to twist that knee and end up back in sick bay. You're sounding more like a mother hen than a security chief. I'll cluck, cluck as much as I have to, if it keeps you from doing something stupid, Jack said doggedly. Humor him, Chris, Abby said. I do not need a high G station, thank you very much. 
The station maneuvered itself up next to Chris's elbow and showed no evidence of going away. You are a stubborn old pig, Chris said. Oink, cluck, oink, cluck, was all Jack said. Chris switched from chair to station. The staff gave Jack, or Chris, it was hard to tell, a ragged round of applause. Jack took the bow, one of his silly grins all over his face. Chris spread her hands like a reigning monarch and took a bit of a bow herself. Now, can we get down to business, she said. Though once she was seated in the high G station, Chris did find that she was a lot more comfortable than she'd been in her usual chair. The station gave her bum knee support the chair didn't. The hint that she might not be as young as she used to be was painful to contemplate. Before the team finished their light lunch, Chris wrapped the table for their attention. What does a planet look like that has been nuked from space, she asked. And can we tell the difference between that and a planet that just got nuked in the course of its own folks being disagreeable to each other? Colonel Cortez cleared his throat. One of the few agonies we humans have spared the human race is that of global nuclear war. Simply put, I don't think there's any way to tell at a distance whether the nuclear bombs came from some alien in orbit or from your neighbor's bombers and rockets from across the way, so to speak. You're no help. It sounds like you're saying all we can do is guess. Chris said. And very glad I am that there is insufficient data to go on, so that we must guess, the colonel said, showing no shame. As it turned out, the closer they got to the planet, the less they needed to guess. We've identified at least 26 nuclear strikes, the chief said. That number may be low. Some targets might have taken several hits, and what we're identifying as a single strike maybe two or three hits that have run together over time. Later, Chief Benny expanded on that. Chris, I've got what look like cities. Dead cities. Besides the two dozen or so that are radioactive hot, there are a whole lot more that seem to have taken very large hits that gutted their centers. What kind of hits? It's hard to tell, but from the craters... I'd say that someone threw some pretty big rocks at them at awfully high speeds. The colonel leaned forward. Any chance, chief, that these are natural meteorite strikes? Sir, as I said, these are smack dab in the middle of what look to be major urban centers. Somebody built them and somebody knocked them down. Big rocks came in fast and hit right in the bullseye of the town. Once, maybe twice possible. But da Vinci and I are past a thousand and still counting. That's hostile action, the colonel said, leaning back into his chair. A half hour later, the Boffins made their initial report. We think we have found something interesting, Professor Mfumbo said on net. Very little of this planet is covered in water. There are no oceans. Just some large lakes. However, all the nuclear explosions and rock craters, as well as what looks like a major road network that connects them, are on high plateaus that definitely look like continental plates to our observation. A large picture of the planet appeared on the wall in Chris's room. Her crew gathered around it. You will notice what some of my team are calling beaches the professor said, highlighting what looked like sandy areas along the edge of the plateaus. But they're a long way from any water, Jack said. There's also a major difference in vegetation from the continental plates to what looked like dried up ocean beds. Oh, this is interesting. A second wall filled up with a new picture. There are several places where there are these vast scrub wastelands. However, our early radar returns show knobs scattered over the landscape. Knobs? Chris said. Think stumps from where huge trees had been cut down and removed. 
on any of our planets, there would be laws requiring replanting and restoration management of the second growth. Our reference point is to a time in Earth's past when uncontrolled harvesting and no subsequent effort to care for the land resulted in limited new growth. For the next several hours, more dismal information flowed into Chris's tax center. It became painfully clear that the planet had once had nearly 70% of its surface covered by water. Now it was less than 15%. The planet had once been home to a budding civilization. It was hard to take the measure of what those people had built, what with over 2,000 of their larger urban centers blackened, some flattened, others radioactive. The radioactive decay did help to time the event that had caused all this. Two hundred years ago. As they came closer to their target, more pictures showed even more puzzling things. Mountains had had their tops removed. It hadn't occurred in the razor-sharp manner of the vanishing box from Santa Maria. No, you could see the residue of the mountaintops. They had been shoveled off the mountains and slid into the valleys below. Somebody strip-mined this planet as if there were no tomorrow, Abby said. Strip-mined it real ugly-like. The professor got back to Chris as they were decelerating two hours out from orbit. Our biologists are not at all happy about the level of growth on the planet. Assuming this event occurred 200 years ago, nature should have done more to restore the biosphere. Could the loss of water have led to desertification? It seems worse, the professor said. What about nuclear winter? Nellie said. Nuclear what? the professor asked. Chris had me do major research recently concerning nuclear weapons, Nellie said vaguely. Professor Mfumbo had not been involved in the talks between Chris and Ron the Aitichi, concerning how the late Aitichi war had been waged and the lack of either side going to the long-forbidden use of atomic weapons. What's a nuclear winter? Chris asked. Nellie had briefed her about her research, but whatever this kind of winter was, it had not come up. Some people, back when nuclear weapons were available, feared that if they used them, the resulting clouds of debris and smoke might hurl particles high into the atmosphere. Enough particles, and high enough that they could block out so much of the sun, that there would not be enough solar energy arriving at the surface to permit plants to get in a full growing season. Nuclear weapons, volcanoes, or large asteroid hits might throw up so much gunk into the atmosphere that it brought on a multi-year-long winter. I don't understand, the colonel said. Nellie seemed to take a deep breath and even sigh before going into a deeper explanation. If you go several years with no plants having a successful growth season, plant-eating animals die. Meat-eating animals may be able to scavenge their dead bodies, but sooner or later all that food is gone, and the carnivores die along with them. And plants can exhaust themselves sprouting, then being frozen, sprouting again and again, but being hit time after time with a killing frost. In ancient Earth history, civilizations fell when volcanoes half a world away blew their top. The scientists on old Earth thought that a blend of asteroid hits and major volcanic action wiped out at least 60 to 80 percent of all life on Earth. Not once, but twice. Chris shivered. So, whoever these people are, they were hit by nukes and high-speed rocks. Then their planet was strip-mined, their water stolen, and those still alive left to starve and freeze in the wreckage. It looks that way, the professor said. Although they might not have lived very long. We can't prove it yet, but the air pressure is about half of what would be needed to support our kind of life. They stole their air as well, Penny said. 
It looks that way. Abby whistled through her teeth. I do not like whoever did this to these people. They are not nice at all, and I do not, for one, like them at all. The wasp made orbit. The boffins and crew began a methodical and intense examination of what there was to see. Low-flying drones sent back photographs. Some covered wide swaths of territory. Other robotic probes focused on specific sites. They hovered over the surviving towns and sought answers about the life that died there. The local architecture was full of soaring lines and high-rises. Many had been knocked down, but some still stood defiant in their beauty. The undamaged towns were smaller. If they were human urban centers, none would have held more than 5,000 people. In the towns were murals and statues of their inhabitants. Apparently, they'd been a population of intelligent insects, with an opposable thumb and a strong hive bent. Their architecture was soaring on the outside, but inside it was totally claustrophobic from a human perspective. The general story that slowly grew told of desperate events. It fell to the colonel to put flesh on what they found. The nuclear strikes were aimed at decapitating the political infrastructure, he said coldly. No way to tell if they had one central government with various sub-districts or if they had several independent local governments. I think the attackers smashed the command and control centers with a lightning nuclear strike. This left the survivors headless and struggling to form a response. He paused for a moment to let that sink in. Likely, the attackers had only so many nukes. The rocks were cheaper, and they used them to flatten all the other large urban centers. This also disrupted the food distribution network. The rock bombardment left people with a horrible choice. They could stay in their homes among the familiar and risk being blown to bits, or they could flee out into the countryside with no food, shelter, or services, the outlook for survival wasn't all that much better than staying put. What a fate, Penny said. It doesn't look like they took it lying down. Where the attackers landed and set about plundering their planet, there are huge fields of bodies, carapaces spread over acres and acres where the defenders attacked and were mowed down. The colonel coughed to clear his throat. I'd like to examine some of those killing fields. It would be helpful to know how the attackers murdered the locals. Those are loaded words, Chris said. She wasn't getting much physical exercise these days, but jumping to conclusions was something she really intended to avoid. Holy Mother of God, Commander. I've looked at the data. You tell me words that do it justice. The colonel snapped. Then his gaze fell to the table in front of him as he struggled to regain his composure. Chris said nothing. There were no other words she could think of. Still, she struggled to keep a tight rein on her emotions. She might have to open negotiations with the people who'd done this sometime soon. At the moment, she'd rather negotiate with the devil himself than whoever murdered this planet. Do we have any physical evidence of who did this? Penny asked. That's been my job, Abby said. We've identified several sites that do not match the local construction. Wrong design, wrong materials. Most of them are close to sites of major resource extractions. Say, where several mountains were flattened or huge expanses of trees removed. A series of pictures flashed on the wall. They showed several villages. The alien construction used local material, like mud bricks or wooden poles, to make squat, one-story buildings that sprawled with little or no apparent planning close to the extraction sites. Are there any bodies other than the local insects left here? Chris asked. Both Abby and the colonel shook their heads. Abby went on. 
We haven't identified anything but the carapaces strewn about. There don't appear to be any graves left around the aliens' campsites. They're taking everything this planet has, Chris said. I guess that means they're also taking back their own dead. That may not be totally true, Chief Benny said, interrupting. I had Da Vinci running a pattern recognition on all the killing fields. He spotted a skeleton among all those carapaces. One endoskeleton among all those exoskeletons. A vertebrate from the looks of it. Please put that on screen, Chris said. The wall opposite the one Abby was using came to life. Its picture was of death. A ridge was covered with the dried carapaces of thousands upon thousands. They were tossed and tumbled together. How much of that was post-death, and how much had happened as they died, only a weeping god could tell. The picture zoomed in, fleeing from the full scope of the slaughter to concentrate on a smaller tragedy. Two or three carapaces had become disassociated in death, Barely visible under them was a skull. Two empty eyes and a nose hole stared at Chris. The jaws had fallen open in a silent scream. There were long bones for arms and legs, and a collection of vertebrae where a backbone should be. It almost looks human, Chris said in a whisper. It looks like the bastards who tried to kill us, the colonel said. I'm going down there. I need to see this place up close and personal, Chris said. Chris, Jack said. Jack, I don't want to read a report. I want to be there. See this the way it is. I've got a report to make to my great-grandfather and, I suspect, all of human space. Of this I must bear witness, she said, jerking a thumb at the view. Jack gnawed his lower lip but said no more. Colonel, you want to come? Definitely. Captain, he said to Jack, I hope you will provide us the assistance of your full forensic team. I suspect we'll land all four longboats, what with the Marines and the Boffins. Can I come too? Came in a small voice from where the door to the tax center had edged open a crack. Kara, what are you doing here? Chris asked. Dada told me that you were going dirt side, and I ran down here to ask if I could go, too. Dada? Chris echoed the name of Kara's computer, one of Nellie's kids. I knew we'd made orbit around an interesting planet, from what the Boffins were saying, so I asked Dada to listen in on her mom's net for anything that looked like fun. Nellie, Chris now said. Do we have a security breach? Ah, uh, yes, Chris. It does appear so. It was funny to hear a computer so embarrassed and searching for words. I have all my other children on a shared net. I, uh, didn't notice that Dada had been lurking there, too. It seemed like a good idea, came in a different voice from Kara's. You grown-ups are always ignoring us kids and never tell us anything. Little pitchers have big ears, Penny said, not making much of an effort to suppress a smile. Can I go? Please, the 13-year-old pleaded. We could really use a field trip, Dada added. Professor Lynch is teaching us science, and he says videos can't capture the real feel of nature. Chris noticed that all the so-called grown-ups in the room were looking around at each other, none willing to make the call. She considered the subject of this landing, fields of dead bodies, and wondered if a kid belonged there. Chris dodged that and tried another thought. This field trip will be in spacesuits, Chris said. Do you have a suit? Of course I do, Kara said. It was a little snug the last emergency drill, but it still fits. It should. Like most kids, Karen needed new everything at alarming frequencies. But the comment also reminded Chris that the kid was growing up. If memory served, Chris hadn't much liked it when adults remembered her smaller and didn't notice as she got bigger. Well, 
Chris said, taking the bull, if not by the horns, then at least by something. You'll have to ask your aunt. Oh, you're tossing this my way? Chris's maid snapped. Seems like a good idea, Chris said. She is asking for permission to leave the ship this time. I call that an improvement. The young subject of their consideration turned pink at the reference to her previous antic and disaster. I am asking this time. Please, can I go with you? Abby looked clearly torn. The kid was safe on the ship, as safe as any of them were, on the surface of a murdered planet. Is this Professor Lynch going down with the boffins? He has asked to be included, Professor Mfumbo said. Do you have space for him? Jack asked. That depends, the professor said. At present, I've got enough scientists to fill two launches. How many Marines are you taking down? Jack ran a worried hand through his hair. I guess I'm taking two launches full of Marines, less the space taken up by these rubberneckers. Chris did a quick survey of the room. Penny raised her hand. So did the colonel and Abby. Chief, you want to be included in this jaunt dirt side? No way. That place looks cold and miserable, and I don't see anything down there that you can't bring up here for me to examine in the comfort of my own shop. Chris was none too sure of that, but for now she'd let the devout coward worship at his personal altar. With Kara and Jack, you'll have five rubberneckers. Hooray! Kara shouted and headed off to get ready. She failed to close the door, so Chris could hear her skipping down the passageway, the very image of innocent joy. Chris shook her head. If we could bottle that, I'd buy a case. It's our own damn fault that we lose it when we get old and grumpy, Abby said, the picture of a grump herself. Okay, folks, Chris said, standing up. There's a planet down there. What happened to it is a crime, screaming for whatever justice this universe can give. Let's go investigate the crime scene. Chapter 23 The loaded launch flew across what had once been a sea. That fact was emphasized when Chris spotted something and got permission from the bosun flying to use the third backup camera. Nellie pointed it back to what had caught Chris's eye. There, in the middle of what was now a desert, were over a hundred calcified exoskeletons. Any guess what those are? Chris asked. They look huge, Jack said. If this was ocean, then they must have filled the eco-niche held by the whale on old Earth. That lobster would take quite a bit of melted butter, the colonel said smacking his lips. They look like a pod of beached whales, Penny said thoughtfully. The receding water must have caught them there and left them high and dry. That would be horrible, Kara said, from where she sat beside Abby. I suspect we're going to be hearing that a lot, Chris said, and had Nellie switch off the screen. They were coming up on what some guessed to be the coastline, Chris had Nellie use the spare camera again to capture their landfall. There had been a city there once. It hadn't been nuked, but had been flattened by several rocks. The actual shore area was on the periphery of the zone of destruction. The camera caught a long pier jutting out from the shore. Chris had gone fishing from just such a pier several times in different resorts around Wardhaven. What Chris would have taken for an amusement park complete with roller coaster and Ferris wheel, passed quickly under them. The Ferris wheel was over on its side, and the upper reaches of the roller coaster had been knocked loose. The cars from the coaster now spread along the ground beneath that break. They and the Ferris wheel still showed evidence of smashed and scattered exoskeletons. That's horrible, escaped Kara in a whisper. Nellie changed the picture. One of the vanished forests came into view. The scrub brush that had tried to rise in its place showed death itself. 
regrowth never had a chance, Penny said. No, Chris agreed. Kara just stared at the pictures, her mouth open in a silent O. Oh. Apparently, there was a limit to how much horror one 13-year-old girl could respond to. The 1C bosun's mate piloting the launch was aiming for one of the cutoff mountains. Jack had seen to it that the first launch that got away from the Wasp was combat-loaded with Marines. They had come down there the orbit before. Jack held Chris's launch on the Wasp until the skipper of 1st Platoon reported. Nothing hostile here bigger than an ant, skipper. And even the bugs are skittering away from the noise the launch made. Still, the two launches with boffins were ahead of Chris's lander. Jack took Chris's security seriously, even when there was nothing much alive on a raped planet. The landing was an experience. Wind and what little rain there had been had done what it could to smooth the plane of the scraped-off mountain. Still, those who had done this did not have a shuttle landing field in mind as they did it. Ron the Itichi had wanted to join Chris on this drop, but his advisors had looked the landing zone over and talked him out of risking himself in the harness the humans would use to strap him into one of their landers. As knocked around as the landing was for Chris, she found herself glad that Ron had agreed to follow them on net and read the reports later. The aft hatch of the launch opened slowly. With a whoosh, the residual air inside fled into the lower pressure outside. This planet has about one quarter the air pressure of Earth, Professor Mfumbo reported. The atmosphere's content is about what Mother Earth gave us, 77% nitrogen and 22% oxygen, with minor contributions from other gases. What we have here is Earth atmosphere at 30,000 feet. Please, don't open your suit masks, he added. Chris led her team out of the lander, right behind Jack. At least he didn't have his automatic out. The scene that met Chris's eyes brought her to a halt. Her mouth went tight and her stomach flipped. Desolation was the only word that came to mind. Death and desolation. As far as the eye could see was a dusty emptiness, off to her right, a boffin from one of the other landers kicked over a stone and reached down. Protected from the blistering wind and sun, some sort of life clung to its underside. We're finding some lichens, a few mosses, and two kinds of fungi, Professor Mfumbo reported. There are also some bugs that eke out a bare survival on them. Not much alive here, though. Where are the bodies? Chris asked. The Marines have the killing field staked out, Jack said. No one has entered it yet. However, I think we have an answer to the colonel's question as to how they died. What have they found? The colonel asked. Residue of sarin gas, Jack said. Ugh, was all the colonel said. What's sarin gas? Kara asked. Nasty stuff, the colonel said. Illegal stuff, Penny added. It's illegal for humans to use it on humans, Chris explained. Against the laws of war and reason. Think of it as a jacked-up insecticide, the colonel said. Especially if they mixed it with a bit of oil. It sticks to the skin, gets inside and destroys your nervous system in as little as one minute. It makes it so you can't breathe. Through her bubble helmet, the girl's face again showed pain at what she heard, but words failed her. Want to go back to the lander? Abby asked. No, no. I could take this, Kara insisted. Do you have any idea how they delivered the gas? The colonel asked Jack. No. The Marine Guard has cordoned off the killing field. All they've done is a preliminary chemical check of the soil. That turned up the sarin residue. The actual gas, thank God, broke down a long time ago. Broke down? Chris asked. Sarin is not very persistent, Nellie said. It degrades in the sun and rain. 
Did we have enough rain here? Chris asked. From the looks of it, Jack tried to shrug. That's hard to do in a fully armored spacesuit. He finally said, Your guess is as good as mine. I've checked with the Marines doing the chemical check, Nellie reported in a moment. They are finding sarin residue. No sarin. I'd suggest that we wash down our suits after this, but I don't think you humans have anything to worry about. Thank you, Nellie, Chris said. While they talked, they'd been walking toward two marine guards standing at the edge of the flattened mountain. If the look of the scraped mountain was shocking, the sight along the rising ground below was beyond words. Chris's experience with bugs had been limited. Lottie, the cook at Newhouse, kept a spotless kitchen. There had been one infestation of cockroaches when Chris was about Kara's age. Chris had helped the cook spread out the roach hotels and emptied them a few days later. She remembered one other time when she'd helped the gardener with a particularly bad summer crop of some kind of bugs. She'd been three at the time and didn't want him to hurt the bugs. She'd spent as much time as her small attention span allowed, picking bugs off the flowers and toddling over to the gate to send them flying free. If she remembered right, she hadn't been allowed to play in the garden for several days after that. Once she'd scampered off to other interests, no doubt the gardener had done his job. Someone had certainly done a job here. The escarpment was covered with portions of shells, or complete exoskeletons, thousands and thousands of them. You could see where others had crawled off to die at the foot of the hill. These weren't garden nuisances, sanitary challenges to a spick-and-span kitchen. These were intelligent creatures who built towns and roads that had lasted long beyond them. One of the boffins, his suit said Dr. Lynch, made his way carefully down the hill. He stopped at the first complete body he found and stooped to examine it. There's no soft tissue left, he reported. He lifted up the skull to examine it. No teeth, just a ridge of chitin. I doubt there's anything left from which we could get DNA. Still, I'll collect a number of these more intact bodies and see if there isn't something they can tell us. You do that, Chris said. Chief, can you direct us to that other skeleton you found? It's off to your right, where the ground is steeper. Chris and her group moved that way. A number of Marines came and hammered in spikes with ropes attached. Dr. Lynch joined them, along with three Marines with CSI stenciled on their packs. The four of them roped up and began a careful descent. Chris turned on the outside mic on her suit. The wind, weak but constant, made a whispering noise as it slipped over bones and through empty eye sockets. The thin dust moved constantly, eroding what it could. Even in so much death, the planet lived its own quiet life. Careful as the Marines and scientists were, they added their own sound as carapaces cracked and broke. Dirt and bones broke loose and slid down the ridge. A place that had changed very little in two hundred years took this chance to slide away. Chris waited silently while the descent team made its way down half the embankment. I've got something that looks like foot tracks, a Marine announced, and started snapping pictures. Yeah, I think someone came down this hill before us and went back up, he added as he finished his recording. We've got a real live skull here, Dr. Lynch announced as he reached their goal. Several of the locals on top of him. As a guess, I'd say that before nature did its dust-to-dust -dust thing here, the bodies hid this other body. Any idea of cause of death? Chris asked. I think it's pretty clear, the doctor said, reaching down and raising the skull for all to see. This skull shows evidence of our old friend, blunt force trauma. Somebody bashed his brains out. Murder, Chris said. That the murderer tried to hide, Jack added. Quite successfully, Penny said, 
and went on like the cop's daughter she was. Look around. Whoever slaughtered this planet left none of their own behind. Normal morbidity says that some people would keel over from a heart attack, old age, occupational accidents. Yet we have no sign of any bodies. Somebody busted this poor soul's skull, hid him among the trash, and so we have a body to examine. Sounds plausible to me, the colonel said. The doctor examined the skull. I think we may be able to get some DNA out of those teeth, assuming this alien had teeth like us and DNA in them. He and the Marines began filling the body bag they'd brought down with the bones of the murdered alien. They had several bags and looked ready to fill the others with some of the local bodies. You might want to come over where I am, Professor Mfumbo called on net. I'm in what we think is the invader's village. That involved a long hike across the scraped mountain. The village was nestled in a hollow, between the hill they were on and the next hill over, which had also been leveled. As they made their way down into the protection of the valley, they took in what the planet had to show of its flora and fauna. Lots of trees, bushes, and other brush had lived on this land once. They were dead now. It was easy to tell the attackers' constructions from the locals. They were made of mud bricks with wooden roofs. All were squat, one-story buildings that sprawled across the hill with no sense of urban planning. If there had been any kind of rainfall, the mud bricks would have flowed back to the ground the mud was dug from. But since someone had taken the water, the buildings survived. Professor Mfumbo waved them toward a hut he and several other boffins were coming out of. The other scientists headed for another hut to examine. The professor stayed to give Chris and her team the fruits of their initial examination. The rooms were tiny, he said. There is not much furniture, and what there is is hacked out of local wood. He pointed at several rough-hewn bunk beds, stacked three high. They crammed them in, didn't they? Chris said. It was tight quarters, the professor agreed. And one thing more, there were no amenities. I mean that, none. Not running water, not indoor plumbing. They had to have something, Chris said. The professor pointed down the hill. The water was apparently drawn from the nearby river, even though an entire mountaintop was being shoved into it. That's rude, Kara said. The pollution must have been horrible. But that's what they apparently did, the professor said. Kara ducked into the hut, looked around for a moment, then came back with a question. Where did they go to the bathroom? That puzzled us for a while, the professor admitted. We'd examined several of the sites, looking for means of sewage disposal. We didn't find any, no slit trench, no pit latrine. Once we started searching this place, a couple of the folk spotted lumps of scat scattered indiscriminately around the site. Ew, Kara said. They couldn't have done that, Penny said. That would have left them open to all kinds of epidemics. Apparently they did it anyway, right out in the middle of everything, the professor insisted. My guess is they didn't intend to stay long, and it's possible that the folks who got assigned to dirt side duty weren't the highest in their caste system or social structure. Here, your guess is as good as mine. Chris had to hunt for a word. This boggles the mind? Yes, it does, Professor Mfumbo agreed. But then, so does working in an environment loaded with residual radioactivity from when you nuked them from orbit. Somebody doesn't care much for occupational safety, Chris said. More likely, they never heard of occupational safety, Abby said. Something tells me that these little hellions didn't spend a lot of time on the ground. And when they did, it was years and years apart. They might regularly build new ships, but building huts on a mud ball... Not something great-great-grandpa liked to talk about. 
You may have it right, the professor said. Is there anything we can learn from their scat? Penny asked. No, the professor said. I'm afraid it is a bit too old for us to get any DNA or other useful stuff from it. We have analyzed it. No surprise, their digestive system is very effective, and their food was very well processed. We couldn't identify any specific foods from the resultant dung. We do know they ate pretty much the same minerals that we need, and excreted very much what we do ourselves. Jack shook his head. If their concept of personal hygiene was nothing better than what you think, we ought to find a lot of dead bodies. Sorry, Captain. That doesn't seem to be true. They slaughtered the local folks and left their bodies to rot in the air. But of their own, nothing. Nothing but what appears to be a murdered and hidden one, Chris said. I very much want to see what information that body yields. One body that we think might be one of the attackers. Not much to go on, Jack pointed out. Too true, Chris agreed, looking slowly around the wreckage. All too true. I may be able to change that, came from Chief Benny on net. Please do, Chris said. Since I spotted that one body, I've had every drone I could get loose doing low passes around alien villages. I think I've spotted two more endoskeletons. I'll need permission to send Marines to pick them up, and we'll need time on the longboats. That you will have, Chris said. She turned to Kara. Have you seen enough? The girl merely nodded within her bubble helmet. Let's go topside, folks. Professor, you and your boffins can study this place until you run out of air. I'll be waiting for your report. Me, I've seen enough. Somebody committed a crime here of biblical proportions. I don't know if we can do anything about it, but I think the human race needs to know what we've seen. The ride-up was silent. Everyone was lost in their own thoughts. Chapter 24 Back on board, Chris found that the very air of the wasp seemed full of depression. The word of what the ground team found quickly spread to all hands, but helplessness and hopelessness quickly made way for grim determination as the boffins squeezed more information from their findings. We were able to extract DNA from the teeth of those skulls we found, Professor Mfumbo reported to Chris and her team after supper. They were meeting in a corner of the forward lounge. There, Ron could join them. Jack, Abby, and the colonel were also there, availing themselves of what the bar had to offer. Everyone turned toward the professor. When he didn't go on immediately, Chris said, And? All three are female, and they appeared to share the same complex DNA of those folks who tried to laser us when we disturbed their mining operation a few weeks back. Women? said Penny. So dating can be dangerous anywhere in the galaxy. They are the same species? Jack said. Yes and yes, said the professor, unusually direct with his answer. They are all females. It's impossible to use a rape kit at this late date, but you are free to speculate as to how women ended up with their skulls bashed in, Lieutenant. As for you, Captain... I would add that there is significant genetic drift in this set of DNA. Those others were so alike they had to be a family, though some of the women showed sufficiently different DNA from the main family root. The others were quite close. The three women here are quite distant from that family grouping and show much diversity among themselves. I'd say they come from a much larger population. How distant and how much larger? Chris asked. Specifically quite a bit. If you mean how long has it been since they shared an ancestor, I can't say for sure. Not enough information to develop a timescale for genetic drift. Sorry, Your Highness. 
Several of my people are very intrigued by these findings. I assure you much work is going into this, but there is little to base a conclusion on. Chris leaned back in her chair. So let's see what we have here. Nellie, open a small window on the forward screen and record this. Yes, Chris. What have we got? Chris asked herself. One, a homicidal maniac who charged out to kill us, even though he had no idea who we were and what our strength was. And he did it, Abby added, with a boatload of his kith and kin. A very crammed boatload of kith and kin, the colonel said. Behind Chris, a first point appeared on the screen, with additional points appearing below it as the team added their thoughts. Second, Chris went on, we've got a huge bunch of homicidal maniacs who slaughtered a planet-wide civilization, then plundered that planet of its water, air, and anything else they could walk off with. Including their own dead, Abby said, except for the three women that some homicidal maniacs actually committed homicide on. Does anyone else find it interesting, Penny said thoughtfully, that they had no sanitation facilities for their camp on that planet? Ew, to use Kara's word, Abby said. Disgusting, but hardly interesting. Professor, that boatload of people who attacked us, Penny went on quickly. Did they have the normal sanitation facilities? It would be impossible to run a spaceship otherwise, the professor said. Yes, we did find what looked like bathrooms. Not at all private. One of our engineers was very interested in finding their recycling and water reclamation system. But we could not identify it in the wreckage. I see what you're getting at, the colonel said. They have shipboard sanitation, if only by rote but they so rarely go dirt side that they've forgotten how to do it there. Yes, Penny said. Space raiders who only make landfall to pillage and don't do that often enough to remember the basics, Ron the Aitichi said in conclusion. It's not like they gave the locals a fighting chance, the colonel went on. Flatten them with nukes or rocks, then gas those that are still raising objections. Viciously effective, though. I think there's one more thing we need to highlight, Chris said. Her team waited as she took a deep breath. We've called them homicidal maniacs because, from our perspective, that's what they look like. However, to them, I suspect their actions are quite logical. The question is, logical to what? We'll only be guessing, the professor said. But I think we need to have some guesses, Ron said. I certainly will need to put some in my report. The individual doesn't seem to matter much, Chris went on. They cram themselves into ships far beyond what we would put up with. Even when they get a chance to go dirt side, their huts are small, and they load six people into a tiny room. That worries me, the colonel said. Quantity has a quality all its own, someone brilliant once observed. Yes, Chris said. They attack without warning, without reflection. They come in large numbers, and they can strip a planet and even a solar system. Ladies and gentlemen, Chris said, I don't think humanity has much of a choice. We have met the enemy and it's going to be a bitch. Chris tapped her comm link. Captain, set course for where we left the battleships. I think we've got enough to make our report to the king. Chapter 25 So good to see you, your highness, Admiral Kratz said, as soon as the wasp jumped back into the system where the battleships waited. A messenger packet has arrived from your king. You are ordered home immediately. The admiral made no effort to suppress his glee. Fine, Chris said. I'm ready to report to him. The admiral's grin vanished. 
You're not going to argue? Nope. I've already drafted my report, one that I think all human space needs to see. Would you like a copy? Of your report? Yes, Admiral, my report. I guess I should look at it. After you read the report, you might want to crank up your battleships and go take a look at what we found. I doubt it, the Greenfeld Admiral said, but his eyes were on something off screen. He was quiet for a long moment, then frowned. They strip-mined an entire planet. Down to its water and air, massacred the intelligent civilization that had grown up on the planet. We're debating whether they attacked the planet despite the civilization present or because of it. Hard to tell from the evidence. The admiral seemed torn for a moment, but then he shook his head. We admirals voted for all of us to go home. Even your king has issued you orders to go home. We should go home, right now. Not yet, Admiral. Have any other ships of Patron 10 reported in? No. Then I intend to wait for them. Your orders are to return immediately. Admiral, may I remind you that I have not yet seen my orders. Will you kindly give me a chance to read them and decide for myself what they say? The Greenfeld Admiral slammed his fist down on his comlink, ending a flood of language very unfit for a princess's ears. Chris, Vicky is holding for you, Nellie said. Put her through. And while we're talking, could you please find this set of orders I'm supposed to have from Grandpa Ray? Yes, Chris, Nellie said. Hi, Chris. Did you have fun gallivanting around the galaxy? Vicky asked not even trying to sound like she meant it. It wasn't my idea of fun. Have you seen our report? I just sent your admiral a copy of it. I think copies are going to all the admirals. Haven't seen a thing. Admiral Kratz is charging around the flag bridge like a man back from a six-month cruise who found a five-month pregnant wife. I decided to make myself scarce and see if I could get the skinny straight from the horse's mouth. I'd say nay, except I want my report distributed as far and wide in human space as I can get it. That sounds bad. Take a look. The Grand Duchess of Greenfeld read from a different screen, her face going from puzzlement to a frown. She ended in a scowl. That looks bad. Huge population. Not willing to talk. Ready to kill anything in its way. Yeah. I think we need a whole new definition of bad for this. So you're going to take this report to your king? I'm going to send a report to my king just as soon as I can order up a courier ship and transfer some of the bodies we found. I'm told I have some orders around here, but Nellie hasn't found them yet. Once I read them, I'll decide if I have to go running back to Wardhaven, like your admiral insists, or can wait for my squadron to reform then go back looking like a decent navy formation. I hate leaving anyone behind. Chris thought for a moment. Especially now that I've seen what I've seen. Nellie interrupted their girl talk. Chris, I've got a copy of your orders. Let me look at them. And a copy appeared on the screen under Vicky's image. Two, C.O. Pat Ron 10. From... Chairman, Joint Staff. You will report here at your earliest convenience. Well, that certainly comes from the top, Chris said. And it doesn't leave much doubt as to what they want from you, Vicky said. Chris pulled at her right ear. I'm not so sure. If they'd wanted me to drop everything and run to Papa, or rather, Great Grandpapa, they would have addressed it to my highnessness, or my long night ship, something personal. This is to the commander, Patrol Squadron 10. That's the wasp, hornet, fearless, and intrepid, methinks. So, Chris said, letting a big grin out to play. I'll wait here to get all my ducks in a row, then we'll all go home together. On your head be it, Vicky said. I think this is one of those things they don't want me to learn from you. Sister, some things we just have to learn on our own, 
Chris said. You want to tell my admiral, or shall I? Vicky said. I think I'll give him some time to calm down, Chris said. We have to refuel the wasp anyway. I want my boffins to put together a set of physical remains to go with my report. I do want to get that off as soon as I can. Anything exciting while I was gone? One explosion on the Fury missed me by five minutes, Vicky said casually. They're still trying to decide if it was an accident or something else. What do you think? Chris asked. I think somebody doesn't like me and really takes offense that I keep on breathing. Any chance your chief Benny could meet with one or two of my guards? Ones I trust? Let's arrange that today. You want to come on board for a visit? Ron the ITG is a fun guy to hang with. I just knew you'd been doing things with the ITG. How's he hung? They are not hung, Vicky. Nothing, nada, in that area. Haven't you read the autopsy reports from the war? I read them. I didn't believe them. Sorry, girl. Believe them. Vicky seemed to think the matter over for a while. Okay, I'll come over. Say in three hours. Have your chief standing by to talk to my bomb sniffers. I'll have them bring all their gear. If I'm going to stay alive, I'll need all the help I can get. Oh, and you will have your pet Aitichi out for me to see. Vicky, I keep telling you, he's nobody's pet. And I'm supposed to believe you, long knives? Vicky said, and wrung off. Chapter 26 The Fearless came in only a short time after the Wasp. She had visited nine systems. All of them were full of profound scientific data, but not a scrap of life that her crew could spot. Also, as best they could tell, no life had visited the systems since the three aliens first installed, built, or hatched the jump points into them. The good news was that this allowed Captain Drago to throw a smart metal yard over to the other corvette and put a spin on the two ships. By the time Vicky arrived, the Wasp had a good half-G of imitation gravity to offer people stomachs. You're alone, Chris observed with a raised eyebrow, as Vicky exited the Admiral's barge. No Admiral? He's not talking to you. I hope that doesn't break your heart. I told him I was coming over to the Wasp. He grumbled something about don't get killed and went back to whatever he was doing. I've noticed lately that he keeps his distance from me. You know, I don't think he wants to be around when I get blown up. How rude of him, Chris said. Though, I've also noticed that it takes a real friend to hang close with me. I like to think that my work helps in that area, Princess, Chief Benny said. No doubt, both Chris and Vicky said in the same breath. That gave the two young women a chance to share a laugh. A Greenfeld Navy lieutenant and a Marine sergeant followed Vicky off the barge. Between them, they lugged a large footlocker. Vicky introduced them to Chief Benny. Before the three technical experts headed off on their own, Chris felt she should explain the rules. The chief here will help you with your own equipment. After you get it working, he may give you suggestions on how to get the most out of it. Fine-tune it. He may also share some of the software workarounds that he's developed. What I will not let him do is share any Wardhaven technology that you don't have. Do you have to keep that last restriction? Vicky asked. We already know that mainstream Greenfeld technology has a ways to go to catch up with Wardhaven. We also know that some people back home have tech that's just about as good as you have. In some cases, better, Chris grumbled. I know. I've had to dodge it. Chris worried her lip. Vicky, my government has restrictions on tech transfer to Greenfeld. After the report you just shared with us, you think two different human families should be building walls between them? Vicky asked. No, I don't, Chris said. But until your dad and my grandpa agree to bury the hatchet someplace, other than in each other's skulls, I feel I have to live by those rules. 
Let's hope I can live by them, too. Chris sighed. Okay, I'll tell you what I'll do. Chief, you go over the gear these folks have. Tell them what you can under the limits I've placed on you. Then, when you're done, give me a call. We'll talk then. That enough for you? She asked Vicky. It's a start, the young woman agreed. The technicians left. Now we head for the forward lounge to meet Ron the Aitichi. I'm going to get to meet your Aitichi. I keep telling you, he's not my Aitichi. He's very much the Emperor's Aitichi. Oh, and his choosers. Chooser? Think of your dad. Only worse. That's not possible. Is it getting that bad? Chris asked. It was getting pretty bad when I left. He's really all goo-goo eyes over his new woman and the baby boy. I figured things were going to get bad, even before the bombs started dogging my footsteps. Now I don't know what to think. Nellie, will you invite Ron to join us in the forward lounge? I'd like to introduce him to Vicky, uh, the Grand Duchess of the Greenfeld Empire, and we can talk about the report I sent him. He says he will be honored to meet with you two, and yes, he wants to talk about your report, Nellie said formally. So I'm going to meet an Aitichi in the flesh. And he's got a lot of it, Chris said. Heavy? Oh, no. Actually, he's rather good-looking, I think. But there's eight feet of him and a whole lot of elbows and knees. And you think he's cute, Vicky said with a giggle. Have you kissed him yet? Do you think a long knife would tell a Peterwald? Chris snapped back. Would you believe anything I told you? No and no. So don't tell me. I'll have more fun making up stories. Chris threw her hands up in the air. Ron was waiting for them outside the forward lounge. Chris did the introductions. Ron, this is the Grand Duchess Victoria of the Greenfeld Empire. She's the daughter of Emperor Henry I. Vicky, this is Ron, an imperial representative. Though I don't think he's carrying a full portfolio this trip out. Oh, and his full name goes on for half a mile, but he's willing to let me call him Ron, and he calls me Chris. I am happy to be on a first-name basis with Princess Christine, Ron said, through his interpreting computer. Vicky did a lovely curtsy and said, I'm honored to meet you. Call me Vicky, please. Ron offered each of the women an elbow, and they entered the lounge. Vicky giggled. I've never had a guy with so many elbows. This is neat. I didn't know that you humans had empires, Ron said, quickly switching his four eyes from Chris to Vicky. The last time I was in human space, there was no mention of such things except in the history books. It was kind of my dad's idea, Vicky said. When Chris's great-grandpa got officially recognized as a constitutional monarch, Dad decided to go him one up, be a full-power emperor. The old geezers in our families have had this thing for years. Chris and I are hoping to skip that foolishness in our generation. Who knows? Maybe we will. It would be nice, Chris said. Ron mulled that over for a moment. I remember an article in one of the news magazines about how Chris saved your father. The reporter thought that was a very strange thing to do, considering all the stories about Peter Wald's attempting to have Chris killed. None of those stories were ever proven, Chris pointed out. There must have been something behind all of them. What is your saying? Where there is smoke, there must be fire. All that didn't matter. At the time of the attempt on her dad's life, it seemed like a good idea that those trying to kill him not succeed. Fortunately for my dad, Chris was there. So, what brings you here? I saw the video of your meeting with King Raymond. Was that all true? Are you losing ships? Ron glanced down at Chris 
and the color of his residual gill slits did not show happy. I thought that meeting was private, not to be recorded. The way your king ushered everyone out of the room. I heard him say there should be no recordings. I testified so to my emperor. Did you make my word false, Chris Longknife? It wasn't me, Chris said. With Nellie laughing in the back of her skull, she went on. I mean, my king did order that no recordings be made, and you yourself saw how the room emptied out. It turned out that our chief spy didn't follow my grandpa's orders very well. He made copies of his recording and sent it around to I don't know how many governments. The fleet you see around us is the result of that leak. Ron halted beside an empty table in the front of the lounge. Two of the bar folks brought one of the things he could sit on, and they settled down before Ron went on. You humans are very strange. Your chooser could not or would not order a scout force out, even though he is king. Yet his subordinate violates his orders, and because of that a search fleet goes out. Very strange behavior. You've got to give Chris credit for the scout fleet, Vicky said. The battleship showed up to go where she went. If Chris hadn't insisted her next mission was to do some snooping around the far end of the galaxy, I don't think anything would have happened. Really, Chris, do you? Chris shrugged. I made up my mind that I was going out here once we cured the pirate problem out beyond the rim of your empire, Vicky. All the rest just kind of followed after me like a speckled giraffe on wheels that I had when I was a little kid. Though it took a lot more pull, Vicky said, grinning. I didn't pull anything. I went. They followed. Kind of like you, Ron. I didn't do anything to have you here, but here you are. I think my chooser and the emperor did not want me at the court. No one wanted to talk to me but the drift of the current was clear. People were talking about me a lot. Boy, we girls can really relate to that, Vicky said, with just the hint of a giggle. So can we talk about what you found? Ron asked. Chris nodded. I don't have a lot to add to it. What's in my report is pretty grim. What I wrote was just an effort to document what I saw on the ground. Will I be allowed to take some of the bodies back to the Empire? Ron asked. I'll let you take a complete set of bodies from the ship that attacked us, Chris said. If you want, you can have a complete exoskeleton from the murdered planet. What about the other skeletons you found? Our scientists will want to make their own determination about who those people are. That's a problem. There are only three of them. We've already found DNA in the pulp of some teeth. If you have the technology to identify DNA, I guess we could probably spare a few teeth for your empire. Yes, we can do the thing that makes the DNA tell its story, the Aitichi said. A tooth from each of the bodies would be a generous gift. I imagine all the other governments who sent representatives to the Fleet of Discovery will also want teeth, Chris said. On the screen, a star lit up. There goes the Mercury, Nellie told them. It has Chris's report and some of the artifacts from the planet, including teeth. Whoever those poor murdered girls were, Chris said, they're going to end up with their teeth scattered all across the galaxy. They may be murdered souls, Chris, Nellie said, but they were murdering souls as well. Too true, Chris agreed. Chris, the Hornet just jumped into the system, Nellie reported. Phil Tausig has an urgent message for you. Put him on. Commodore, we have a problem, Phil Tausig started without preamble. I have seen the bug-eyed monsters, and they are even more huge than we feared. Chapter 27 for a moment, Chris heard the words, 
but her brain refused to make sense of them. That state of affairs lasted for maybe two seconds. Then Chris jumped to her feet and pitched her voice to Carrie. People, I need this room. Please take your drinks and go elsewhere. Barkeep, this pub is closed. The folks on the Wasp were used to strange demands coming from their princess. With hardly a word, the place emptied. Nellie, tell my staff to get down here on the double. They're already running, her computer reported. All except the chief. I figured you'd want to let him keep working with Vicky's people. Good call, Nellie, yes. Should I return to my quarters? The Aitichi asked. Ron, you're the reason we're here. I don't see why you should get this report secondhand. Vicky, same goes for you. I wish I'd brought Maggie with me, Vicky said. Would you mind if I sent the Admiral's barge back to the Fury and picked her up? Assuming your Admiral doesn't confiscate his barge, do what you want, Chris snapped, totally in combat mode. She thought for a second. Nellie, you want to give all the Admirals a heads up. They can join us online if they want to. Aye, aye, Commodore. Nellie said. I'll make it so. I like that phrase. Jack arrived at a full run, with Penny and the colonel on his heels. Abby, Chris's maid and spy, shuffled in a few seconds later, her hair up in curlers and wearing a house coat and fuzzy slippers. This better be good, she complained. Phil is back. The hornet caught a glimpse of the bug-eyed monsters, Chris said. How much of him did they catch? The colonel asked darkly. I got a one-line brief, Chris said. I've only had time to sound officer call. Should you sound boots and saddles? Jack asked. Now might not be a bad time to beat all hands to battle stations. Phil didn't holler for it, but yeah, there's no telling if he knows what's on his tail or not. Nellie, order Pat Run 10 to battle stations. Tell the admirals that we are going to high alert, and I would advise them to all do the same. The klaxon on the wasp went off. Battle stations, battle stations, all hands to battle stations. This is no drill, blared from the public address. Chris, Captain Drago for you, Nellie reported. Oops, Chris thought. Put him on. Would you mind telling me why you've ordered battle stations for our ship? I may or may not be complaining, but when the captain's the last to know about something like this, it bothers me. The Hornet just returned. Commander Tausig reports that they have seen the bug-eyed monsters, and they are huge. Until I know what all that means, we are at battle stations. A very good idea, your highness. Thank you, said the captain, and rung off. Once again, the convoluted chain of command on the Wasp had gotten tangled and survived the experience. With any luck and the goodwill of all involved, it would continue that way. Chris eyed the screen, waiting for everyone to appear on it for the upcoming conference. It still showed the Mercury accelerating toward the jump point for home. Its report was still valid. However, it was now a touch out of date. Nellie, recall the Mercury. I think we'll need to add her report. Aye, aye, Chris. I've ordered the Mercury to return to the fleet area. Chris, I don't mean to juggle your elbow, Jack said. But if we might have bug-eyed monsters charging through the jump point after the Hornet any second, wouldn't it be a good idea to have some report headed for home right now? Chris scowled at the screen. Order, counter-order, disorder, she muttered. But there's an exception to every rule, the colonel whispered. Nellie, ask the skipper of the Mercury how long until they take the jump. She says eight hours at their previous acceleration. She's just about to start decelerating to return to the fleet. Tell her to maintain her course for the jump, but stay alert. Keep an eye out for fighting in the anchorage and record all message traffic. We may have an additional report for her. Aye, aye, Commodore the computer said. A moment later, she added, The Mercury is back to accelerating for the jump. The screen flickered and changed to show three admirals and Lieutenant Commander Tausig. Admiral Kratz was already talking. Maybe bellowing was more accurate. By what? 
authority. Have you ordered my ships to battle stations? He demanded. I ordered Patron 10 to battle stations. I suggested you might want to follow our lead, Chris said. The Hornet is back, and Commander Tausig reports contact with the bug-eyed monsters. You have found them, Admiral Kota said. Did they follow you? I think I gave them the slip, Phil answered. At least, I didn't see anything of my pursuers in the last two systems I crossed. But whether or not you shook them depends on their tracking skills, Admiral Channing pointed out. There is that problem, the skipper of the Hornet admitted. You want to tell us about the bug-eyed monsters, Chris said. Not really, Phil answered with a sigh. Truth be told, I didn't spend any more time observing them than I had to. Fill us in, Commander, Chris ordered. We'd done our five jumps out and had nothing to show for it. We started back, following the new route the Boffin said would bring us home. The second jump, three jumps out from here, we got a surprise. He took a deep breath before going on. We came through the jump and headed for the next one. It was only three hours away. Thank God, because our sensor board started lighting up like it was Christmas. Reactors, thousands of them, all well down in the system and headed for a different jump. Thousands of reactors? Chris said. I'll pass along our data. Maybe your boffins can make sense of it. There must have been three or four thousand reactors humming away at full power. There were even more trickling at minimum power. We finally located the source and got a fairly decent picture of it. The screen opened a separate window. It filled with something that looked like an elongated egg. An egg with a very bumpy skin. How big is that mother? Admiral Kratz asked. We estimate it at over 4,000 kilometers along its longitudinal axis. Not quite 2,000 clicks at its widest. It's hard to tell because we don't know what is the main body and what are the ships docked to it. Those knobby things come off? Chris asked. Three of them took off after us. The pictures shifted to show three elongated dots detaching themselves from the main egg and making a straight line for the hornet. How long did it take them to react to you? The colonel asked. About an hour. Less if you make allowances for the speed of light delay for them to spot us. Did they try to communicate with you? Chris asked. There was a lot of activity on the radio frequencies, but none was aimed at us, and we didn't identify anything as an effort to raise us. Once it was clear the ships were headed our way with a bone in their teeth, we did make an effort to open communications with them. If there was a reply, we couldn't identify it in the clutter. You said a bone in their teeth, Chris said. How hot was their pursuit? Three Gs. I jacked the Hornet up to 3.5 Gs and got out of there just as fast as I could. Did you see any evidence of them in your next system? Chris asked. Chris, when I got into the next system, I was very tempted to point the Hornet at the closest jump and see where it led me. He swallowed hard at the thought. Only time would tell if it would have been better for the Hornet to disappear, like the lost flying Dutchman, rather than come home with her report. That decision might yet have to be made. Instead, I kept the boat at 3.5 Gs and headed for the second jump like I was supposed to. We jumped out of there before we spotted any activity at the last jump point. He took a deep breath. I don't know if they didn't pursue us or what. What I do know is that we didn't see hide nor hair of them in any of the systems we crossed to get here. We've got to leave immediately, Admiral Kratt snapped. I've still got a ship out there, Chris said. From her point of view, there was now even more reason not to leave the Intrepid out here alone. We need to get this information back to our governments, Admiral Channing said. Nellie, has the Mercury been taping this report? Yes, Your Highness. She has been recording this and adding it to the report you filed with her. 
Good, Chris said. That took care of home as much as she could. She wasn't finished with Phil. Commander, tell me more about this huge base ship. Did you get anything more on it? It's dense. More dense than either of Wardhaven's moons. Much more dense than old Earth's moon. Almost as dense as, say, a planet. And they needed thousands of reactors to power it. Power it and propel it. It was leaving a plasma stream behind it that had to be seen to be believed. How fast? Chris asked. It was doing about half a G acceleration away from one jump point and headed for another. So it was going somewhere, Chris said. Definitely. Space rovers, Penny said. But we don't have a picture of who or what is at the helm of this ship. Ships, Chris corrected herself. Nothing, Commander. I've got recordings of what they were transmitting, but no one aboard the Hornet could make any sense of them. Pass them to us, Chris ordered. Nellie, tell Professor Mfumbo that he doesn't have any higher priority than extracting something useful from this data stream. I very much want to watch any video they have, very much. Chris, we're getting the Hornet's take, Nellie reported. The Boffins are already working on it. I've got my kids on it as well. All of them, Chris said. Even Dada? Yes, Chris. And Kara knows about our situation. She's been peeking through the front door of the forward lounge for the last ten minutes. Sure enough, the two swinging doors into the lounge were showing a crack. Kara was lying on her belly, furtively watching them. We have to get that child a battle station, Chris sighed. Really? Kara said, jumping to her feet. In the scullery, the colonel grumbled. I can do more than that. Kara insisted. Chris stared at the overhead. To the best of her knowledge, there were no standard operating procedures for getting into a war with space aliens. The Navy had a standard answer to almost everything else imaginable, but not this. A hasty review of her actions did not make her proud. She'd bobbled her start out of the gate. She should have thought to go to general quarters immediately, and not needed Jack to remind her. The order and counter-order to the Mercury were more of an embarrassment than a mistake. Still, what she'd done since felt right. Okay, folks, let's get organized. Phil, bring the Hornet down to join the fleet. Hermes, come alongside the Wasp and take aboard our gizmo for peeking into the next system. No, hold it, that won't work, Chris caught herself. The Hornet was doing 50,000 clicks per hour, and the periscope only shows you what's in the closest system. Hermes, get the coordinates from Commander Tausig and jack yourself up to maximum G's and duck back into his last system. I'd like a report on whether anything is behind him. Do you think that's smart? Admiral Kratz asked. We can either sit here wondering if hostiles are going to come charging through that jump point, or we can go look, Chris snapped. Or we can get up speed and get out of here ourselves, the Greenfeld officer suggested. Chris did a quick and silent survey of the people whose opinion she valued. None of them looked interested in hiding under the bed. As I've said many times before, Admiral, you are free to do what you wish with your battle squadron. I reserve the right to do with Pat Ron Ten what I choose. Nellie. See that Hermes gets underway for a fast run into Hornet's last system of call and return. Could you at least see that the Hermes' computers are rigged for destruction? Admiral Channing said. I would suggest that we all prepare our navigational systems to assure that if we fall in battle, our enemy will be unable to extract navigational information from our wreckage. That ship that attacked the Wasp certainly made sure that we could draw nothing from its databases. That sounds defeatist, was Admiral Kratz's observation. It's only defeatist until somebody defeats us. Then it sounds pretty smart, Admiral Kota said. I'll have my division heads draw up a list of what should be rigged for complete destruction. We'll also put it on a failsafe to make sure we don't have any accidents. 
I'll also have the remaining two courier ships see that all reaction tanks are topped off, Chris said. We may need to run for it in a hurry. Chris, should we tell the other admirals what we know about the fuzzy jumps? If we have to lead them into one of them to get away from the aliens, it might help if they knew what we were doing beforehand. That could well be a smart move, Nellie, but it also means giving away something I'm not sure I want to give. I'd rather keep that ace up my sleeve for a while longer. We may need those fuzzy jumps, Chris, to get out of a big mess. Nellie, we don't know if the aliens already know about the fuzzy jumps, and if they don't, I don't want to let them see us vanish into space that holds no such option to them. I fear that we will have some really tough decisions ahead of us, Chris. Trust me, Nellie. I know that we do. Jack cleared his throat. Could I ask you, Commander, to rethink one of your recent orders? Jack, you're going all formal on me, Chris said. He shook his head. I don't think we should send the Hermes out. I'm afraid that I agree with your Marine, Colonel Cortez said. Both of you don't think we need to know what's coming this way, Chris said. We need to be able to kill anything that jumps through after the Hornet, Jack said. But no, Chris, I don't think we need to leave a bigger trail pointing at that jump point. It would be nice to know if something is following him, Chris said. Certainly, the colonel agreed. Is there any chance that your boffins might be able to get their jump point periscope working so we could peek through? Nelly, get Professor Mfumbo, Chris said. I'm busy, he snapped a second later. There are several approaches that might crack these images, but right now none of them have worked. A quick question, Professor, Chris said. So far, the jump point periscope has only succeeded in showing us the closest other side of the jump point. Any chance we could dial it around to show us some of the other systems connecting through the jump point? Like the 700 light year away system that the Hornet just left? Exactly, Professor. Sorry, not a chance. Our grasp on what we're doing is very tenuous, Your Highness. I see why you would want some selection in your view, but we can't offer it at this time. I don't know if we'll ever be able to give you that. Thank you, Professor. You can get back to your other assignment. The link clicked dead. Okay, if we can't do that, could we bushwhack them as they enter our system at speed? Jack asked. Like we think they have been doing our scout ships, Ron said. The admirals were still on screen, but all had turned away to consult with their staffs. Admiral Kratz, you said that during the last war, no one ever thought of stationing ships at the jump point and shooting up anything that came out. The Greenfeld officer turned away from his officers to face Chris. Yes. You could never tell when a jump point might take it into its head to zig or zag. Far too dangerous for the ship and much too exhausting to the crew of the ship to be floating in micro-G for weeks at a time. The health of the crew requires that we tie up to a station for some gravity at regular intervals. That's also why we usually accelerate at 1G, young lady. Admiral, I believe that the 18-inch lasers on your battleships now have triple the range of the guns we used back then so you don't have to get real close to the jump point to clobber anything coming out of it. Your battle squadron is also not tied up to a space station pier just now, but, Chris said, and waited for a light to dawn. The admiral said several phrases in a language Chris didn't understand. You want me to translate, Chris? No, Nellie. I suspect I have a pretty good idea what he's saying. The admiral fell quiet fixing Chris with a scowl. And I imagine that you want me to take my battle squadron over to that jump point and take station to engage anything that exits it. It strikes me as a brilliant use of your invention. I would rather evacuate this system. I am not ready to leave. Young woman, you have no respect for rank or your elders. I'm sorry you feel that way, sir. 
but I must represent the interests of the United Society as it is given me to see them. I have a ship not yet in from what is turning out to be a very hostile neighborhood of the galaxy. You are free to leave, sir. However, if you choose to stay, may I suggest that you take your four battleships over to where you may apply your 18-inch lasers to anything that exits Jump Point Delta. That will take me farther away from the exit jump, Long Knife. For God's sakes, George, Admiral Channing snapped. If you don't want to do what needs doing, Kota and I will take our ships over there. Though, Lord knows, you've got the biggest guns in the fleet. I go. I go. Captain, send to Batron 12 to keep the little long knife girl happy. We will set up a prepared defense, 30,000 kilometers from Jump Point Dora. There. Are you happy? Thank you very much, Chris said taking care to keep her tone as sincere as the law allowed. Chris leaned back in her seat and thought seriously about ordering a drink. Clearly it had been one of those days. She sighed and fought down the temptation, consoling herself with the thought that it couldn't get any worse than this. Uh, Chris? Yes, Nellie. The intrepid just jumped in system, he says you really want to hear what he has to say. Chris groaned, and just managed to avoid giving voice to something that would not have been very princess-like. Put him on. Admirals, you might want to hear this. Chapter 28 We found a new alien civilization, the skipper of the Intrepid announced, breathless with joy. I think we were there when they sent up their very first artificial satellite. I mean, there was nothing up in orbit. Then there was this little thing going beep, beep, beep. Did you get any pictures of these aliens? Chris asked. Yes. They had radio and TV, primitive sets. We had no trouble translating the pictures, but we have no idea what they were saying. Well, some. What passed for news had a lot on it about the satellite launch. At least we think it did. Please pass your data capture to the wasp, Chris said, keeping her voice even, but she sounded tired, even to herself. The captain seemed startled to have his news taken in with no more excitement than they were giving it. Is something wrong? The hornet found what we think is a bug-eyed monster's mothership. It's huge, and they look to be totally nasty. Oh, well. This was a voyage of discovery. Looks like we made quite a few good ones. Excuse me, Captain, Nellie put in. Did you follow the course laid in by the boffins for your round trip? Yep. No surprises there. Five out, then four back. The bird people. That's what we're calling them. Their TV had an advertisement that seemed aimed at keeping eggs at just the right temperature for a perfect hatching. Well, that's what it looked like. Anyway, the bird people were on the third system out from here. They sure looked like the nicest people you could ask to meet. Third system out, Chris said. She'd heard that number before. Chris, we have a problem, Nellie said softly. On screen, Admirals Kota and Channing turned back from whatever they'd been doing to give the screen their full attention. A Greenfeld commander who had stayed attentive to the screen took a while to get Admiral Kratz's attention. He was none too happy to be disturbed. What now, Long Knife? he demanded. Nellie, please explain yourself, Chris said. A new window opened on the screen. It showed a huge swath of the Milky Way, 5,000 by 5,000 light years square. Each of the four search sweeps showed as a long white loop. The wasp had taken the rightmost sweep and showed the murdered planet as a flashing yellow datum. The fearless had taken the left sweep and had nothing exciting to show for the trip. The hornet and intrepid had the inside sectors. As luck would have it, they'd both started on the outside legs, farthest from each other. As they returned back, they swung inward. Three jumps out, the hornet's hot datum showed a flashing red. 
A short distance from it, in galactic terms, the Intrepid's datum showed a flashing green. Nellie zoomed in on the two flashing star systems. Three short jumps connected them. I think we have a problem, Chris said. Chapter 29 There are moments in your life when you know, even as you live and breathe them, that you will never be the same again. Chris had survived several such moments. She knew about moments in the lives of her family members when they must have known that the future of their planet would never be the same. Grandpa Al's decision to abandon politics after Eddie died was one of them. Father's decision to throw his hat in the ring for prime minister was another, despite Grandpa Al's rage against it. Chris had listened to their furious argument from her hiding place on the stairs. She'd seen these things done, if somewhat messily. Chris had read of moments in Great Grandpa Ray's and Trouble's lives when they must have known that the future of the entire human race would never be the same, depending on what they decided next. As a teenager, Chris had dreamed of living just such a moment. As a young woman, Chris was starting to get an idea of just how foolish her younger self had been. A tiny voice inside Chris was laughing hysterically. You got what you wished for, kid. God help you. It was at moments like this that Chris wished she'd been raised to believe in the power of prayer. Chris shook off the musings that must have tied up a whole five seconds. On the screens, admirals were still giving the star map a puzzled look, so she must not have taken too much time. Nellie, do I have this right? The assumed hostile and the assumed friendly aliens are only three slow, easy jumps away from each other. Yes, Chris. And the jump Commander Tausig reports seeing the hostile alien headed for, at half a G acceleration, is the one that will take them to within two jumps of the other civilization's system. They appear to be headed straight for the star system of the bird people. Oh, sweet Jesus, someone said. So this was it, the moment Chris had been born for. This was the decision for which history would either praise or pillory her. Nellie, get me the skipper of the Vulcan. Online, Commodore. Vulcan, how soon can you begin rigging the corvettes of Patron 10 with the neutron torpedoes? We are ready now, ma'am. We have finished the pre-work. Give us twelve hours alongside the ships and we'll be ready to load the torpedoes. Say no more than twenty-four from your word to start to them being armed and ready. Admiral Kratz might not have figured out the meaning of the star map display, but he knew what Chris was talking about. Longknife, you aren't seriously thinking about taking on that huge alien mothership, he bellowed. Admiral Kratz, I was not thinking about taking on the mothership. I was looking at my options. Now that I find I have options, yes. I am now thinking about what three trunks of neutron stars might do to that ship. It would be a hell of a fight, Phil Tausig said, a feral grin on his face. You can't do that, the Greenfeld Admiral sputtered. Not even a long knife can declare war on an alien race all by yourself. No, you can't do it. I won't let you do it. And don't you go telling me that you're not in my chain of command. He pointed a finger right at the camera, so close that it looked wider than the rest of his body. You have your orders. Go home. All your ships are here. You must go home. He paused, took in a deep breath, and finished. If you do not follow your orders, so help me God. I will declare you rogue, a pirate to your own allegiance. I, and I would hope all of my associates, would be duty-bound to shoot you down like the dog you are. The pause after that grew quite pregnant, pregnant enough to spawn an elephant. Chris let it grow for quite a while before she took a sledgehammer to it. Thank you, Admiral, for letting us know so clearly your opinion on this matter. 
As you suspect, I am coming to the conclusion that I must disagree with you. Captain, power up the main battery, the Greenfeld Admiral ordered. George, Admiral Channing of the Helvetican Confederacy interjected. Don't you think we ought to give Her Highness a chance to explain herself? No, the Greenfeld officer snapped. Once she starts talking, she'll run you around in circles until you don't know what you're doing. And before you know it, you'll be following her. She's one of those damn long knives. But I'm just a little one, remember, Chris said, holding up two fingers just a centimeter apart. Not too long ago, that had been Admiral Kratz's opinion of her. He did not see the humor. Commander, this is Chief Benny. The Greenfeld battleships are powering up their lasers. Thank you, Chief. I thought you were helping Vicky's people. I am, ma'am. But there's no way I can be in a system with powering up 18-inch lasers and not notice it. I'd have to be dead, dumb, and blind. Thank you, Chief. Nelly, send to all Patron 10. Do not power up lasers. Take no hostile actions. I see no reason why we can't talk this thing through. Admiral, Vicky said at Chris's elbow. Just a reminder, I'm on the wasp. Please don't shoot at me. Get the hell off that ship. Uh, Admiral, Vicky said. Weren't we talking about the chance that hostile ships might come charging into this system at any time? Do you really want me in a launch when they do? You are learning too damn much from that long knife pain in the neck. Can we all please slow down and take a deep breath, Admiral Kota said. I think we are faced with an important matter, and I, for one, would like to think it through very carefully. Thank you, Admiral, Admiral Channing said. I'd really prefer that none of us went off half-cocked, in either direction, Commander Longknife, Admiral Kratz. I warn you, if you let her talk, she'll have you all wrapped around her little finger before you know it, Kratz grumbled. Gosh, Vicky said coyly. And I thought I was the one that usually had a couple of guys wrapped around my little finger. Down, girl, Chris said. Can we take a look at our options without anyone getting killed? She asked everyone on screen. I think it's pretty clear. Kratz snapped. We can go home. Or we can follow this little hellion and attack the bug-eyed monsters, starting a war between humanity and God only knows what. George, I have a fairly good idea of what that is, Admiral Kota said. From the looks of it, the monster is headed for a budding civilization. If we do nothing... They will strip the planet of everything needed to support life. I, for one, do not like the idea of standing idly by while that happens. I put on this uniform to stop such atrocities, not watch them happen. But what will be the price for humanity? Admiral Channing asked. They came for them, and it was not my problem, Chris quoted. And when they came for me... There was no one else left to stand with me. So you want to shoot first, Kratz snapped. I'm not sure I'll have a chance to shoot second, Chris said. But hold it, hold it. I don't want to go off hunting until I have some idea of who it is I'm hunting. What? Huh? And I thought you'd made up your mind already. Came in answer to that. Folks... All I did was see if I had some weapons that might be able to make a dent in something the size of what Phil reported. By the way, Vulcan, lie alongside the Corvettes and begin installation. Your 24 hours started five minutes ago. Aye, aye, ma'am. There you go, Kretz snapped. Admiral, please don't shoot up the Vulcan. Let's look at what we're facing. A ship attacked the Wasp with no defiances given. No warning at all. I don't take that for a declaration of war, but it does tell me that there is stuff out here that shoots first and doesn't care about asking questions later. Yes, Admiral Kota said. Secondly, 
We found a planet stripped. Its civilized species wiped out. We found the remains of a few of the people we think did it. The connection to the ship that shot at us is tenuous, but it is there. I can follow you, said Admiral Channing. The Hornet came back with a report of one huge ship. We have audio and video from that ship that we have not yet been able to decode. I'd really like to see who or what is on that ship before I make any decision about what we do here. I agree with you on that, Admiral Kota said. I would prefer not to start shooting, only to find out that, say, the planet we're worried about has an unstable star, and the ship approaching it is on a rescue mission. I'm glad someone is thinking about that, Kratz grumbled. Nelly, would you please get me Professor Mfumbo, Chris said. Chris, he says he's busy. Go away. That brought a chuckle from the admirals on screen and from Chris's staff around her. Can they do that? Vicky asked. They can get away with anything they can get away with. Nellie, put me through to the very busy professor. You got him. Professor, we need your input. I'm busy, he snapped, then seemed to reconsider the question. What kind of input? On taking all humanity to war, Chris said. Oh my God, what are you talking about, woman? I think you have his attention, Vicky said. I think I do too. Professor, we think the ship you got that video from is about to attack and destroy an entire civilization. We need to have a peek at what the people inside it look like. We'd love it if you could match some DNA off that video to some that we have on file. But I doubt even our Boffin team can do that. In its place, I'd really need to see the video the Hornet recorded real soon, now. Time is of the essence. The professor came on screen in a new window. And this may determine if we go to war with them? Pretty much, Professor. I don't mean to make you feel pressured or anything. Don't be ridiculous, young woman. You're telling me if the video take from the big ship shows people like we found on the ship that attacked us and the bodies on that murdered planet, you plan to attack them. Let's say that if there is a match, we'll have to seriously consider what we do next. The professor ran a worried hand through his hair, the first time Chris ever remembered him showing any sign of stress. The data is in a format that we have never seen before. It doesn't fit any logical structure. I've cracked coded video, but this goes far beyond a coding. Could it be they don't want strangers reading their stuff? Chris said. Most definitely, the professor said. Nellie, have you got any suggestions? Chris, my kids and I have been doing everything we can think of to crack those videos. Nothing elegant works. Nothing brute force works. It is very frustrating for us computers to find such limits to our abilities. Have you asked the chief to look at it? Chris asked. No, he's busy, Nellie answered stiffly. And besides Nellie, you don't want to get him involved, Chris added to herself. Nellie, interrupt the chief. Maybe he and the Greenfeld tech types might have a different twist on it. Yes, ma'am. Nellie did not sound very happy, but she obeyed. Chris glanced around her team. So, ladies, gentlemen, and alien, until we have something from the ship to look at, I suggest we go about our business. Admiral Kratz, weren't you about to move your squadron over to Jump Point Dora so they could shoot up any bug-eyed monster that edged its nose through the jump? Yes. I guess I can move over there. Chris, do you mind if I stay aboard the Wasp? Vicky said. You aren't seriously worried about being in a launch, are you? No. I can hardly be, since I had my best friend, Maggie, ride the barge back over here while all this was going on. 
but I have this serious concern about my admiral taking a pot shot at you. My being here just might make him have second thoughts before he does something you'd regret. Come to think about it, I do have a spare bunk you can use. Thanks. Are we really just going to sit on our hands? Jack asked. Consider yourself lucky, old boy, the colonel said. The poor working stiffs of the Vulcan will be slaving away in a few moments, out to arm your little corvettes with monster killers. And the Greenfeld battleships will soon be tracking that jump point, their itching trigger fingers eager to blast anything that comes through the jump. Me? I'm curious, your highness. He paused while everyone turned to give him their full attention. Does that monstrous mothership punch through the jump point with all her little monsters tucked in tight? Or do they go charging through the jump ahead of her? A very interesting question, Chris said. It might make for a very disappointing ambush if the little monsters were out front. Phil, any idea how big the little ones that chased you were? Several million tons, according to our measurements of their gravity distortions. Their mass per cubic meter was not shabby either. Each one as big as a couple of the Admiral's battleships, huh? From what I saw, they don't do anything small, the Hornet skipper said. But I can say this. They were all tied up alongside. They had no patrols out when I came across them. Admittedly, they were 32 hours away from their last jump and a good 50 hours away from their next one. Is it possible, Chris said, that they are hungry? If they're heading for their next feeding frenzy, it may have been quite a while since they last gobbled up a planet. They may be conserving resources. You're guessing, Jack said. I'm examining possibilities, Chris said. That's all we can do until we get a look at who's running that monster ship. Dear Lord, Abby kind of prayed. I hope the picture we get of those cusses are of little green ladies with twelve fingers. Amen, said Penny. We can hope, Chris agreed. Until then, we wait, the colonel said. I am good at twiddling my thumbs, Ron said, and proceeded to do that, with four hands and a whole lot of fingers and thumbs. How do I top that? Vicky asked. You can't, Chris said. Care for a bit of chow? I understand the wardroom is serving steaks tonight. It's the last of the fresh meat, so we better get it while it's good. So like old friends, the team decamped for Chow. Even Ron. Jack and the colonel got behind his kind of chair and pushed it along to the wardroom. That left Chris to contemplate her fate. Could she really order an unprovoked attack on the huge mothership? Would she have a second chance if she didn't? Could she stand to live with herself if she stood by and let them massacre the avian people? A gal could go crazy letting her mind race through those questions time after time. But she had friends. And waiting out the possible countdown to war with good friends almost made it endurable. Chapter 30 The hurry up and wait lasted for 18 hours. Which is to say that nothing horrible happened for that length of time although quite a few working people spent the time sweating bullets. Midway through her meal, in the middle of a long line of puns being bounced around the table like ping-pong balls, Chris sat bolt upright. Something wrong? Jack asked. No, but I think I just figured how we can know whether the mothership is coming through the jump with all her little monster ships tucked in, or instead is sending out a swarm of monster ships to check things out first. How? the colonel asked. Chris bopped herself on the forehead. They are taking the jump slow and easy. That means we can send through the periscope. Say we have one of the courier boats stand out up there, monitoring the view to the other solar system. We use the radio monitor first to let us know they're coming. 
then the visual one to see how they're deployed. We might want to trade off, the colonel said. We don't know if they'll go to some kind of MCON blackout. At the blank stare he got from Vicky and Ron, the colonel translated himself. Emission control. A smart cookie goes silent on the radio and radar as you get closer to your target. We can balance using the radio and the light frequency spy, Chris said. Do we know if they can tell that the jump is in use? Even a little bit, Ron asked. I know that we usually know something has jumped into the system by the roar of their reactors, but does the jump itself give off a clue? That turned out to be a very interesting question. Several busy boffins said so when Chris interrupted them with it. Unfortunately, even the two scientists who had come up with the idea of the periscope had no idea if someone could know the jump was in use. Apparently, no one in the human race had yet succeeded in answering that question. Yes, it had been asked, but getting anyone with money to pay for the lengthy research to maybe get an answer had never been made to happen. Was one of the Long Knife Foundations interested in correcting that oversight? Chris allowed that it might be. Write up a grant proposal when we get back. Once the Boffins were back to their work, her team got back to their guessing. I hope no bug-eyed monsters ever ask that question either, the colonel concluded. Even BEMs that have spent their whole existence bouncing around in space, hardly ever touching down? Jack said. Chris's crew fell silent. Okay, Penny said. I've got to say this even if no one wants to hear it. I don't have the moral certainty that you have, Chris. Maybe the rest of you see nothing wrong with dragging the whole human race. And the Aitichi race, Ron interjected. Into a war with God only knows who or what or how many of these BEMs, Penny shivered. I've got a problem with it. And doing it without a word exchanged between us. We're firing the first shot in what could be a long hell of a war. Maybe worse, I think we're all hoping that those neutron torpedoes will wipe the mothership out. Doesn't that kind of sound like genocide? Done, Penny let out a long Irish sigh, one her late husband would have been proud of. For a moment, her words just hung in the air above the table. Chris reflected on them. Did she feel the moral certainty that Penny had accused her of? Young lady, the colonel said. I respect both your words and the feelings from which they come. But I'm not sure it's fair to accuse us of doing what we're contemplating out of a feeling of moral superiority and certainty. There is the matter of what these people appear to have done to at least one other planet and its civilization and what they appear ready to do to another whole planet full of people. That also is genocide. Oh, Lord, Abby said. I am so hoping for the professor to come galloping in here to show us home movies of that little green grandmother with twelve thumbs. I do dearly want to shake her hand. I, too, Ron said, reaching out with all four hands and wiggling his fingers. Can I go on record with what looks to be the majority, Chris said. I'll kiss the green cheeks of this proverbial little green lady. Chris paused to take a deep breath. Listen, folks, we all sat in the forward lounge for days, dissecting how my great-grandfather's and Ron's chooser got us into this mess of the Aitichi War and kept it going, even after it could have burned itself out. The crew nodded, except for Vicky. She looked really puzzled, which, even on her face, came across quite beautifully. I'll explain it later, Chris said to her. What I mean is that we really raked them over the coals in our hindsight. I was thinking about that, Penny put in. And now, here we are with a hot potato of Nova temperature in our laps, and no one handy to toss it off to. 
More's the pity, Abby said. And we don't have a lot of time to decide what to do about it, Chris said. Shame that the universe won't allow for a time out so that we can call home and get advice, Jack said. Do you really think that endless debate from the Dunderheads would give us a better answer? Chris asked. There is that, the colonel agreed. Aren't we being a little arrogant? Penny asked. That hung in the air for quite a while, before Chris broke the silence. Our cook at Newhouse had a saying. Spit in one hand, wish in the other, and see which you get the most out of, Chris said. We can think of a thousand reasons why we shouldn't make a decision. We can wish all we want for the problem to go away. Chris leaned forward and looked each of her friends in the eyes. The fact still remains that we have a horrible choice to make. Stand aside and let genocide happen, or do something about it, and by doing that, commit the whole of our species to a fight until someone can somehow convince all of those involved to stop the killing. Or we all end up dead, Penny said. That silenced the discussion for a while. You want to know one thing that really pisses me off? Chris said into the silence. Just one thing, baby ducks? Abby said. Well, the biggest thing from today. I'm all ears, Jack said that neither I nor Phil Tausig was able to get these BEMs to talk to us. And for that, we may well have a war, Colonel Cortez said, with a sigh any Irishman would have respected. After a respectful pause, Chris turned to Penny. Would you mind if I went back to examining our options? You might as well. I'm pretty sure the hand I'm looking at only has hope in it. Your hand at least has something substantial. That got a laugh. Nelly, if we find that a whole swarm of huge warships are heading for us, ahead of the mothership, can we break off and duck through another jump point before they get to us? I don't think so, Chris. What's the problem? The colonel asked. I assume that you intend to establish your roadblock, in either the system with the bird folk or the next system out, the computer said. That's my thinking, Chris said. We need time to prepare, then time to get there. I doubt we could get there any sooner. Your problem, Nelly said, Your Highness, is that the jump point that the hostile aliens will be using is a dozen hours or more from any other way out. That long, huh? The colonel said. Yes, the computer said. So, if we station the three corvettes, say, 10,000 kilometers out from the jump, and the battleships at 30,000, there's no place to run if things go bad. It looks like that to me, Chris. Nellie, are there any of the new fuzzy jump points in either of those two systems? Chris... No fuzzy points in them or the next system out. There are a few two jumps out, but you won't get any help there. So, the colonel summed it up. If we go, we're pretty much committed. I know if I was in charge of that mothership, I'd never go through a jump point without ordering a couple of scouts through first, and wait until at least one of them comes back to report all clear. The rumblings around the table pretty much agreed with him. Of course I'm a human, the colonel went on. I've been raised on the wars. I wonder how long it's been since any of those BEMs met any real resistance. I don't think that's a question we can answer, Chris said. But from what we've seen both in the ship that attacked us and the planet that somebody, person or persons unknown, I admit, Penny, massacred, it didn't look like anyone was breaking a sweat. An army gets slipshod if it doesn't go up against a first-class fighting force every once in a while. At least human armies do. Lots of ways to get sloppy, the colonel said. But that's not something we'll find out anytime soon, Penny said. 
not before it's too late. With that, they adjourned to the Sunday bar. The mess president had laid out all the trimmings to go with the steaks. That brought a series of jokes about fattening the calf and last meals, which ended when Chris noticed the looks her team was getting from the other officers dining in the mess. Eighteen hours passed like eighteen endless days. Chapter 31 Chris continued to use the forward lounge for her tax center. It had room for Ron and his two advisors, as well as Vicky and Maggie. The doctor was shocked to discover the topic of conversation and tended to sit one table away from them and look on with only slightly controlled horror. She would join in when Penny said something against the idea of going to war. Mostly, she just watched. The Aitichi took over a corner and had their own long and occasionally loud argument. Nellie offered to eavesdrop, but Chris told her not to. They needed their privacy. When Ron was ready, he'd tell them what he and his advisors had agreed upon. When the Aitichi meeting was done, the Army officer stomped out of the room, and Ron and Ted, his Navy officer, rejoined Chris's team. You don't have to tell us what that was about, if you don't want to, Chris said. We swam in the same waters you muddied up during your feeding, Ron said. The army advisor does not see that we have the will of the emperor in what you are thinking to do. He is opposed to our riding along with you and insists that I either command you in the name of the emperor to halt this plan or that we at least leave in one of your courier boats and return to the empire. Do you want to? Chris asked. No, I do not like the choice of fish swimming upstream any more than you do, but it is the choice that has been given to us. We cannot turn away from it. Besides, these bird folk may be a helpful ally in the war ahead. Are we so plentiful that we can allow those who may swim with us to be eaten already? A good thought, Chris said. So, we have a very unhappy Aitichi aboard, Jack said. Chris, would you mind if I check in on him? Please do. Captain Drago, an Aitichi just left the forward lounge. Yes, our security team noticed him stomp out. We don't have any experts at alien body language, but the bedding up here is that he is not a happy camper. Sad, but true, Jack said. You know how our princess affects some people? Could you keep an eye on him? Already doing it, Marine. Our disaffected Aitichi just locked himself in Aitichi country. If you'll post some Marines as an honor guard there, we can make sure he stays there. Done. And thank you, Captain. Jack's next call was to his Marine duty officer. A watch was quickly posted. An hour later, Captain Drago dropped down to check with Chris on the load for the 12-inch high-acceleration torpedoes. Load antimatter, Chris said. How much? the captain asked. How much? I've been talking with some of the professor's boffins, and they think we can double-load them, maybe even quadruple-load them. Is that safe? Jack asked. Not for any length of time, no, the captain said. The containment systems in the warheads are lightweight, and that means limited strength and duration. However, if we load the antimatter just before we fire the warheads, they should be good for fifteen minutes, maybe double that. You're taking a great risk, Jack said. If your highness here has us hunting BEMs, I think antimatter warheads popping off early may be the least of our worries. Do you disagree with us taking on the bug-eyed monsters, Captain Drago? Chris asked. He was the contractor captain hired by her king. While Admiral Kratz's threat to shoot the wasp out of space seemed unlikely, Captain Drago could put an end to any of Chris's plans by simply locking her in her stateroom and heading the wasp off in any direction that pleased him. So long as the captain didn't do Chris any bodily harm, 
She sincerely doubted Jack would do anything to stop the wasp skipper from doing something that probably would cut down on her likelihood of ending up suddenly dead. The captain took in a long breath and let it out slowly. I suspect your grandpa may have me keel-hauled for following you on this mission, if you order us to take on the bug-eyed monsters. However, there are times when people do what they have to do. If you say it is war, I and my crew will follow you. If you say go home, I think we will all breathe a long sigh of relief and go home. However, if we abandon that planet of bird people to the tender mercies of those space raiders, I don't think any of us will sleep all that well. Probably for the rest of our lives. Hell of a choice you have there, your highness. Glad I don't have to make it myself. He snapped to and saluted her. He didn't wait for her to return the honor, but turned for the door of the lounge. Let me know when you make your final decision, he called over his shoulder. I wondered how he'd take to it all, Penny said. I guess that's settled whether or not you find yourself locked in your room tomorrow and the wasp headed for home. I was wondering about that myself, Chris said her voice not rising above a whisper. Actually, she'd been wondering about it for several years. When would this governor sent by her great-grandfather rise up to take her down? At first, that was what she expected, someone to cut her off and substitute his mature judgment for her youthful exuberance. Of late, as Captain Drago followed her orders more and more, she began to wonder if there ever would be a time when he would cut her off. Or had she come into herself, come to her command? That time had come, and for better or worse, the crew of the Wasp would follow her through hell, and with any luck, back out again. She shivered. That was a heavy burden to bear. If she'd followed a normal Navy career, at some point the Navy would have assigned her a ship, and she would have had orders promoting her to God for that ship and its crew. Nothing about Chris's life had gone normal. She smiled to herself. She had a ship, and they were her crew. And after that wonderful moment, Chris found herself with time on her hands, where each minute seemed like an hour, and each hour flew like a second. She was already familiar with the irony of time in these situations. In a few days, lives might be lost for the lack of a few seconds. However, for now... They had to wait, wait for others to do their job. And waiting took forever. Chris checked in with Nellie every hour to see how things were going on the translation effort. Every hour, Nellie told Chris to hold her horses and not juggle their elbows. The first time it was funny. By the twelfth time, it was starting to bother her. Checks with the Vulcan showed the usual problems, none a showstopper. Those who had work were lost in it. Those who had duties went about them, checking and rechecking systems, weapons, defenses. Chris would make the final decision whether many of them would live or die. But for now, she waited. Waited to verify that the mothership shared a common ancestry with the space raiders. Waited to see if they had weapons that could make a difference. Waited, waited, waited. Reports came in from the other ships of Patron 10. They had also built up their supply of antimatter during their walk around. How should they distribute the antimatter? Chris ordered them to load antimatter warheads for their 12-inch high-acceleration torpedoes, but not a double load. The torpedoes would help the corvettes fight their way out of the close quarters she was about to order them into. All their other extra antimatter would juice up the neutron torpedoes. Those were her only hope of crippling the mothership. If they could pull that off, they all just might live to tell their tales. The captains accepted her orders without question. To have such godlike power over other people's lives sent a shiver up Chris's back. Eighteen hours into the wait, Nellie interrupted Chris and Penny from another discussion of the right and wrong of their options. Chris, Professor Mfumbo wants to talk to you in person. He suggests you get the admirals on conference. 
Make it so, Nelly. Aye, aye, ma'am. Chapter 32 I have pictures, Professor Mfumbo told those gathered in the forward lounge and observing on net. Considering all we had to go through to make them come out, I'm amazed at how clean they are. How did you translate them? Chris asked. There is not enough time left in my life for me to explain it to you. Please accept my word. These are complete and accurate video readouts of the data. We may see about that, Admiral Kratz grumbled. Could you please show us what you have? Admiral Channing asked. Chief, have your computer run the video, the professor said. And Chief Benny said something softly to his computer, Da Vinci. A new window opened on the forward screen. It was a close-up of what looked like a male choir. The voices accompanying the video were deep and powerful. The tonals of their song made the hairs on the back of Chris's neck stand up. This was not human music. The singers, though, looked very human. They'd been referring to the occupants of the huge mothership as bug-eyed monsters. That would have to change. These people looked as human as the next person. So had the bodies from the ship that attacked Chris with no provocation. The camera zoomed out, showing how huge the choir was. Then it panned to the listening crowd in the audience. They were crammed into seven balconies, layer perched upon layer, leaving Chris to wonder how those in the back could see anything. The audience listened in rapturous silence. When the song ended, there was applause. However, the conductor did not take a bow, nor did he offer for anyone in the choir to do so. The applause grew, and the camera zoomed back down front to a single man taking his place before a podium. As Chris took him in, she realized that all the singers and most of the people in the crowd wore the same dark uniform. They were identical, except for minor silver markings, which Chris suspected identified rank and maybe honors. The man at the podium wore the same clothing as the rest, but his uniform displayed much more silver, red, and gold. As he stood there, waving his right arm stiffly at the audience, the crowd went wild with cheering and clapping. It went on and on. How much of this do we have to sit through? Chris asked. Five minutes, thirty-four seconds the professor said. We timed it. Can we skip to the chase? Chris asked. The chief muttered something to his computer, and the screen blinked. Then the man began his talk. One moment he shouted. The next moment, his voice was little more than a whisper. Then he was shouting again. Sometimes the crowd shouted back. Do we have a translation of what he's saying? Chris asked. Sorry, Your Highness, not a word, the professor said. He goes on like this for three hours and ten minutes. He doesn't even take a break for a drink of water. That's better than my dad ever did, Chris muttered. Are there more pictures? As we speak, we are translating several hundred hours of video, Professor Mfumbo reported. Much of it appears to be more speeches by this man, although a lot of it is similar choir efforts. No evidence of musical instruments accompanying the choir, but a lot of singing, always in large groups. There was also a lot of what looked like news reports, Nellie added. Since there was little or no visual backup to the person looking into the camera, it's hard to tell what he's talking about, but he is very earnest about whatever it is. You didn't get any DNA off the video, did you? Chris knew it was a stupid question, but she had to ask it. Obviously not, the professor said. We also found no pictures of anyone with their clothes off, no porn, so there's no way for us to tell for sure if these are the same people we found before. I do admit, they look like them. They look painfully like us, Chris admitted, before someone else could point that out. So what do we do, gentlemen and ladies? Chris asked those gathered with her. Go home, Admiral Kratz snapped immediately. 
We should inform our governments what we have found and defer to them. Let wiser people than us decide what all of humanity will do. Vicky rolled her eyes. If we do that, Admiral Cota said softly, the planet they are heading for will likely be plundered down to its bedrock. That is not our problem, Kratz shot back. If it comes to a fight with these people, Admiral Channing put in, we might want all the allies we can get our hands on. We can't declare war, Kratz snapped. We handful here do not have that authority. Our governments would not be happy to have us return with the first battle of the next war already fought, maybe lost. We have a duty to those who sent us. If some of you don't, I know that I and my battle squadron do. He finished darkly. That's so funny, Admiral, Vicky said, with an ironic chuckle. You're usually ready for a fight at the drop of a hat. You have a problem here because these people can shoot back? You can't say that, Kratz shouted at his protege, his face going red. That's sure what it looks like to me, Vicky snarled back. Chris wondered where that came from. Still, she had no time for the issues that one admiral and one proud young junior officer had acquired while he broke her to harness. Hold it, hold it, hold it, people, Chris said, taking steps to put herself between the screen with its storming Greenfeld admiral and the equally angry Grand Duchess at Chris's elbow. If she let this situation get out of hand, she could have the first battle of the next war right there in the anchorage, with no alien in sight. Chris hadn't spent her entire life preparing for this moment to let it get bloody and out of hand. We won't get anywhere attacking each other, Chris said, in a voice as soothing as she could manage. Let's see what we can agree on. She took a deep breath, all the time wondering what the great Billy Longknife would do. Then again, he'd never faced an angry political opposition that had loaded 18-inch lasers. It looks to me that the aliens on the huge mothership are the same type of aliens that attacked the wasp, and suck dry the planet we found. Do we have agreement on that? Professor Mfumbo nodded. The skippers of Chris's corvettes showed agreement as well. After a long moment, so did the admirals from Musashi and Helvetica. Admiral Kratz's face was still an apoplectic scowl, but he grumbled, It looks likely that they are. That was more agreement than Chris would have expected a few moments ago. Can we agree that they appear to be headed for the bird people? That got nods all around. Can we agree that if they do enter that system, it's likely that they will plunder it of everything needed to support life? The nodding continued, except for Admiral Kratz. You can't prove that, he said. No, but their previous practices seems to make that highly likely. Right? Chris said. It doesn't matter. It's none of our business. My emperor did not send me here to start a galactic size war. None of our governments did. We would be traitors to our lords and our people if we did. Admiral, I can understand your point of view, Chris said, trying to sound as reasonable and understanding as her father in a heated question time. Although, to be honest, Serving the newly minted Emperor of Greenfeld was not something Chris had any understanding of, nor did she want any. If these people would just talk to us, let us exchange a few words, even make an effort, I'd be more willing to go where you're inclined. The Admiral seemed to relax at that, not much but a bit. Chris hurried on. But that's the problem. When I tried to talk to them, they didn't say a word, just shot lasers at the wasp. When Phil here tried to talk to them, they sent ships off to chase after the hornet. He got away from them before they got in range of him, but they weren't making any effort to talk, and they sure looked like they wanted to shoot. They aren't giving us any good choices. As I see it, we can go away and hope they don't drop in on any of our planets. 
or we can look into whether or not we can do something to them now, before they can plunder another planet and fatten on its blood. I hate those choices, Chris said as she finished. The faces on the screen fell silent for a long minute. Admiral Kota broke the silence. My orders were to follow Commander Chris Longknife. So far, I have followed her. He paused to let that sink in before he finished. I think that I will continue to follow her, wherever she may lead. Into a war? Kratz snarled. She is one of those damn Longknifes, Channing said. My government knew that ships were disappearing. They knew there were risks. This long knife had shown herself to be level-headed and not eager to go off half-cocked. You cannot have mistaken the fact that all our governments sent battleships. They sent battleships to follow a long knife where ships had gone and failed to return. The admiral paused for a moment. No one told me what to do. But no one told me what not to do. I believe I know now what I will do. What are your orders, Commodore Longknife? Chris was surprised at the nods that got. She was so used to being painted with the broad Longknife brush that she'd never considered that she might be earning a reputation of her own. To put it simply, George, Admiral Kota said, if she proposes to take the fleet into battle and has reasonable prospects for success, my orders are vague enough to allow me to follow her. I do not like the way these people will not open communications with us. I do not like the way they rip apart entire systems. I do not like the thought that my fair Musashi could be next on their dinner list. I think it is time that we put a stop to this, and I see no reason why we should let them fatten themselves on another system before someone does that. He turned from facing the Imperial Admiral to face out of the screen eye to eye with Chris. Princess Longknife, if you can show me a way, we might succeed in this endeavor. It will be my honor and privilege to place my battleships at your command. Me likewise, Admiral Channing said. Though it better be a very good plan. My people don't like to throw money away on long shots. This was moving faster than Chris had expected. She eyed Admiral Kratz. Let's hear what you have to say, he growled. It better be good. Chris did have a plan. She would have preferred to run the main points by her staff and give them a chance to refine it. But there was no use wasting an opportunity like the admirals presented her. Chris took a deep breath and started talking.